This episode releases on August 15, 2022. It's been 75 years and thinking about the journey we've made as a country makes me both sentimental and sad. It makes me sentimental because I love India. I'm so happy that we survived as a nation and that we are still, fingers crossed, this delightful kitchery of people and languages and foods and cultural practices. This is a unique land to grow up in. It contains multitudes. At the same time, I'm sad because so much of our potential has not been realized and in many ways, we are still backward, we are still the worst version of ourselves. If you're a regular listener of this podcast, you would have heard me speaking about three problems that we have today. The first is a proximate problem, the party in power today, and you can disagree with me on that. That's cool. But the other two problems are deeper problems that are older than our republic. One is the fault lines within our society, which leads to so much hatred, bigotry, intolerance and is threatening to tear our country apart today. And the other is the subject of this episode, the dysfunctional state. We borrowed this state from our colonial masters and it was designed to rule us, not to serve us. And much that is wrong with our country today has to do with the design of the state. Top-down, oppressive, not doing the things it is supposed to do and doing a lot that it should not. Are we stuck in a bad equilibrium with no way out? My guest today argues that we can solve this problem. First, we have to understand exactly what's wrong with the Indian state, and then we have to figure out what we need to do. Karthik Murlidharan is the best kind of problem solver. He asks the right questions, and then he finds the answers. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. My guest today is Karthik Murlitharan, the superstar economist whose two episodes with me on education and healthcare are masterclasses on the subject. In fact, he's become a bit of a cult figure among regular listeners. I'll link those two episodes in the show notes. When Karthik and I last recorded, we promised to follow up with an episode on federalism. Well, he's finally done with a draft of a magisterial book on India's state capacity, which has chapters on education and healthcare, which we've already discussed, and on federalism which we decided to discuss in this episode. But his book's introductory essay itself has some amazing yarn about the nature of the state and about state capacity, and we spent much of the time discussing that before zooming into federalism. Still, it's a long and meaty episode, and we cover a lot. Karthik is that rare thinker who both grapples with big ideas and engages with the real world on the ground. For that reason, his insights are deep and his solutions are practical. This was one hell of a conversation, but before we get to it, let's take a quick commercial break. Have you always wanted to be a writer, but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've taught 20 cohorts of my online course, The Art of Clear Writing. An online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, a lovely and lively community at the end of it. The course costs rupees 10,000 per GST or about $150 and is a monthly thing. So if you're interested, head on over to register at indiauncut.com slash clear writing. That's indiauncut.com slash clear writing. Being a good writer doesn't require God-given talent, just the willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills. I can help you. Karthik, welcome to The Seen and the Unseen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back, Amit. Yeah, I, I, I've got to tell my listeners that unfortunately I have to break an older promise in the sense that I think when we ended our last episode, I promised I'd start this one with Antakshari uh, because your mellifluous singing voice has been a huge hit across this country. However, you're just kind of recovering from COVID. You are COVID negative now, but throat problems are lingering on and all of that. So I hope listeners will sort of understand and forgive you for that. And one hopes that the insights that you come up with, therefore, are enough on their own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think the music was a particular highlight, but I enjoyed it. So hopefully we'll do that some other time. Yeah, we'll get you to sing some other time. What I'm really excited about now is, of course, we are talking about federalism today, as we promised in our uh, last episode. So people who are just tuning in, we've kind of done 
two episodes in the past on education and healthcare. Both of them have been super hits. In fact, education was for a while. Uh, it overtook Srinath Raghavan's episodes on Kashmir and CAA to be number one downloaded episode on the show. But, uh, you know, the Shah Rukh Khan of Economists was overtaken by the actual Shah Rukh Khan <laughs> because my episode with Shreyana Bhattacharya on the loneliness of the Indian woman is now number one. And maybe you can sometimes, someday, you know, talk about the loneliness of an Indian economist. But uh, leaving that aside, you know, I don't just want to talk about federalism. I also uh, sort of, you, you very kindly sent me the introductory chapter to your book with a tantalizing table of contents and also the chapter on federalism and I have to say I don't want to flatter you but I can't wait for this book to come out number one to one of the things that I felt a paucity of in recent years is books that explain fundamental aspects about India to those who want to know, like so many people do. You know, in my view, Vijay Kelkar and Ajay Shah's In Service of the Republic is one such book, where it lays out this beautiful, clear, lucid way of thinking about public policy. And your book is a remarkable book, but, you know, just by looking at the contents and, you know, we've effectively d- done episodes on two of the chapters and uh, the introduction is uh, magisterial. And, you know, just in terms of understanding the relationship between state and society and all the ways in which we are bedeviled, it is so clear-sighted. So I just want to get that out of the way and say that I cannot wait for this book to come out. I think this will be one of the essential books for anyone interested in understanding India. And on (laughs) that note, I think I've embarrassed you enough. So tell me about, you know, how was the experience of sort of writing the book? Is all of it complete? How was this experience like for you? What have the COVID months been like and what was getting COVID like? Yeah, no, I think, you know, so thank you. Thank you so much. I think this feels like one of those, one of those things that, you know, I've been working on. I come on the episode, I come on the show about once a year, give a progress update. The good news is this is almost done. I think when I first, when I first mentioned the book, I had just about started it. So I think, you know, the, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, of course it's work. I mean, the process of putting together stuff like this is never easy. I think the challenge in writing the book, and I think, Pramit mentioned this nicely in his episode with you in terms of, you know, what he aims for in a mint column, right, which is that it should be accessible to somebody with a 10th grade education, but the deepest expert in the subject should not find anything wrong in it, right? Like, I mean, so hitting... So kind of combining that balance whereby everything I say is kind of based to the extent possible on deep research, but at the same time accessible to a non-technical audience, right, is I think the hardest part of putting together something like this. But um, but it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun because, you know, the, the, the truth is that the core job of an academic economist, the way the profession runs these days, is not to write books. It is to write individual research papers. And these papers take years of work and depth. And we'll talk, if we have time, about a couple of those papers today. But I think, you know, we don't typically write books, right? Unless you're an economic historian. And so the reason the book has been fun is that there is so much lost, I mean, so much in the that we learn in the fieldwork and the process of engaging with these subjects that doesn't get captured in the individual papers. <clears throat> the books have been... And the book has been a chance to kind of connect the dots, right, I mean, across everything that I've done over the years. And so, you know, people, when you look at the stock of my work, will think of me first and foremost as an education economist. And then the last episode, we're like, wait, you know, uh, like, how come you're also talking and writing about health? And then when you get to federalism and political economy, as we'll talk about today, it seems even more distant from my core work. But I think it's a good example of how in working on education, right, it's become so obvious that the fundamental problems in India really have to do with state capacity and governance and that these transcend all sectors, right? So whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's police, whether it's courts. And so so the case for writing this book was really kind of, you know, to take both a, a 10,000 foot bird's eye view to kind of explain the Indian state and why we are the way we are, but also take a bit of a worm's eye view that reflects kind of a a tangible agenda of implementable ideas that reflects kind of both the time on the ground and the time engaging with the policymakers, with the people trying to do things. So I think the, so it's been a lot of fun, but of course, you know, it's, I mean, what's frustrating about it is I think the ideas have been in my head for about two to three years and obviously they get no refined as you write them, but converting all of that into the written word that is linear. And I think we talked about this last time as well, that everything is connected, right? So, and that's, I think the hardest part, which is how to hold the reader with me saying that I know you're thinking about these three things right now, but they're going to show up hundred pages later. So I think my early drafts had too many cross references, right? Look at this, look at this, look at this, but then that breaks the flow when you're reading. So it's those kind of mechanics of how do you take a complex set of systems. I mean, it's really, I think, part of what I'm trying to do in the book is present systems level thinking of understanding the Indian state. Um, and yeah, so I think, you know, again, 
I, I, I want to thank you and, you know, and the, and the platform for a very, very important piece of positive feedback, right? Because my biggest fear in writing this is that is it just too complex and too kind of, you know, is just too dense with ideas, right? I mean, for people to kind of be able to, able to take in, particularly if you're not an academic. And I think your journey with the podcast of kind of going with the same initial view that people may not have the attention span to listen more than half an hour and finding that, you know, now three, four hours are pretty routine. Uh, and the fact that the the education and health podcasts have done well and people have been asking for transcripts kind of gave, has helped to give me the confidence that there is in fact a market for this kind of, you know, deep but accessible writing, which is which is what I'm hoping hoping the book will do. You, you know, at one level, you mentioned those dual aspects of a bird's eye view and a worm's eye view. And I want to ask you about another sort of related sort of duality, which is the duality between being one, a sort of a researcher who's constantly bringing out new papers and bringing out new ideas into the world. And two, being a public intellectual, you know, who is broadcasting those ideas to the world and enhancing understanding and in a sense that is a public service. And I want to ask you about the tension between these two, because on the one hand, as you just told me before we just um, started the recording that um, you know as an academic there is pressure to have new things in every paper but as a public intellectual you want to repeat the basics again and again and again till people till it becomes part of the air and obviously you know, one can have possibly a much greater impact as a public intellectual but the danger there is that you know your ideas become like air like no one can you know they just become common knowledge and it doesn't seem remarkable in hindsight but you move the needle a lot but at the same time by joining by being part of that process of incremental progress within academia that also you know makes an you know enormous difference in you know enhancing the progress of ideas and just going forward all the time step by step by step being an example for other academics who then sort of continue that journey so how do you think about this like my bias is obviously uh, you know towards the public intellectual side of it that you know people have like you said uh, this hunger for knowledge this hunger for understanding and feeding that is incredibly important and you never know where it's going to you know move the needle somewhere and like you pointed out in our earlier episodes you know what drew you towards working with policies was a tiny change as 0.1% progress can impact millions of people uh, in a massive way, right? That That is the joy of engaging with this because the scale is enormous. So how do you deal with this conflict between new academic work and, and the public intellectual's work of simplifying these ideas without dumping them down? I, mean, I think the truth is that it really isn't a conflict, right? I think the only conflict, frankly, is in the amount of time you have, okay? So so I think, but substantively, there is no conflict in doing these two things, right? I mean, which is, you know, even as an academic, right, the way you teach a PhD student is very different from the way you teach a master's student, is different from the way you teach an undergrad, right? I mean, so in that sense, I see kind of, and frankly, I you know, I, it feels presumptuous to think of myself as a public intellectual. Maybe the closest I've gotten there is coming on your shows. Um, but other than that, like, you know, for the most part, uh, I've been living in the world of academia. Uh, but so I, I don't think there is a fundamental tension there at all, right? I, mean, I think as professors, we are, in fact, you know, there's something I like to tell students sometimes is that going through going through the academic journey is a little bit like going through an hourglass, okay, which is you start out as an undergrad, as an eager beaver undergrad at the top of the hourglass, or maybe even a high school student these days, right? I mean, who's exposed to many, 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 many things. And then you get excited. Then you figure out things you want to do more deeply. And then you kind of start going into the narrow parts of the hourglass. Your life as a PhD student is when you're in that, that neck of the hourglass, when you're doing just one thing, but doing it kind of, you know, in great depth. But then as you come out of the funnel of the PhD student and become an assistant professor, you know, associate professor, full professor, chair professor, then you're back at kind of the of the, hour, the the wide side of the hourglass, right? I mean, where you're kind of then seeing, connecting the small dots back to the big picture, like, I mean, and making those connections uh, available. So I don't think there's a conflict there at all. I think the main conflict is one of time and temperament, right? I mean, uh, and I think the, so time, yes, there's no question that it takes time to do the addition 
traditional work I do, whether it's engaging with policymakers, whether it's, you know, writing policy review papers and doing that kind of stuff. And, you know, you could be writing two more new papers in that time. But I think, you know, we all have a, a pretty good sense of intuitive sense of where is the highest marginal return on time invested, right? So uh, and that also has to map into your own kind of intrinsic utility. Sorry to sound so much like an economist. What do you enjoy doing? But also kind of sharpening the saw, right? The problem about kind of just becoming a public intellectual who's not doing fundamental research is you very quickly lose touch with where the cutting edge of the discipline is in terms of, you know, methods, and just the conversations that are happening. But at the same time, if you're just kind of playing in that very, very narrow sphere, then, I mean, in some ways, it's a, it's, it's a real shame. In fact, there's a nice, you know, given our history of backstories. So I have, in fact, I, while I do have a Twitter account, I've become much, you know, I've, I've really uh, become much more silent these days because, you know, I, I just don't find it that productive. In fact, for the longest time, I wasn't on Twitter. And because it almost felt like an academic, you were kind of, you know, uh, defiling the ivory tower, so to speak, right? Like, you know, by being out in, uh, out, out, out in that space. But I remember, I think it was 2013, I was giving a workshop on education to, at that time, the cabinet minister and minister of state, Shashi Tharoor, who has also been on your show. And I think he was tweeting a couple of things during the show. And his followers, uh, even in that time, over a million, were asking for references, asking for things, right? You know, what, where is this coming from? And he told me, are you on Twitter? I said, no, I'm, a, I'm an academic. I write papers. I don't, I'm not on Twitter. And then he said something interesting. He said, listen, you know, you are, all of your work is directly or indirectly funded by the taxpayer, right? I mean, either through grants or through tax exemptions for research grants. So you at least owe it to the public domain, you know, to put it out in the public domain, I mean, in a more accessible way. And that's something before that, you know, I mean, that's partly what Montague, who also you've had on your show, and they've all, you know, been been mentors at various stages, like, you know, but but his invitation to come and spend time writing parts of the background paper to the 12th five-year plan was exactly the same thing, right? Saying that it's not enough to just do the research, you really owe it to the broader kind of community to do your best to synthesize these things. So I think, you know, there is, so I think the only tension is time. There isn't a tension in terms of the substance. And one way to kind of manage that is even on Twitter, I usually just post three or four kinds of things, right? I post new papers, I post new op-eds, I post, you know, any public lectures I'm giving, and I'll typically post some recruitments, post docs, you know, that kind of stuff. But I will typically almost never get into a discussion or, you know, be, be there for the sake of kind of saying, oh, I haven't tweeted in two months. That's completely fine. If I have no new paper or nothing new to say, then I'm completely fine with that. So, you know, uh, the constraint of time was a constraint I meant because that's what makes it a trade-off and a related, uh, you know, digression on that, question on that is that, you know, I've noticed that you know, getting into your forties, especially when you pass your mid forties, in my case, it sort of mind really <laughs> focus yours too. It, it, it in my case, it's focus of mind in the sense that you realize that you know when you're young, you can have all kinds of diffused ambitions. You think in broad, abstract terms. Ye karenge, wo karenge, ye hoga, wo hoga. But as you get, you know, you reach a certain point and you realize that a most of those things ain't gonna happen, and b mo most of those it doesn't matter. Your happiness doesn't kind of depend on that. Your intrinsic utility uh, as uh, you would describe happiness doesn't necessarily depend on that so just in terms of your own trajectory uh, you know how has that changed your approach to the work in the sense that um, you know it, when you were 25 how would you have kind of what is the kind of work you would have seen yourself doing at 45 and now that you've actually you know you are uh, getting to that um, stage of life as uh, uh, as I am you know how has your thinking changed is it more like what is a I'm, I'm guessing that you're at that phase where you only do the kind of work which makes you happy which makes you satisfied and you know do you do it for just the intrinsic importance of the work as it were or do you also think about think in terms of what can maximize uh, positive outcomes and so on and so forth what's your thinking towards this kind of work like has it become easier or harder to play the long game because some might say the older you get the harder it is to play the long game because there's not so much left but on the other hand the way i see it is that you know you, you can be equanimous about all the immediate gratifications you're not going to get and therefore it's easier to play the long game because you can just enjoy the process and do the things that you have to do so do you see your work a, in that larger sense of I'm playing the long game, I, I, I want to make a difference and it, 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 almost in a sense of it's my dharma to do this. Uh, and do you also and uh, you do also do it because it makes you happy. It puts you in a good place. 
Yeah, and I think, and absolutely, I think, you know, the answer is both. And I said this, I think I said this at the end of the first episode, right? I think that, you know, about why being a, you know, being a tenured professor in a top research university truly is one of the best jobs in the world, right? I mean, because you get to, I think, you know, the most important, I remember asking Abhijit Banerjee a few years before he won the Nobel Prize, right? I said, listen, you've done all of this stuff, you know, what is the objective function at this point, right? I mean, what are you maximizing? So a, ver- a variant of the same question you asked me. And he had a simple answer. He said, like, my my goal is not to be bored, okay? Which is, I just want to learn new things, right? So there is something about you know, and a good academic always has an inherent curiosity, right? I mean, about learning new things and, you know, that, and that's the joy of the research, right? Because you will often kind of discover new things in the data, new patterns in the data that will be, you know, some will validate certain ideas you have, some will raise new puzzles. And, and again, you know, I'm, I'm fundamentally an empiricist and not, you know, I'm not a theoretical economist, you know, I'm aware of the theory, read the theory, but as we'll see, even when we talk about federalism, in almost every aspect of economics, you can argue things theoretically on both sides okay so um so most things in the end come down to what does the data say and the nice thing about being an empiricist is that you know the the data always has an ability to surprise you right you you never you never stop learning okay so i think that's the, the there is an intrinsic joy and a part that just keeps you current keeps you learning keeps you you know just excited about about, about the academic enterprise but it is true that as you get older like you know the the optimal role changes right so i i feel mm, there's a lot of these arcs of careers I'm talking about, particularly with academia. And I do think, I think last time, part of my goal was to excite a bunch of young college goers to become health economists and study health. This time, I'm hoping I'm going to do that about public finance and federalism. Uh, but, you know, but there's these side shows about life in academia, right? I mean, and what this whole enterprise means. You know, so one way to think about the arc of an academic career is that your 20s are when you're getting trained and learning how to do stuff. Your 30s are when you're established. Now, this is true of empirical stuff. I think in pure science or pure physics or math, you know, people do their best work earlier. But, you know, but your 30s are when you are really establishing yourself. You're typically starting out in, as an assistant professor. These days, you know, with PhDs and postdocs, people start out as assistant professors in their early 30s, late 20s. So the 30s are when you're establishing yourself, getting tenure, and then and hopefully getting promoted to a full professor, say, by the end of your 30s, early 40s. And your 40s really are your peak, or, you know, maybe 35 to 55, right? You know, is your peak in the sense that you're established enough to have access to kind of grants and students and PhD students and postdocs who want to work with you, but you're young enough to have the energy um, to kind of really go after big things, right? I mean, build out major ambitious research programs and stuff like that. And then, you know, in your 50s, and, and, the, and, this, and this period in the 40s includes things like editing major journals, running major grant programs, because you're also kind of shaping the field um, in you know in in that period, and I think in the 50s a lot of people then do gravitate towards academic administration, right? I mean whether you're becoming department chairs or deans or whatever, because that is it is painful work, but it is essential work, and it is important for the person doing that job to be somebody who's actually done you know the process and has lived in the shoes of what younger faculty members are going through. And then funnily enough. In your 60s and 70s, uh, and this is again why being an academic is such a great kind of privilege, because you you get to stay relevant and engaged even up to your 70s, and it's like the best thing, frankly, to do in your 60s and 70s is to do a lot more undergrad teaching. Okay, and and that's because you've now come out at the end of the hourglass on your side, right? And and you're also catering to the young folks at the other side, but also with the width, right, and, and the breadth. So at that time, the the mm, the value of the perspective that you acquired over the course of your life is kind of the value of that when transmitted to young undergrads is just incredible, right? So when I think about my own time at Harvard as an undergrad, my advisors or the people that you spend the most time with were all in their late 60s and 70s, right? And, you know, at least they were the ones who had the most time for me, right? I mean, so people like Jeff Williamson, Peter Timmer, Dwight Perkins, you know, so they, they used to teach this class in structural transformation uh, and the historical you know perspective the depth that they had for an undergrad was amazing and they also had the time for me whereas in my PhD my advisors were kind of in their late 30s early 40s because that's when you were kind of at the peak of your research career and those become you know the ideal thing so anyway so, so to come back and think about this in the context of my own life I am in my mid 40s just turned 46 so in that sense, and in a way, you know, this is not an excuse for why the book is about six months late. In fact, you know, my goal, <laughs> my goal was for the book to be out around this time, around the 75th year of independence. And like I was joking, you know, sometimes I feel instead of writing a book, I should just do four episodes with you. So I'm glad we, we're recording and putting out this episode, uh, at least to coincide with that. But the book will be out in the first or second quarter next year. But I think 
part of the reason the book has taken a little longer is that it's not my main job to write the book. My main job is still to do research and write papers. And these have also been among the most productive years research-wise because of the sheer number of papers and projects that are happening, right? So we've written this you know, paper we've been working on for about six years on studying the general equilibrium effects of NREGA, which is probably India's most important welfare program in the past two decades and where the research still continues to be, you know, inconclusive, right? Where there are papers that find X and minus X. So long story short, we can talk more about that. But it's a paper that last summer, you know, just to give you a life sense of a life inside an academic's life is that, you know, we got to revise and resubmit on that paper from Econometrica, which is one of the most prestigious journals in, in, in the profession. But we spent the entire summer, like basically two and a half months, right? I mean, we took 11 months doing that revision and with an 80-page single-space response to each of the referees. That's the ex- amount of scrutiny that happens to publish in a top peer-reviewed journal in economics, right? So we submit the paper, we get very detailed referee reports from, th- in this case, three referees, and the editor sent another five page letter about all the additional things he thought that we should do. And then a response at a top journal requires you to hit every one of those points. And in many one of those things, it required getting new data, doing new analysis, you know, having four additional appendices where we are writing theoretical models of rural labor markets to then figure out, you know, and quantify the parameters of what we were finding. So the point is that we are, I'm still in that period where the core and most important thing in my life is doing research and writing new papers, right? But coming back to the other part of what you said is I've also been in this business for for 15, 20 years now to feel that the value of a book that brings it out of this kind of little hyper-specialized world of narrow academia and taking these ideas more broadly, I think is important. And there I think I am, you know, probably just temperamentally, right, I think well suited to do that because like I've said, the motivation for the research has never been just to write kind of the AER econometrica paper, right? The motivation for the research has always been, are we kind of helping answer questions that will help make policy better and and thereby improve lives? And so there's no conflict again. The only conflict in all of this is time, right? I mean, and so my, you know, Danny Roderick has these impossible trilemmas in international political economy. My impossible trilemma in terms of the work is quantity, quality, and timeliness. Okay, so you can do two out of those three things. And the one that usually suffers is timeliness because sometimes, you know, because I'm doing a lot of stuff and you hope that the work is of a, of, a, of a very high standard. And the problem sometimes in the academic enterprise is that I can block my calendar to give myself time to do work, but I can't guarantee that the output is going to be at my, that I'm going to be happy with it, right? I mean, so, and which means sometimes you just got to go, you can spend five hours and write something and not be happy with it and you have to go back. And so, yes, so that's kind of my long winded way of saying like, you know, why is my book six or nine months late relative to kind of the original plan? But, you know, the good news is that it is mostly done. You asked that question. I think there's 18 chapters chapters. There's a very, it's expanded from 14 to 18. Uh, for example, the public finance chapter became so big, I had to split it into two, one in expenditure and one in revenue. But, you know, and then I think I had one in courts and cops, which then expanded into one separate one on courts and justice and, and police and public safety. But no, so, I, you know, at some level, I beat myself up and saying, Are yaar, like if I, only I'd been more disciplined, like, you know, I would have gotten this thing done on time. But on the other hand, I think hearing Shrayana saying, I think, you know, because she had a regular job too, that it took like 10 years of interviews and notes to produce what has been, I think, a masterpiece. So hopefully, like, you know, that that extra time is is fine. And I shouldn't beat myself up too much, given how much other stuff has been going on. You know, one of the things I really enjoy about our conversations is I get to learn new frameworks about sort of looking at the world and also your lovely metaphors. Like the hourglass metaphor is great. I think in the last episode, you spoke about an aeroplane where, you know, the elites are in first class and middle class and the poor are in, you know, in uh, uh, the elites are in first class and business class and the uh, poor are in the uh, economy seats, but it's one plane, it's all going to crash. And we'll come back to that. There's also a car from the 1950s metaphor in your book, which is beautiful. But, you know, just to sort of take a, Uh, a mild uh, digression which may or may not interest you because I don't know if you're interested in the creator economy but that trilemma of quality, quantity and timeliness is really interesting because if you think of work as a series of projects then I agree with you I can't possibly meet all three and uh, sometimes but uh, the way uh, the creator economy functions is that you take timeliness out of the equation by just doing something every day so if you are a YouTube creator like an Ali Abdal or so many bloggers that I follow you're bringing out videos every day or every second day and uh, so timeliness is taken care of and that quantity produces its own quality 
because just through constant iteration you get better and better and better and it's so much better than just planning you know taking a month planning a video and bringing it out and you know seeing quantity kaisa hai quality ka kaisa hai but that's just in the creator economy and in that particular concept uh, that particular context but uh, you know if you take a, a sort of a more project oriented approach it would be different and it would of course be different in uh, different fields i want to sort of uh, you know go back to you mentioned peer review and what your paper is kind of going through and as someone who is inside academics i you know i uh, view academics with a lot of the field not individuals uh, uh, like you with a lot of suspicion because there seems to me to be the giant academic circle jerk going on and some of our best brains are being wasted there and the peer review system seems to me to be like i understand the reasons for which it was set up but it seems uh, a particular culprit because it does a couple of things one is that it crowds out the conventional or uh, the unconventional rather that everybody thinks in conventional ways and there is this incentive to conform so some people may not even try to think outside those boxes because they just be rejected outright i mean we saw this for example in the nutrition sciences for a bunch of decades where you know the sugar lobby funded uh, studies by uh, academicians from harvard and elsewhere like ansel keys for example that demonized fat and said sugar is completely fine and that in fact led to the obesity epidemic in america and now we know the science says exactly the opposite but academia and peer review kept those great ideas out and that's just one example that kind of comes to mind but i think one cost is that it would keep unconventional ideas out and science needs those unconventional crazy ideas to get into the discussion to be able to proceed and the other cost would be that your output would suffer because if you spent an inordinate amount of time revising a paper and conforming to some expectations uh, that's a, there's an opportunity cost sir you could have spent that time doing another paper or making youtube videos for you know lay viewers to explain important concepts to them but all of that doesn't happen so if, as an insider you know what do you think of uh, this academic circle jerk as it were and and the whole peer review system <laughs> no i think you know you're touching on many many uh, and again it's good that i've heard so many past episodes you know so i'll pick up on multiple threads here see i think you know you've talked about the value of say in the creator economy disintermediating the gatekeepers so to speak right like you know in in many areas but i think so let's let's parse this down right so i think what you said about the for th- there's this piece about the youtuber creative economy that person's economics versus say my economics right i mean in terms of how i function right so i think the when you're in the creator economy right you are just looking for the one viral hit right so you don't care about your failures you are kind of working a little bit like an early stage venture capitalist right i mean who's taking hundreds of bets and you just want one to kind of really take off right actually no no i'll i'll, I'll sorry to interrupt you i huh. normally don't but huh. th- that's not my assumption in the sense that that's not how the creator economy works so creator economy is you build an organic following over time and at the same time while you're doing that you up your you up your quality game. Got so it. you're not looking for the viral hit you're Got just it. looking to gradually uh, grow and also i didn't my question about the peer review system was completely separate no, no, agree, you know you agree. cannot so, possibly no, no. compare these two no no i agree i agree so i'm just going to connect all of these dots so usme i'm just going to make a very very simple point right i mean which is that see i think what happens is academics is that and this is again and maybe some of this is unfortunate right but there's a certain amount of risk aversion that comes in because you are judged by kind of whatever you put your name on so i could write three great papers but if i put my name on something shoddy then that actually has a huge reputational risk right i mean and so and there is definitely a certain additional amount of risk aversion that comes with that and that kind of gets you to double check triple check quadruple check some of that is you know some of that is good some of that is inefficient okay but now let's come back to the broader question you asked about pre, uh, about peer review see i think there are some parts of peer review that are definitely broken okay and other parts that i think are actually you know quite important and necessary and see i think for the most part the the peer review system is Im- is very very important right so if you look at these three sets of referee so let me say two things right one is does peer review create more incentives for conformity okay rather than novelty funnily enough i think that is less true at the level of peer reviewing a journal article and more true at the level of peer reviewing grant proposals okay and that's because the people who are giving money tend to be risk averse and so because they are all bureaucrats and this is true even in foundations right so i think um, there are people now kind of starting to work on what's called meta science right i mean and looking at how the scientific process itself is funded so i think the risk aversion in peer review matters more at the level of grant proposal funding 
and that's because the bureaucrats are because it's but it's not because of the peer review it's because of the bureaucratic incentives of of the funding okay but my assessment is that when you have provocative results that show up that you submit to a journal it is not going to get rejected just for being provocative it will get probed more okay so and so that has happened in fact in this ge uh, and nregs paper that i'm talking about because you know and mm, We'll, we'll hopefully have more time to talk about it even in the context of federalism, right? But you know, I consider this perhaps the most important paper I've ever written. And that's partly because it overturned my own priors, right? So a lot of economists, including myself in the early 2000s, were very skeptical of Enrega, okay? And we were thinking that, listen, this is going to be make work. You're digging holes, refilling them up. And you're just going to be pushing up, you know, you're pulling productive labor out of productive sectors and moving them into unproductive stuff. This cannot be a good thing, okay? Now, but what the uh, what our results show with this very very large scale experiment was that improving Enrega implementation was not only good for the poor in terms of improving kind of you know their their their, their direct income from Enrega, but it also had almost a 10x increase in their private incomes because their wages went up and private employment also went up. Okay, now this runs contra to economic theory. You don't demand curves slope downwards, right? You don't get higher wages and higher employment, and so that required. But you know so. So essentially, uh, this is now too much in the weeds, right? But we had this large-scale experiment that found that result. And then we thought, okay, because this is an experiment, this result, you know, will go through in the top journals. But I think the pushback we were getting was precisely because the result was provocative. We were just being asked to go back and question, get other data sets and do a bunch of things. And so I think that paper has improved immeasurably in that process. Now, it's taken four years, okay? But that's why it's a completely different part of the ecosystem. The reason you have academia, the reason you have... So, you know, I think there's a whole continuum of kind of knowledge to practice right in society and the reason you have the academic enterprise is precisely to kind of do the long-term work that will you know because if i'm going to come and say something as provocative as saying that listen this is a case where you could boost wages and employment that has dramatic implications for how we think about certain classes of social welfare programs and so i'm happy that we got pushed back a lot and i'm happy that we were forced to go look at other data sets because i feel much more robust about those results right so i think that the so that part of peer review, I think, is a good thing. The part of peer review that I think is broken and is a little frustrating, where I think we could do well to look a little bit more like the creator economy, is the following, right? Is that I think there are two aspects of the peer review process. One is, are the results correct? The second is, are the results important? Okay. Um, and... And my view is that most of the peer review process should focus on the first question and not the second, okay? But unfortunately, what happens is because the prestige of publishing in the top journals is so high, okay, that by the time you're submitting a paper to the American Economic Review or Science or Nature or whatever, chances are that the results are going to be broadly correct, okay? So a lot of the efficiency loss in this enterprise, okay, comes from because of the very, very non-linear returns to publishing in the top journal that people are taking crap shoots. So the acceptance rate in the top journals is 3%, which means for every one paper submitted, that's thir every uh, 100, uh, you know, the, every 33, 32 are getting rejected, okay? So, and so, but why do people do that? Because it's worth that moonshot of trying to get into the very top journal. And out of those, I would say, over half of those papers are probably correct, okay? And therefore deserve to be published in a good peer review journal. But a lot of the time in the process that's wasted and that's inefficient and where sometimes cliques and others can form is in people's assessment of is the work important, okay? And so that's where a lot of the judgment calls happen and, and a lot of the inefficiency happens, right? So, so and... In fact, there are papers, you know, that will get rejected in top journals and then will get published perfectly fine. And then over time, right, those papers will end up being sleeper hits. But one of the ways I would like to reform peer review is to kind of, you know, see if we can create platforms. And the scientists are doing this, right? I mean, so archive is an attempt to do this, right? Whereby it's less about journals and people just post the papers and you get kind of crowdsource commentary on the paper, right? I mean, so I think if we can separate the correctness from the importance, I think that will really, really help a lot, right? And I think... Mm, and it'll particularly help scholars. And I know Vinay in his episode, like, you know, talked a little bit about the tension of academics living in the US and catering to kind of a global audience versus academics in India, like, you know, whose work is often more contextually grounded and kind of, you know, relevant. But because global academia fetishizes generalizable concepts, if you write, if you submit a paper on India to like a top journal, the ch you will only make it to a very top journal if you can 
place it in a broader conceptual framework and sometimes that and when i in fact i met him i met him in delhi recently we were talking about you know cases of very successful academics in the us right I mean but whose work may not necessarily be fully contextually correct with india but that's because it's not that they have not you know and to be fair to them it's not like they have tried to brush it under the carpet it's more like those nuances are not relevant to a global audience and therefore it gets taken out anyway so i think the reason i'm getting into that little detour is because i do mm, get frustrated about aspects of academia and if we could separate this whole so if you could have papers written by indian scholars about india that are posted out there where kind of you get peer review that just says okay is this methodologically correct and often there will be like a lot of methodological issues that need to be called out but don't take that additional kind of judgment call of is this general interest right i mean so you can have peer review at the correctness level and then let the marketplace kind of decide the importance right I means so that's kind of how i would so the part that's broken in peer review is the confounding of those two whereas i do think peer review for correctness is actually very very important and you know what you point out about the top heavy nature of the peer review system that you want to get into these top journals and it's a winner take all you know one out of 33 makes it the other 32 don't and obviously the difference between the one who made it and the five 10 of the five or 10 below him immediately that didn't make it will be negligible but the difference in outcome is vast and th- th- that would lead me to thinking that it is an incentive problem you know so my question therefore is is what are the rewards like what are the rewards for publishing in a top journal as opposed to say just uploading your paper on your blog for example you know what are the rewards and why are they that way yeah so i think the problem with uploading the paper on the blog is because then you have you know people can say anything okay and there's no assessment of whether something is correct or not and the problem is as work gets more technical you really do need peer review right i mean you know so which is why in top conferences what you will have is top conferences when a paper gets accepted you will also have a discussant okay and the entire job of the discussant is to provide the public good for the community of scholars of having been the person who has dived into the paper in great detail and then presenting kind of a 10 minute or 15 minute discussion which is almost like a public referee report of the paper okay like i mean that here is what is good here is what kind of is 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 weak right so so and and i think that's why just posting on the uh, on the on the website doesn't quite do it so now the returns to publication i think when you publish in the very 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 top places like you know so tenure in the top departments is all because again <clears throat> the reason you fetishize the general interest journal is even in an economics department like mine you got people and every discipline and this is even truer in the sciences where you've gotten so super specialized right that people don't even understand their own colleagues work okay so you know i don't understand half of what my econometrics colleagues are doing right i mean so there's theorists there's econometricians there is macro economists there is development economists there's public finance people so even in an economics department while there are certain kind of common tools of how we think about the world kind of evaluating the intricacies of work is often something that not everybody can do right so then when it comes to decisions for tenure and promotion and stuff like that you tend to rely partly on the publication process for a validation of you know is this work perceived as truly general interest but again <clears throat> this is a, a, at ucsd for example one of the things we pride ourselves on is because we're not a big private school that can throw money at everybody we want we actually spend a lot of time reading papers and trying to identify so we are a bit like the oakland days in academia right like you know if you remember moneyball right of identifying the underpriced assets whose work is better than kind of what they're getting credit for and kind of you know make those bets early and that's been a key to kind of how we have i think con- conditional and budget we're probably the best department in the world because it's a poor public university relative to but you know there's always this thing about mm, needing to read the papers and form your own judgments so to go to your question the the returns to publishing in the top places are a certain amount of additional validation in the profession as this is general interest and a lot of the downstream benefits of tenure and stuff in top departments flow from that now to be fair and this is why i think it's not as broken as we think it is right because if you publish in a series of top field journals okay you will still get tenure i mean it just won't be like in a top 10 or top 15 department but you will still have a respectable academic career be able to do research be able to you know be a very productive contributing member of the research community but yes because a lot of academia is status obsessed and you know and i say this you know i took an 80 to 90% cut in lifetime income from my going from my corporate consulting job to academia right but it's not like 
you know, in, in, in the private sector, if you look at, say, investment bankers, right, beyond the point, the bonuses are not about what they do with the money. It's just a measure of self-validation, right? Because it's a metric on which you validate yourself and therefore you feel good about yourself, even if you have no idea what you're going to do with the money, right? Like, I mean, and so, and academics, in some ways, right, I mean, you've just replaced that, that currency with kind of a currency of prestige, right? I mean, so you're still kind of playing that same game, but in, in a different sphere and which is quite suboptimal, right? And I think which is why, in a way, what I'm enjoying about writing the book and all of this kind of stuff is just, I mean, and, and overall in my career, I feel incredibly fortunate to have kind of, you know, found mentors, found colleagues and people who've kind of valued the long-term nature of what I do and given me that kind of, you know, long-term runway. And so I feel it's all kind of come together quite nicely and I have no regrets about anything. And so this is just a way of un opening up the black box of the academic enterprise a little bit to you. Uh, and it's interesting that you talked about frameworks. I think one thing I noticed in later episodes is you talk about, let me double click on that. And I, that may have been something I had mentioned about, you know, in, in a conversation with preparing candidates for their job market interviews, saying that have a front page and when your listener double clicks, you need to go like five pages in. So yes, maybe these frameworks, you know, are translating subliminally. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows? I mean, uh, g g floating around in uh, sort of interesting ways. So we should talk about the We really should talk about the book now and I'll get to that. But before that, something struck me from what you said about your paper. And of course, we'll talk about your paper at the end, because when you say something like it's the most important paper I've done, hello, you know, I want to talk about it for five hours. But after we sort of do the groundwork and talk about federalism, that's perhaps the best time to kind of talk about it. But one of the things that you said when you spoke about the paper is how it made you re-examine your priors and that brought to mind something that you said in the opening chapter of your book somewhere near the very beginning where you speak about how you were sort of both a scientist and, a, and an engineer when you went into this book a scientist in the sense that you're understanding theory formulating theories figuring out first principles of how things work and an engineer in the sense that you're actually growing out there in the ground examining the machine trying to build the machine trying to tinker with it which is such a beautiful combination and obviously uh, you know the engineering you would often update the priors of the scientist you which is how it goes and which is sort of the uh, healthy interaction now that's something I want to ask about because what happens is that when you put your scientist hat on the theories that we use to look at the world to explain the world to ourselves and to others we can sometimes get attached to them and you know and that might affect how we do our empirical work no matter how much we tell ourselves that hey I'm being objective and all somewhere your reptile brain is saying don't mess with me this is who I am. You know, these are my sort of friars, as it were. And in your work, you know, the only ideology I find in your work, and I mean this as a compliment, is the ideology of how the hell do I make things work, right? Figure out what's wrong, figure out ways to make them work. But how do you deal with this sort of tension between a scientist and an engineer within yourself? And do you feel that this actually uh, bedevils the field? Because most people would fall on one side or the other you know they'd either be the theoretician who would not be able to uh, you know move away from whatever their priors are uh, for example uh, and then there would be the empiricists who might like the big picture who might look at something not working figure out a way to you know fix it at that particular granular level at which they see it but not be able to shift from the worm's eye view to the bird's eye view so uh, you know what's your sense of that process within yourself do you think you went wrong in the past in one extreme or the other you know, how, how have you reconciled both of these? Yes, I think, I mean, so to be honest, the, the tension there is, I think, less about scientist versus engineer. And I think it's there in, it's there within both frames, right? Because I think the issue you raise is more about, you go in with priors, you go in with beliefs, and then how do you deal when the data kind of, you know, is not, is, is not supporting that. And so I think going back to, you know, my own ideology, I would say, you know, the ideology really is that of an empiricist, right? I mean, which is kind of really let the data, you know, so, and like I say, Having an open mind, I have an open mind, but having an open mind is not the same as having an empty mind, right? I mean, and so, you know, so you do want to go in... And I think somebody, I think somebody at Stanford, right, famously said that, you know, really the way you want to approach the world is strong beliefs weekly held, right? I mean, so, you know, you go in with a certain set of frameworks, but you're not so wedded to them that you don't change your mind when the facts kind of suggest otherwise, right? And so, but I think that's the 
the that's the right approach to any kind of enterprise particularly academia and that is true whether you're a scientist or whether you're an engineer right i think the scientist engineer di dichotomy i meant was slightly different in the sense that the science it's not about theory and empirics right because even within science you have theory and empirics and even within engineering you have theory and empirics so the distinction is not that the distinction is that the scientist is focused on understanding the world not changing it right i mean whereas the engineer is focused on how do i take these principles that I'm learning from the science and kind of build a better mousetrap, right? So it's that it's not the theory empirics as much as kind of the learning versus doing kind of you know that's the dichotomy which I think is more relevant and. And yeah, and I think, you know, that, that framework actually comes from, you know, I think last time I had this Mankiw quote on profoundly and naively confused. And this actually also comes from a Greg Mankiw piece. And I think it's a JEP piece in 2006 called Macroeconomist, a Scientist and Engineer. And so, yeah, like, you know, I think that's, and I, and I cite that in the footnote as kind of where the terminology comes from. But yeah, in a way, what I'm trying to do with the book is because, you know, again, so my assessment of books on governance and, 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 and stuff in India, and again, maybe this is, I'm, uh, this is a little too self-congratulatory or at least you know you need a little delusion as to say what am I adding to this marketplace in terms of why am I taking this effort to write the book so my sense of what I'm hopefully trying to do here is there are excellent descriptive accounts of kind of the failures of the Indian state right I mean so for example I love Shankar Ayer's book on the gated republic if you haven't, haven't seen that so yeah it's this wonderful book that just says how the collapse of kind of public service delivery is kind of caused most elites to seek private solutions and how that's kind of a bit of a vicious cycle. The journalist Raj Shekhar has a nice recent book called Despite the State, where he's kind of, again, having a very nice descriptive account of the dysfunction of the state, right, on the ground, right? So, so the journalistic accounts are excellent in kind of providing a thick description of what's going on, but I mean, they themselves will admit that they don't necessarily know what the solutions are, right? I mean, as much as just kind of bringing to light what the nature of the problem is, right? Then I think you've got very good, thoughtful books by retired bureaucrats, people who've been in the system, you know, and who kind of will will both kind of write about their personal experiences, right, and, and certain, you know, reform ideas that's coming experientially. But the, the limitation there is it's typically not grounded in research, right? It's very, very much kind of experiential, which is very valuable, right? It's a part of the conversation, but it's one part of that, of that, so to speak. And then you might have kind of books by academics that are a little bit more concerned conceptual, but I'm not kind of as grounded in terms of how difficult it is to, you know, what are the political economy constraints? What is kind of the life of a frontline bureaucrat like when you're trying to do something? And so what I'm hoping to do here is kind of thread those needles by kind of having a book on state capacity. And the one thing, in fact, that is still to be determined is kind of the, the title of the book itself. I can tell you like, you know, what the book is, but I'm not, I've still not landed on a title that I'm fully happy with, right? Because then we can come back and talk about that as we talk about the outline of the book. But what I'm hoping to do here is have an analytical narrative of the Indian state that both informs in terms of describing key facts, but also presents frameworks to make sense of why we are the way we are. And then once we understand that why, and then you say, okay, why are we ready to make the change? Then you get into the granularity of now, what should you actually do? That's kind of based on theory and practice. So anyway, so that's kind of my hope of what I'm doing. But the challenge in is, it has become, I think, a five to maybe even 600 page book, right? So it is, it is, an, you know, an, an and again, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to not beat myself up on the delays, like a colleague of mine at Chicago just wrote this very nice book on conflict called Why We Fight. And I think, you know, it took him about three years and that book is about 300 pages. So, you know, the fact that at three years, I'm close to done with a 500 plus page book means I feel good, but the book is mainly done. It should be out in the Q1, Q2, 2023, but, but the draft is essentially done. Yeah, can't wait to read it. And one small request I will make, and I'm sure all my listeners will also share this is, please do not cut any words just because a publisher asks you to. If you feel something needs to be cut and you need to make it more concise, uh, go ahead as long as it's coming from you. But please, you know, if, if a publisher says, nahi yaar, ye das hazar word cut do or cut a hundred thousand, please don't do that. Like one of the, one of my great sort of, uh, one of the great tragedies of literature is a wonderful book by Robert Caro called The Power Broker, uh -huh. which is, it's a masterpiece, right? It's, it's what, uh, uh, 900,000 words. But the tragedy is that it was more than a million words and a hundred thousand word section that got cut out of the book was on Jane Jacobs who, who's you know who uh, is one of my heroes and who kind of fought with Robert Moses who was the subject of his great book and to me that is such a tragedy and I keep thinking that we are now in the age of the internet everything is digital do a freaking data dump please put those hundred thousand words back on man it's such it's such a treasure and they don't do that 
minutes so anyway so that's a digression and a pet peeve that in this day and age your book which will be so invaluable as a repository of wisdom please don't uh, cut any words from it but you know a final sort of broader question about the book before we uh, you know dive into the first chapter which is that why the subject of the indian state as a whole like what you did what you've done with this book is you've taken on this very ambitious remit that of course we have a dysfunctional state but bolne mein to theek hai but let's look deeper and look at all its a separate constituent you know fault lines and dig deep into that and it could have been so tempting for you i guess to write the definitive book on education which you know so well or healthcare which you know so well or take any of these areas the danger in doing a vast book like that is you might feel that inevitably there'll be some subjects you know an incredible amount on uh, you know having done both the science and the engineering as it were but other subjects perhaps not so much so w- 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 what was that process in which that book took shape in your head give me a little insight into that no i think you know the see over the years obviously you know so my work in education itself started not in education but started as part of this iconic world development report in 2003 called making so public services work for the poor okay so the context of my first studies on all india studies on teacher absenteeism and doctor absenteeism in the public sector was very much motivated by this question of making services work right i mean so and so while i went deeper into education and like i mentioned last time jishnu and jeff and others went into health i came back to health and then i started working on design and delivery of welfare programs you know the 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 threads were just so obvious right i mean that you know so one way to say this is that and i and i'll come back when i talk about sieges at the end right is if i was a trade economist okay i could have a lot of impact by just changing certain policy frameworks with regard to how we think about openness of the economy right and then once you do that at the policy level the change pretty much happens because you're changing a tariff you're changing enforcement and then the private market will respond okay but if you're talking about reforming really complex subjects like education the issue there is not just changing a policy framework or passing a law or even increasing the budget right the issues there really have to do with frontline state capacity and how does this beast that's the state actually deliver on these core services and given the time i've spent on the ground across sectors it is just so obvious that the issues are the same across that intellectually I was almost more excited about writing a book on the state than about education and that's because an education book would be you know it would have a lot in it right but the core challenge like i said i mean you know 2012 the 12th five year plan already had the language about you know needing to prioritize basic foundational literacy numeracy skills but 7 years later we still hadn't made any headway and then new education policy you know it says all the right things and we're doing things but you know when i look at what's happening on the ground and we can talk about education a lot of good work is happening but it is still very much supply side in the sense that here is a program here is a policy here is some content and we're going to push this down and hope that outcomes are going to happen okay whereas the the i'm not in any way you know assured that those outcomes are going to happen without putting in some of the governance reforms right I mean which i'm talking about in the book so anyway so i think i don't think again there was a tension there at all that I, so it's true that i started writing when i started writing there was a narrower focus perhaps on a few sectors in service delivery but because i've been teaching a course in the indian economy for the past 6 years and there's an interesting actual intellectual aside over here right which is for about 8 years 2008 to 2016 i used to teach a development economics class right and then 2016 i said okay let me go create a new class in the indian economy and i thought the demand would be much lower my mother was very surprised in california mein why are you teaching an indian economy class but the class was not only as popular but my kind of student evaluations in the indian economy class were even higher okay than in the development economy class even though only 20% of the students had any connection to india and part of the reason was that when i when you teach development economics you end up taking some examples from latin america some from africa some from south asia some from southeast asia and just illustrating a bunch of concepts whereas here i was teaching it not as kind of here's a bunch of facts on india i was teaching it as an applied development economics class taught through the lens of the indian experience and so then what happens is you have a certain amount of institutional cultural historical c- continuity within which to locate all of this stuff right so i think in teaching that class i had also started seeing patterns across everything about you know the indian state and so often many books by academics kind of are a product of their teaching right because it's when you teach that you kind of put together a bunch of thoughts and frameworks so there's been no tension that way again you know i think 
the the tension i think the main tension has just been the fact that everything is interconnected and so there was a moment when people were reading the chapters you know i have a small circle of kind of colleagues and others like you know who who are reading the chapters and giving me feedback and you know some people have said why don't you consider splitting it into two volumes because there is just so much content in each like each of these 30 page chapters could be a book right i mean we've done episodes just on each chapter but breaking it into two i think would not work because the the strength of this guy is again the interconnections right so if you think about in a network the number of nodes the number of pairwise connections is increasing quadratically right as the number of things so cutting half the book would actually cut 75% of the value because you would not make the linkages across two volumes right and mean so anyway so i am doing what you've said it is you know channeling seen in the un- scenes kind of long episodes <laughs> right like you know and it'll hopefully hopefully hope, hopefully be worth it yeah so glad to hear that and it's interesting that you know even your kind of getting into the field and deciding to write this book has an r glass structure where you write with a broad article about services and you go into the you know the uh, stem of the r glass and you into education and healthcare and then you come out and there's this kind of grand book and i completely agree i mean i i, I think you know one should think of a book and perhaps even a big podcast episode or uh, a series or whatever as an insight machine and in this particular case i wouldn't want a machine broken into three parts and where i have to do the job of you know bringing them together myself you know i mean it's a very bad uh, metaphor i'm not as good as you but uh, uh, in the sense of you know you know i think having one book like that nothing edited everything as you mean it to be is really a public service and again i can't wait let's now you know what i sort of of really enjoyed about the book and enjoyed about your wonderful first chapter which i think is by the way i've only sent you two chapters right i haven't sent you the book <laughs> because i knew if i sent you everything we will be talking about everything i sent you the intro <laughs> Yeah yeah the no the intro is fantastic and i will eventually uh, read everything and hopefully we will do many more episodes uh, together some in person uh, but what i kind of loved about it is that the way you, uh, you know the opening chapter sort of you unpeel the layers of this onion of the indian state like first we talk about what is it good at what what is it bad at what are the problem areas you know you get a great metaphor which we'll uh, go back into but you talk about the what the why the how you know uh, what can we do all of that which is great let's start by talking about what the indian state is good at and what it is not good at and you briefly mention you you mention at great length i am briefly sort of restating that you say that the indian state is great at mission mode but terrible at uh, uh, when it comes to essential services so uh, unpack that for us yeah and you know i think again as, as the timing of this is wonderful as we look at 75 years of independence and just take stock of you know where we are as a country you know what have we done well where can we do better um, and i think even before i get into that specific question in the indian state it is worth kind of and this is not just a homily right i mean that i'm doing the first two paragraphs kind of talking about the positives you know it is so easy to kind of get pessimistic and beat down about all of the challenges we face right but you know i think in any sen- hence of historical perspective india is a spectacular success is a spectacular success right so the political project that's modern india and we'll come back to this when we talk about federalism right I mean and mm, you know multiple people talk about how when the british left the 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 betting was that india is not going to survive you know as 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 a unified country so the political project of modern india has been an astounding success right so there's obviously what it's incomplete we've got you know your wonderful episode with joey joseph and the security state like you know so there's many 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 areas right like you know where we have a long way to go right but given where we started i think so my assessment of india is if we were to grade ourselves we would be a very solid b plus okay like in a very solid b plus and in some areas even an a minus okay like you know but we are in the b plus a minus range and in fact in chapter 10 and i talk about accelerating india's development one of the really important things i do there is to say let's look at every development outcome in a, both across countries and across states and kind of just plot this with gdp per capita right and how are you doing relative to what you would expect at your gdp per capita and india does exactly as predicted okay and and in some cases slightly better okay so i think the 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 important point to keep in mind is the the political project that india has been an astounding success and similarly the economy right i mean we have been the fastest 
growing large democracy in the world for a very very long time right and so there are a few countries that have grown faster and we can talk about india and china and stuff like that later but you know the only democracy that's grown faster than india is botswana that has a population that's 1/500th that of india okay like you know or costa rica which is you know smaller than a, some average indian city right so the the scale of mm, and the the economic growth that's been delivered at the scale poverty reduction from 70% at independence to 20% like you know in 2011 you know these are these are astounding achievements okay and we should be really really proud of where we are as a country but again i wouldn't be writing this book if it was just about uh, clapping and praising ourselves you know the the overall story is if i was a professor grading india i would say can do better okay <laughs> like <in the> <laughs> so you know and hence hence the b plus so and then coming to the indian state itself right the indian state is again in many ways i mean it is amazing what it does at the level of resourcing it has right it runs the world's largest elections you know if you look at kind of i mean us elections are frankly like i mean it's an embarrassment right i mean compared to you know how well indian elections are run um India does disaster relief incredibly well so when 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 Katrina happened and folks from the US I think came to India to see you know there were some discussions about sharing best practices I think the Indian disaster relief operations are so good that you know what took the US guys close to 48 to 72 hours to do in India we managed to put in place in 4 hours okay and that's because you know whether it's earthquakes whether it's tsunamis whether it's other natural disasters right I mean the Indian system is just really really good at kind of you know cracking those things you know we do the kumbh mela which is the world's largest kind of collection of human beings in one place right i mean and manage all of that we do the world's largest vaccination campaigns right so the so the indian state is remarkably impressive in some ways right but at the same time you know we are obviously not delivering on core 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 services right so whether it's education where and again and the the scale of these challenges is just monumental right so you know we have the world's largest number of children at age 10 who can't read we have the world's largest number of malnourished children um so you know in education you you've spent kind of hundreds of thousands of crores and still have 50% of your rural population not even able to read at the end of fifth class of education and that's kind of both a moral and an economic tragedy health you've got like i said the largest number of malnourished children you've got 70% of kind of healthcare is <clears throat> fee charging private and 70% of them are quacks okay as we've talked about so about 50% of healthcare in this country is delivered by completely unqualified quacks you've got 13 of the 15 most polluted cities in the world right the police and public safety is kind of again you know it's it's it, it's again a mixed bag in the sense that you know core law and order has been maintained right so we have not had a general breakdown in law and order right I means so again the glass is always half full right I mean and then you know and even in nutrition and and think right we have seen significant reductions in infant mortality significant reductions in maternal mortality significant improvements in stunting it's just that we've not done it as fast as we could right and hence the can do better okay so and i'll come back to what the core of that is okay and then you know you talk about police right i think less than you know in many cases the police can't even reach the crime scene let alone solve it right so again hindi movies are ahead of re- you know they capture reality well there's a reason why the police always shows up in the last scene right like you know because that is reality <laughs> you know so that <laughs> um Okay, and uh, I think estimates are that less than only about ten percent of crimes actually get reported, right? I mean, so so again, and one metric of kind of policing is that does the average citizen feel more reassured or feel more nervous when you see a policeman? Okay, like I mean, and we have data to show that you're actually more scared of seeing a policeman than feeling the same. Which again suggests going back to Joey's you know lovely book and episode is that we haven't made that transition from a security state that's trying to rule the people to kind of a modern democratic state that's. designed to serve people right i mean so that's mm, courts you know we all know about the backlogs we all know about you know 30 million plus cases a million cases getting added every year but you know again and i'll come back to why i'm picking these sectors right in terms of instrumental and in, and and intrinsic importance but i think one fact that people don't fully appreciate is almost two thirds of people in prison in india are under trial okay so these are not convicted folks but are being held there because of the slowness of the judicial system right so it gives you again a sense of the magnitude of the problem we have okay then you know there's similar challenges with regard to the the design and delivery of welfare programs with jobs so you know the core challenge of the indian state therefore there are so, it, so how do you make sense of this so devesh kapoor has a nice piece on in the journal of economic perspectives um, Um, on why does the indian state both succeed and fail at the same time right i mean and you know so he's got a bunch of arguments and you know the core of my argument is very 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 simple right is that we have dramatically underinvested in the capacity of the indian state to meet the expectations of its people okay and that's kind of what and i'll tell you 
And this is true at every level, right? It's true at the level of data and systems. It's true at the level of people, public sector personnel. It's true in how we spend our money. But the core challenge when we make sense of, you know, where India is, and I talked a little bit about this in the health episode, but this is what chapter two is about, is that what democracy before development has meant is that we are, it's a wonderful moral achievement, right? Because it's given people a voice in the state well before, say, the US or UK or other countries that we call democracies. I mean, these were all really kind of, you know, almost fake partial democracies, right? That had votes for 20% of the population. So Indian democracy is the signature achievement, right? That we should all be proud of. But... The, it has created two fundamental tensions, right? So the first is a public finance challenge, which is that because the demand for welfare and the voter demand and political supply of welfare has happened at a much lower level of per capita income, that has meant that you haven't had the resources to invest in the core capacity of the state itself, okay? So, and, and this is not, you know, it's not a question of good or bad. It is a question of trade-offs, right? I mean, that there is there is a fixed pie, okay? And as a country, we have to make a choice about how are we investing our resources. And ideally, and I talk a lot about this in the social protection chapter, is you want to invest in ways that promote both equity and efficiency, okay? So the problem is not welfare spending. The problem is that we are doing welfare spending on such a weak administrative structure that the quality of that spending is so poor, okay, that the translation of the spending into outcomes is really weak, okay? So, and I mean, there's a reason I'm writing this entire book. But the core point, therefore, is the Indian state can succeed in mission mode because all of its resources are allocated to one problem in a time bound way. And then you can get it done because, you know, you have the resources, and you get it done and you're focused on that outcome. But when it comes to the day to day functioning of the state, it is just fundamentally under resourced relative to the expectations on the state. Now, it's not just a question of saying, let's hire more people, let's increase the budgets for health and education. It's because the efficiency of that is also really, really poor. Okay. Okay, so and I think so one way of characterizing, you know, the big picture argument of the book is that See, in study after study after study, and this is where when I talk about tying the threads across multiple RCTs, right? So whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's now, uh, you know, there's a postdoc working with me who has this lovely paper on courts, is that you we estimate that the returns to investing in governance and state capacity, the public returns, are often 10 to 20 times higher than spending more on the program itself, correct? So most of our policy discourse happens at the level of budget allocation, which sector should get more, which sector should get less. But we are not spending any time thinking about how does that spending translate into outcomes, correct? So if what you care about as a policymaker is how do I deliver outcomes for citizens, you can do that two ways, right? You can say I can spend more money or you can say I can improve the effectiveness of the delivery system and the capacity to do that. And what study after study is showing is that the returns to kind of investing in that capacity is going to be 10 times higher, right? And so, and in a way, the core intellectual argument I'm making for the country, right, is to say that, so here's a different way of saying this, right, is that we care about development, we care about health, we care about education, we care about safety. And if you look at a, any, like I said, cross-country or cross-state relationship, there's always a positive relationship between income and human development, okay? And so the way in that correlation, what has happened is you get the the two, the great debate in development has kind of been, you know, the Bhagwati Sen uh, debate, right? So you got the Jagdish Bhagwati, Arvind Panagriya view that says, listen, in the long-term growth is the most important thing, right? I mean, so you get 2% higher growth rates for 20 years and you will automatically do better on a whole range of these developments. Development outcomes. And the contrast with kind of the Amartya Sen genre's view is that, you know, you don't have to get weight to get rich, okay, before you can deliver better human development outcomes, okay, so, and, and, you know, and they focus on that, right? And so, now, at some level, both arguments are true, because in the long term, better human development helps growth, and better growth helps human development, okay? So, in practice, what this debate has translated to is at the time of budget allocation, do you allocate more money for, say, roads and railways and physical infrastructure? that may promote growth or do you allocate more for the social sector and traditionally what has happened is that center left governments have tended to do more on the social sector center right governments have tended to do more on capex okay but but the truth in a country like india is that that swing is not wide okay it's a relatively narrow swing here and there right so i think my biggest intellectual point of departure in this book is to say that that great Bhagavati Sen debate may, made sense in the 70s and 80s but it may be distracting us from the fact that the 
regardless of what you spend on, you're spending so badly, right? I mean, so your capex is incredibly inefficient. Your social sector spending is also incredibly inefficient. And so if you focus instead on kind of improving the quality of the pipes and service delivery and state capacity, that you can do more of everything, okay? So that way, there is no conflict because you're so far inside this production possibilities curve that when you add the PPF, then there's a trade-off, right? But when you're so far inside, you can do more of everything. And therefore, and which is kind of, you know, one of the other things I talk about in the book is to hopefully kind of find an ideological middle ground that can unify both the left and the right, right? I mean, around this kind of what we're trying to do. So I think Yogendra Yadav has this very nice quote about India where he says, you know, that the left does not have a viable economics and the right does not have a viable politics, okay, <laughs> which is... Because the left would like to redistribute more, but we're a poor country and the government doesn't have the money to redistribute as much as the left would like. The right would like to kind of do more capex and growth, but that doesn't work with the democratic constraint, right? That politically you need to do welfare, right? I mean, and so that's the fundamental ideological loggerhead we are caught at. And part of what I'm trying to do is not just kind of be technocratic about what we can do, but also kind of, you know, build a broader set of inclusion and kind of identify an agenda that we can all agree on, right? Right? I mean, so that we kind of move away from the zero-sum nature of our public discourse to kind of saying, what are the investments that can allow all of us to do better as a country? So that's broadly why I'm writing the book. And then most of it is then about the how. <laughs> No, that's wonderful. And, and you, you know, what I particularly like is the core point of what you just said. And uh, c- correct me if I, you know, in my effort to be concise, I don't state it so well. But is that, you know, the the, uh, the, the argument about the trade-offs between growth and redistribution are moot. Because at the bottom of it lies the problem of state capacity, that the pipelines aren't good. And what you are saying is that, listen, let's fix the state. If we fix the state, we can do growth, we can do redistribution as well. We can satisfy all sides of the uh, sort of so the, really fixing the state is not something that any one of any ideology should have uh, any uh, problem with uh, but, uh, and aside as a lament that you know when when you speak of mission mode versus essential services one that is so so true but two what it also strikes me is that the uh, the title of the show is especially uh, sort of uh, uh, valid here the seen and the unseen because it's really uh, a distinction between seen and unseen missions that covid-19 comes or a hurricane strikes, that's a seen mission. We can see the damage. But, uh, you know, there is an unseen mission, an unseen disaster, which is a failure of the Indian state throughout all this time. Like in your book, you point out, among many other incredible statistics, that 30% of Indian children today are malnourished. 30%, you know. And to me, 75 years after we've become independent and all, that is unconscionable. That is a massive failure. In fact, even earlier, what you said about, you know, where, you know, when you compare our uh, metrics, whatever they are, to countries of a similar GDP per capita, we are doing as well or, or better. But my fundamental point there is that our GDP per capita should have risen much faster. And what, what we've really had is a long, slow period until maybe, you know, the middle of the 80s and the 90s, of course, what liberalization did. And then you have that shooting up and hundreds of millions coming out of poverty, you know. And, and you know, which was then the opportunity cost of all the bad policies of the past. It, hundreds of millions of people remained in poverty and therefore uh, that uh, is something I'd classify as a humanitarian disaster. And, and, and again, and you know, and to be fair again to the founding fathers and everybody, I mean, I really think India's, you know, the big lost decade of 15 years was really those Indira Gandhi years, right? Like, you know, yeah, in, exactly. it was really exactly. 65 to 80, right? I mean, that was the truly lost decade. I think... I most of the decisions that were taken post-independence, I think, were completely in line with global thinking at that time. So you can't even fault anybody for those decisions, right? I mean, and if anything, they were vigorously debated, vigorously talked about. Where we really missed the boat was the, you know, was those 15 years, right? I mean, and then I think, I think you've had. Pooja Mehra also on the show, right? I mean, and then, you know, we've had the last decade and then you've had the conversations recently with Montek and with Ajay. And I think the important thing there is to just repeat and reinforce that we can't take growth for granted, right? I mean, it takes kind of both seeding the world of ideas and seeding the world of policy with kind of repeating certain basic fundamentals, right? About how these things matter. But again, you know, I think I'm not... The, the, the whole goal of the book, I mean, in some ways, is to kind of be cautiously optimistic, right? I mean, by kind of saying that it's very, very easy to get down on kind of the scale of the problems, right? So, and that's why I end with that David Landy's quote. But yes, I think, you know, the point is well taken that both growth matters, but you by improving the functioning of the Indian state at any given level of GDP per capita, you can deliver much, much better outcomes, right? I mean, and so that's why there's no conflict if you can actually improve the functioning of the state. 
Yeah, yeah, and I completely agree uh, agree with you about how our founders pretty much had no choice in the sense that knowing what they did then, and they hadn't, of course, read your book. If Nehru and Ambedkar read your book, it could have been different. But knowing <laughs> what they knew then, you know, they made a, be- a good faith effort to do the best that they could for the country, and that no, is no, of I mean, course that, not yeah, true. And that, and, Indira yeah, Gandhi that, yeah, and that her. would be incredible hubris to think that you know they should read my book. In fact, my sophomore paper in college, when I was taking class in Indian economy, was actually an in- intellectual history of the policy choices that was made at that. At time and you know so this is stuff I actually studied as a sophomore in college and no it was actually really incredible not just in terms of the choices that were made but more importantly the amount of debate and discussion there was it wasn't nearly like I mean as monolithic as like you know as it may seem there was in fact a lot of healthy discussion about a lot of these things so yeah Let's sort of, uh, uh, but before we move on, I, I, you know, I, I think of the state through a number of uh, frameworks, uh, which you would know because you seem to have heard all my episodes. I, 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 <laughs> you know, I feel like you're a, yeah, you're like a creepy stalker who's, you know, seen all the pictures on my phone and, you know, I have nowhere to hide right now. That's how I feel. But, uh, you know, and so one of the frameworks I look at the state is, of course, uh, Fram, uh, Francis Fukuyama's, you know, framework of scope versus strength. strength. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a way to sum up India there is that we do too many things badly instead of doing a few things really well and obviously being classical liberal as I am I would want the state to just focus on a few things and do them really really well instead we focus on many things and do them really badly and perhaps your point is that there isn't so much of a dichotomy if you just improve state capacity in all the various ways that you outline in this book that we could do those few things well and then we could do a few other things as well at least it wouldn't be a disaster and you know money down the drain with all the sort of implications of that. But I want to now sort of talk about your wonderful metaphor of what kind of car, you know, we are in. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, and you know, I think, so maybe given that, you know, you are talking about the intro chapter having read it, but you can't post it, right? I mean, maybe what I will do is take maybe 10 minutes to just lay out the broader arc of the book and then, you know, and put that metaphor, you know, put that metaphor in there. And yeah, this is also partly reassuring your reader, your listeners are holding me accountable over the course of this time that the book is actually happening happening it's there the ideas are there it's not just like one of these (laughs) it's like you know not one of these things you will get it one day uh but no i think the metaphor see the metaphor i use is that just like the ambassador car right was a metaphor for pre-liberalization india right i mean you could think about a similar metaphor for the indian state right the indian state itself is like a 1950s car okay because the 50s is when we made the last set of institutional investments in what the state was going to be right that was part of what the founders did now Over the years, what has happened is you have added more and more and more expectations onto the state and onto the car without commensurately investing in the capacity of the car to carry that load. Okay, so what politicians are doing is competing in which direction to steer the car. Okay, like I mean, but the car itself is barely moving. Okay, so hence you know, land uh, flailing state kind of analogy also you know partly comes from there. But the other reason the car analogy works so well is that today when you want to move the car in a certain way, you still put some fuel, right? So Additional budgets will make the car move a little bit, but the translation of the budget into distance traveled is very poor because the car is a 1950s car, right? I mean, and then, you know, and so, and so what does a politician who wants to deliver in certain areas do? You increase the budget and you put the, you know, you put a lot of pressure on those officers in that department to deliver, saying, ye karna hai. And that's like pressing the accelerator in a 1950s car, right? So, so it will sputter, sputter and move along a little bit, right? Like, I mean, but the, what is needed and again, to be fair to politicians, right? I mean, it's one set of skills to win an election. It's another set of skills to run the government, which is already a big skill. And then it's a completely different set of skills to actually architect the state, right? I mean, which is even different from driving the state, right? I mean, architecture is a very ki baat hai, right? Like, I mean, and so you can't even blame them given the time horizons and given, you know, the different incentive structures. And so because you're trying to both drive the car as fast as you can, you never invest in the maintenance and in kind of the read design. And so I think one of the reasons we are at this place with the returns to investing in state capacity that the res- data shows is 10 times, 20 times higher is because you've underinvested so much. So marginal cost, marginal benefit, if you equate, because you've done so little of that, those returns get very high. So I think, you know, taking a, a big picture, this thing about the book itself, right? So it's 18 chapters, right? So there's this intro chapter that's laying out kind of India's crisis of state capacity, right? Which is what I've sent you. Now, the core of the book is technocratic in terms of what we need to do about this. But it is bookended both at the beginning and the end by a deeper discussion of politics, 
right? Because in the end, the incentives have to align, right? So, so, and so we've got chapter two and three, which are really about the building blocks of the Indian state. Um, so chapter two is called the politician's predicament and chapter three is called the bureaucracy's burden, right? I mean, which is, you know, so we, the taxpaying class, often just have such a derisive kind of attitude towards both the politicians and the bureaucrats, right? Things, politicians at worst are corrupt, at best are taking taxpayer money to give out freebies and get reelected, right? Like, I mean, so that is certainly the trope of politicians. And then for bureaucrats, the trope is that, you know, they're generally lazy, officious, risk averse, whatever. And, you know, I think my point is that both of these are actually really, really unfair, right? I mean, that once you kind of get into the constraints that these actors are functioning under, what you realize is that, that there are an incredible number of good people who are stuck in a really bad system, okay? And so, and that's why the core point of the book is to take a systems level view of the Indian state to both diagnose and then hopefully cure, right? So, so, so chapter two and three then get into kind of, yeah, so, and we can talk a little bit more about that, but the core point of the politician's predicament is again that the pressure to deliver welfare, right, I mean, at a low level of GDP per capita means that the political incentives have always veered towards, you know, doing things that are visible, right? I mean, again, it's seen and unseen everywhere, right? I mean, it needs to be visible, it needs to be seen, it needs to be attributable, and that has sharply limited kind of the investments in the state itself, right? Now, but there's another subtle point, and this is, uh, again, we could take an entire episode there, which is that the nature of the constrained state has also affected the nature of our politics, right? Which is that because voters and politicians rationally know that the state cannot cater to everybody, the nature of the politics becomes one of how do I grab my share of the state resources, right? So the entire nature of vote bank politics is then comes from the fact that I can't deliver to everybody, right? I mean, so it is I deliver to my dedicated base voters who show up to vote. And that creates another vicious cycle because the vicious cycle that creates is that if the political incentives are to direct the resources of the state towards preferred groups, then you don't want a competent and independent bureaucracy. You want a pliable bureaucracy, right? Like, I mean, that will do your bidding. So over the years, we have emasculated the bureaucracy, right? I mean, both in terms of its independence and competence, and also structurally by underinvesting in different aspects, whether it's staffing, whether it's training, whether it's performance measurement, whether it's data. So we've underinvested in bureaucratic effectiveness across the board. And so then you are now in this kind of place and the case for optimism, what I argue is, the case for optimism is that the nature of politics I genuinely think is changing, okay, in India, where the, so there's the old politics of vote bank politics, which is cleavages of various kinds, right? I mean, caste, region, religion, language, whatever. There's the cleavage-based old politics. And there is a newer politics of governance and service delivery, right? I mean, and essentially my contention is that I'm not saying that the old politics is over, but that the old politics is no longer enough, right? I mean, that you need to kind of at least have, so that can be a base of your votes, but you need to also show that you're able to deliver, okay? So the good news is that the political incentives are changing, and this is partly a result of education, partly a result of technology, partly a result of, you know, a bunch of things we can talk about, but I'm less interested in why the change is happening and the consequences of the change and the opportunity it gives us, okay? So, but the challenge today is that there are so many political leaders I've talked to who are incredibly frustrated by their own bureaucracies, right? I mean, inability to deliver. And, but it's unfair to blame this bureaucracy because you've underinvested them in 30 years, okay? So you are now at this place where there are politicians who really want to deliver, okay? And I've had now multiple conversations in the context of CGIS, which I'll come back to, that the demand from the political class about ways of improving governance is actually remarkably large, okay? The problem is that, you know, the bureaucracy has been so underinvested in, like, it means that that's not able to deliver. Now, it's not like it can't deliver. The way you deliver is you find your best officers, you put them in the few departments that matter to you, and then you try to drive good stuff in those departments. But you know, you, there's a shortage of good officers, there's a shortage of good people. And I remember working in a state where there was a chief minister who actually was pretty reformist, but there was a department that had gotten a secretary who wasn't very good. And I remember talking to the secretary to chief minister saying, like, you know, how do we make progress? He said, listen, you know, I, 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 I have only a few good people, okay? Like, I mean, and there's only so much I can do. So I think that, the, so there is a genuine opportunity that politically, I think there's a desire to do this. And therefore, I think the state capacity agenda has a politically feasible window of kind of happening. But that only gives you kind of the political opportunity. And again, going back to the 91 reforms, it's not enough to have a crisis to say that, like, you know, we'll do good things. You need an intellectual blueprint of what are we going to do, right? I mean, and so the hope here is that there is the 
like in any policy situation, right? Uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Okay, so you need both. And if the opportunity shows up, but you haven't prepared, then you don't quite know how to, you know, do stuff. Conversely, you can do all the prep, but you know, there's no opportunity. So my hope is that we are at an inflection point as a country where there is political demand to kind of deliver better governance. But that's going to require actually strengthening the state, which then is like I said, is a job of re-architecting the state. So it's not just a question of increasing budgets. It's then a question of really getting into the innards of the dysfunction and saying what constitutes effective state capacity and how do we build that. So then that is then the next six chapters of the book, right? Which is the conceptual core of the book, which is saying, you know, what are the building blocks of effective states, right? Um, and those six chapters are, we start with data and measurement. So it's again, wonderful. You've had more. So in a way, I feel like this thing is an ode to all of your episodes over the years. Like, you know, I mean, and your constant rants about saying that we are dealing with a dysfunctional state. So, you know, I feel like in my, yeah. So you, you are like this voice in my head over the years. Like, you know, okay, chalo. Amit ko khush karte. <laughs> uh, but you know, but but we start with data and outcome measurement, and you know, you've had episodes with Pramit and Rukmini on that, right? I think something you've not had an episode on, which is a much more complex subject, right, is actually public sector personnel management, right? I mean the innards of the personnel economics of the state, right? And so, and that's chapter five, right, about how we are kind of messing up everything from recruitment to training to posting to performance measurement promotions, every aspect of public sector human resource management, right? I mean is kind of dysfunctional is too strong a word, but is really at rock bottom. Okay, so one simple way of saying this is that the Department of Personnel and Training, which is supposed to do all of this stuff, is informally known as Department of Postings and Transfers, right? Because the only thing that they focus on is how are you transferring people as opposed to kind of the deeper aspects of building an effective kind of human resource uh, base and strategy uh, for the state, right? So, so people really are the sinews of the state. And that's chapter five. Okay. Uh, and then chapter six is on public finance and expenditure. Because again, what is what is the state? What is the government? It is trying to express some notion of the collective good through taxation and spending, right? And so effective states spend their money effectively. And part of that chapter is just documenting how incredibly badly we spend our public money, right? I mean, and so again, it's not like we have no accountability. But the accountability is very much on process and compliance and not on outcomes, okay? So um, so it's not like we don't have a CAG that we have other measures of, account of accountability. But, and there's this wonderful example, you know, which again, the, the references to pop culture are quite nice here, right? So when in the, I don't know if I talked about this in education, okay? But think about education technology, okay? So we think that technology can be transformative. And, but what does national ed tech policy look like? It looks like, what is the budget for computer labs? How many computers am I going to procure? And how many labs am I going to build? But then when I go to the schools, you'll see that in the majority of these labs, the labs are locked and then Chavi is sitting with the principal. Okay. Now, what, why is that? Because his incentives are not about is the computer being used, it is it should not get stolen. Right. If it's chori, ho jai to, like, I mean, I'm in deep trouble. Right. And again, you can see all of this in pop culture. So in the show Panchayat, which I love, right, there's this entire episode called Computer Nahi Monitor. Right. Well, computer chori ho if monitor chori ho gai to, the guy was in deep trouble. Whereas even if the computer had had never been used, nobody was going to ask him any questions, right? So it's not that we don't have accountability, but the accountability is completely on compliance, right? I mean, as opposed to outcomes. And then there's many, many other aspects of kind of the architecture of public expenditure that is, you know, dysfunctional is too strong a word, but really, really rock bottom, okay, in terms of both how we allocate the money and how we spend the money, right? So then that's that chapter. Then there's this seventh chapter is revenue, which is again, the core of the state. The issue here is not just in terms of quantity of revenue, but also the quality of revenue, which is something Ajay and Vijay talk about, like, you know, they almost sound like Amitabh Bachchan twins in some movie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, Kil Ajay Kil Kil yeah, Kilkar Shah is fine, but Ajay Vijay sounds like, you know, okay, this is Amitabh and his twin, like, you know, uh, in some movie. Uh, but anyway, so I think, you know, they talk about marginal cost of public funds, right? I mean, and then I do a deeper dive into kind of the landscape of revenue instruments and how the you know, we th there is actually a lot of lo low hanging fruit if we start thinking also about the quality of revenue. And I'll talk about this in the federalism uh, chapter as well. Then the eighth chapter is federalism, which is ostensibly what we're talking about today, okay, which is, you know, reflecting on the fact that India has one fifth of humanity, right? We have more people in India than all of Africa, right? I mean, which is 54 countries. We have more people in India than the entire Western hemisphere put together. North America, Central America, South America put together, we have about 50% more people than all of that, right? So how do you possibly 
govern, like I mean, such a large country without effective kind of decentralization. And just one stunning fact here is that, see, people think about China as being very, very strong and centralized and Xi Jinping controls everything. But while it's true that the party is omnipresent, if you look at one key measure of decentralization, which is at what level of government are your budget spent and at what level of government are your staff allocated, in China, over 50%, 5-0% of public expenditure happens at the local government level. In India, that is 3%. Okay? So China is 17 times more decentralized than India when it comes to kind of local expenditure. Okay, so And we'll dive a lot more into that when we talk about federalism. But really kind of understanding federalism and understanding the optimal architecture of functions and funds and functionaries at different levels of the government is again a cross-cutting theme that affects all. So what's sitting in the themes part of the book are cross-cutting that apply across all sectors, right? And then there's, there's chapter nine on state in the market, right? Which is given that the market accounts for 70% of healthcare, 50% of education, like, you know, in security, the private sector employs five times more than all of the public government put together. How should we kind of optimize the interface of the state in the market? And again, we talked a little bit about this in the education uh, episode. And you can see the cross connections, right? How so many of these themes will then show up in the sectors. But I think one very useful high level way of thinking about the about the state and market chapter is that the government plays three very distinct roles in the ecosystem, right? You are a policymaker, you are a regulator and you are a provider okay and the way you think about the private sector needs to be very different in those three roles right so as a policy maker the private sector is your ally because you care about delivering outcomes regardless of whether it's delivered by public or private as a regulator the private is your equal as a provider the private is your competition okay now the problem is 95 percent of government budgets and staff are allocated to government as provider which means intrinsically in the dna of the government is a deep distrust of the private sector. That's because of where the government's kind of own staffing and resources and mindset are, right? So having some conceptual clarity there about, and again, this is not just to say blindly privatize, there are huge challenges, right? So, but that's a chapter that tries to provide conceptual clarity about how to optimize, right? I mean, the role of the private sector to deliver outcomes in the public interest, okay? So, and this is where some people were like, there's enough for a book right here, right? I mean, why don't you stop here at nine chapters? But the second half of the book is then recognizing that, listen, these concepts are still very abstract. And in the end, for a government to take action on it, for people to get galvanized around it, people tend governments are organized around sectors, around departments, right? So you need to then take these ideas and saying, okay, what where do we want to kind of deploy this? And there's actually a very subtle and interesting kind of aside, right? And which we can talk a little bit about, which is even though I believe that the state capacity agenda is something that the left and the right and everybody should coalesce around, there is a notable group of skeptics who think that if you have a malevolent state, then a weak state is actually better, okay? And I think Naushad discussed this in his episode with you when he talked about Germany, Italy, and Spain, right? Like, I mean, that under World War II, under fascist governments, the one with the highest capacity actually did the worst outcome. So if you believe the state is malevolent, like, I mean, people may actually want to kind of have a weak state. But I think that's very, very, very short sighted, right? Because if you were to integrate over 100 years of, say, you know, Germany versus Greece, you would much rather be Germany than Greece, okay, in terms of what a well functioning state has delivered for its people, okay? So what you want is to build an effective state, but also then build the safeguards and systems that that capacity is used to serve people rather than rule them, okay? So, but that's again a chicken and egg. It's a chicken and egg and I talk about this specifically in the context of say cops and police, right? Which is, you know, at one level, you've got incredible kind of problems of police violence overuse and encounter killings are probably the most extreme version of that, okay? But but the fact is, on in practice, the senior officers will say they don't like it, but they have to condone it because the alternative is that you're in court for 25 years and no action is taken. And so even the extrajudicial aspects of kind of how our police function reflect the weak state capacity, that you don't have the resources for the investigations, you don't have the resources for, you know, the judicial system to deal with this in a rule in a rule of law way okay so it is one thing to have the aspirations of a modern democratic state in on in the constitution but if you haven't invested in the capacity of the state to meet those aspirations then again
again, it's relatively hot. So uh, a lot of the disquiet that we feel about India comes not, I think, from a lot of people think this is lack of intention. My own view is that in most of the case, it's not intention, but it's lack of capacity, right? I mean, so anyway, so I think, the so, but the reason I'm giving you that aside is then that the second half of the book is then saying, if these are the ways you improve the effectiveness of the state by kind of, you know, and each of these, it's not just saying improve data, right? Each chapter has very, very concrete ideas. So then that's kind of the worm's eye part of this, right? Which is saying there are six things that you can actually do under each of these things that are now possible that we just kind of need to get our act together and get it done, right? So each of those chapters has very concrete ideas. And then there's this transition chapter chapter 10, which is accelerating India's development, right? I mean, where I talk about all of these cross-country, cross-state comparisons by income and then sh- making the case that, listen, both the growth wallas, see, if you listen to the growth wallas, they'll say, let's go from 6 to 8% and then everything will be great, okay? But part of my point is, if you look at how growth has translated into better outcomes in the past 20 years and extrapolate that, that even going to 8% growth is not going to get you to a good enough place in India to, at 2047, okay? The, the rate at which the income is translating into outcomes is unacceptably slow. Conversely, the development wallas will say increase the budgets, okay, like you mean of health, education, whatever. And I show that even if you do that, you're not going to do that much better. Whereas if you improve the effectiveness of the state and in the translation of the income into the outcomes, that's what's going to allow you to accelerate India's development across all of these parameters, right? I mean, so yes, you want the growth, but you also want to go to the north of that. Okay, so that's that transition chapter. And then the policy core of the book is then six chapters, six sector chapters. Right, which is education and skills, health and nutrition, police and public safety, courts and justice, social protection and welfare, and jobs, productivity, and economic growth. Okay, so and why these six sectors is basically it's because going back to the Amartya Sen and, and Bhagwati discussion, right, is that. What is nice about these six sectors is they are both intrinsically important to kind of human welfare and instrumentally important for aggregate economic growth. Okay, so the like I said in the last episode, we were talking about health and education. See, the Chicago view of human capital is that you get educated because it makes you more productive. You get healthier because it makes you more productive. Okay, but the intrinsic view of this is independent of my productivity, being more educated makes gives me a more empowered life. Being healthier gives me a better quality life, right? And so each of these six sectors ticks both of those boxes, that better education gives you a more meaningful individual life and accelerates economic growth. Better health, nutrition, environment is going to help both individuals and aggregate productivity. Police and public safety, I think basic safety is the most essential component of, you know, of of a good life. But then the better safety is also going to have massive productivity implications, right? So whether it's kind of security, property rights and investment, or just improving female labor force participation. So you've talked many times about kind of, you know, gender issues and, you know, safety is a huge tax and a huge constraint that constrains, you know, uh, our ability to kind of uh, not just provide safety intrinsically, but to increase instrumental goals like labor force participation. Okay. Same with courts and justice, right? So obviously there's the human rights tragedy of two thirds of our kind of incarcerated population not even having been found guilty. So that's at an intrinsic level that this is a moral failing. But instrumentally, right, there's this paper by my Rao, you know, who's uh, who got a PhD at Berkeley and is now at UCSD as a postdoc, and she's got this lovely paper looking at district judge vacancies, right, and showing that every extra district judge that's appointed clears about 200 cases a year. But more importantly, because 70% of the cases that are kind of handled in district courts are either land or credit, okay? So these are factors of production that are being locked from productive use because they're under dispute, right? So therefore, unlocking those factors of production actually leads to a significant increase in total economic activity. And the estimate is that the increased tax revenue from that activity will more than pay for this. So you get a return of infinite if you make those investments, okay? So so that's then an example of why kind of strengthening courts and justice is both intrinsically and instrumentally important, right? Um, and then there's, you know, chapter 15 on social protection and welfare, where again, you know, I think our public discourse has, I think, a very coarse dichotomy of freebies versus investment, right? And I, again, I argue that that's a little misguided, that what you really want to think about is on the axis of equity and efficiency. And you'll see that there are some welfare programs that are bad for both, like say free electricity for farmers. And there are some that are good for both, okay? So it's not this kind of broad brush, welfare is bad or welfare is good. The details really, really matter, okay? And 
This is where it's not just about intrinsic welfare, that it's good for people to be protected from the vagaries of the market, but it's also instrumentally good for the economy. Why is that? Because how does growth happen, right? Growth happens from the process of individuals undertaking investments that are going to give you positive returns. But any investment is risky, okay? And so if you look at all the studies of, say, agriculture, crop diversification, the first time you grow a new crop, you will lose money because you're learning, okay? And so having a well-functioning social protection system actually gives you the cushion to undertake the risk that gets you to a higher growth path at every individual level. So again, the question is architecting it and getting into the details, the details really, really, really matter. Okay, like is kind of one of the messages that comes out of that chapter. And then finally, the the jobs, productivity, and economic growth, and that goes without saying, it's the most important intrinsic source of both empowerment and income, but also sense of kind of meaningful contribution is, is a job. And then that's obviously about economic growth, right? So then those six chapters, therefore, become kind of the policy core of the book, right? Which is how do you, but it's not, so in a way, I'm having both, right? You said, why didn't I write a book on education? So this is my way of trying to do both, right? I mean, there's both the sectoral piece and the thematic piece. And then the last two chapters are then going back to kind of the politics and the institutions and it's kind of on making it happen. So chapter 17 is about reimagining institutions, which is to say, it's not enough to just have a bunch of these ideas for re-architecting the Indian state. You want to institutionalize them in a way that it becomes daily practice without people even having to think about it, right? So going back to say, Atul Gawande checklist manifesto, etc. there's cognitive constraints and you can't have to think about this, think about it. It just needs to become automatic in terms of how you function. So then... <clears throat> And again, so one thing I've not talked about so far, which we'll talk about maybe in federalism, is that a key part of this entire book is focusing on ideas that can be done at the state level. Okay, so the early draft of the book had this working title of Fixing the Indian State, a roadmap for chief ministers. Um, that title is going to change, but one of the key points is I'm focusing at the state level. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in the federalism chapter. But even on the institutions chapter, part of my point is that we have so far relied purely on the government of India to make institutional investments for the country. But there's no reason why states cannot take the lead in reimagining some institutions, right? And then chapter 18 is about state, citizen, and civil society, which is then, you know, agar ye karna hai, to how do we all kind of play a role, right? I mean, in trying to make this happen. So anyway, like, you know, now I feel, Are, yaar, I'm done. We don't need a book episode. But that is just kind of the outline of one section in chapter one. <laughs> No, I mean, the, first of all, this is such a lovely uh, summary of the book and it's very apt that this episode is releasing on Independence Day because it's almost like you're taking stock from this bird's eye view of the entire Indian state. So there are like 13,814 <laughs> things I want to double click on. But first and aside that, you know, if I was forming a libertarian heavy metal band, many of my album titles would have come from phrases you just used. For example, inards of the dysfunction, sinews of the state, return of infinite. These are just remarkable uh, titles. So, you know, uh, if, if you get past Antakshari into something maybe a little heavier, uh, you know, there is a, a future for you. I'd love to see the kind of lyrics that you come up with. Now, you know, from this bird's eye view, I'm not going to dive in directly into some worm's eye view or the other because that would be a little uh, disorienting perhaps. But it's almost like a bird is flying and it's got the bird's eye view. And then it notices in the distance what appears to be a large colony of worms. And its gaze kind of you know focuses onto that and and that's the kind of view i'm going to take in the sense that you know all of us use state capacity in just this very general kind of way it's become one of those phrases like people will use liberal or people will use freedom and people will use so many words which have become so nebulous through overuse and because they mean so much but you've got a really nice section where you kind of begin with uh, sort of defining that that what do what, what does one mean by state capacity and then what are the factors of state capacity so um, uh, you, you know so take us a bit through that because i feel when we start discussing state capacity it's it's important to at least agree on the definition first and uh, your explanation was so lucid that i will ask you to you know for my benefit and my listeners benefit just go through that again that what are the different ways in which we can define it and what are the various factors that uh, you know go into state capacity and from there we can go on to talk about okay where are our failures why are we weak and so on 
Yeah, and I think, you know, so this is, yeah, this is just section two of that intro chapter, right? I mean, where I'm kind of defining his key things. Now, I think the the academic literature has, you know, the, there are different ways of thinking about state capacity. Some measures are just your ability to protect your borders, your ability to enforce the writ of the law, right? I mean, within your borders, collecting revenue is an important measure. There are meta definitions of state capacity, which has to do with your institutions of negotiating disagreement and conflict, right? So, you know, even having effective political institutions is a measure of state capacity, right? Because the breakdown of law and order often reflects, you know, essentially a failure of a political process, okay, to say that there is, in fact, a a win-win equilibrium that we could move to, right, if we got away from this conflict. So there are meta definitions of state capacity, which is can you even strike this political bargain that people ex- coexist without, you know, being at each other's throats all the time. And then I think, you know, there is, in my, from my perspective, I'm focusing on state capacity fundamentally in its executive, in its executive sense, correct, which is the ability of a state to implement its own policies and programs and to kind of just to perform its core functions, right? So the core functions of a state, whether it's law and order, whether it's justice. Now, health and education, you might argue, are not core definitional functions of a state, but a modern democratic state expects that the state is going to do health and education a certain amount of welfare, right? Means so, so I'm defining state capacity in the book fundamentally as, like I said, about the car itself, right? I mean, it's so I am not in the business of directing the car, okay? That is something that comes from the political process, but this is about how do you re-architect and engineer the car so that it can deliver better for whatever the political process kind of says that the state should do, okay? So then these six specifics, which I then talk about what determine state effectiveness, right, are then getting into the innards of state capacity. And those are then the six chapters, which I've talked about. But I can say a little bit more, right, which is kind of, you know, on data and, and outcome measurement, right? So the truth is that we did have one of the best statistical systems in the world, right? I mean, so Pramit's been writing a series of uh, on this, which has been very nice. Um, but yes, whether it was Mahalanobis, whether it was others, you know, India was the envy of the world in terms of the statistical systems we set up. But as with other areas of the state, we have just not invested in this, right? So today, we are so far behind kind of the frontiers of what is possible. And, you know, it's easy to blame this on politics, but I think politics is actually a relatively small part of it. A bigger part of it is just the institutional kind of under investment, right? I mean, over the years. So whether it's new technology for data collection, whether it's, you know, anyway, so there's a data and outcome measurement kind of chapter, which is, and there's a chief secretary who once told me, you know, is it, is it our systems are built on house of cards because I went and presented evidence of how much fudging there is in the official data, you know, so I have that one. And again, it connects back to the uh, education episode, right? With that wonderful quote of Asliyat, Aapko Asliyat se te laga kyu hai, right? And so you see this in the official data, there is no learning crisis at all. Okay. And then you go do this independent audit, you just see that the true levels of learning are way lower than what's in the official data. Even in a high functioning state like Tamil Nadu, the rate of malnutrition reported in the official ICDS data um, Severe malnutrition was about 1%, whereas in the data, it's about 8%, right? So it's an under, you're understating by a factor of eight. So, and people know this, right? So, so the, and there's another senior government advisor who said, you know, we're, we're basically flying blind here, okay? So, and so there are, and again, this goes back to my point that there are incredibly thoughtful well-meaning, public-spirited, outstanding officials within the system, but none of them individually has the capacity to kind of fix systemic issues, right? I mean, and so part of what this is, there's nothing here that... So one of the reality checks on the book is I've had multiple IS officer friends of mine read to just make sure that I'm characterizing things correctly. And what they say is that yes, sab humko intuitively pata hai, like you mean, but apne frameworks mein itna acha sa samjhaya hai ki this is you know this is correct, right? So but the, but the data and the outcome measurement is the first kind of foundation. The second is, you know, then just aspects of public sector personnel management, right? So we think about the state as bloated, but the truth is India has actually the fewest number of public employees per capita relative to any major comparator country, right? So it's five times less even than the US. And that's because, you know, and 10 times less than Scandinavia, okay? So uh, there is a massive problem in terms of just staffing strength, but there's also a problem of accountability. So you can't just say I will hire more people, okay? So the, the personnel challenge of the Indian state is a bit like there's this famous quote of two people in a restaurant going and looking at the food. And the first guy says the food is the food is miserable. 
and the second one says yes and the portions are too small okay <laughs> <laughs> so it's woody allen joke i think from any all but the point is that that's a bit like the nature of the indian state right it is both too small and too inefficient so you can't just expand it in its current form you need to both rearchitect and expand right so you need both of those pieces coming together okay so that's personnel and then yeah we've got these other pieces i've talked about you know expenditure revenue federalism state and market yeah so those are then i mean there may be other pieces but these are i think six pillars that cross cut across every sector and that's kind of why i focused on that brilliant uh, and 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 you know just to kind of sum it up for my uh, readers you speak about how you know data personnel public expenditure collecting revenue efficiently coordinating across multiple layers of a federal uh, governance structure there's a heavy metal title in there somewhere <laughs> and uh, you know and working with non state actors like the private sector and civil society all of these are sort of constituents Uh, of you know how, how you would you know look at uh, state capacity now you know another frame that i found really interesting as a narrative frame you know when we talk about why the indian state is so weak uh, uh, you, you, you know we we talk about politics and earlier you were talking about the incentives of politicians in fact a long time back i you know spoke about the interplay between money and power and i wrote this limerick which is called politics uh, and so politics a neta who loves currency notes told me what his line of work denotes it is kind of funny we steal people's money and use some of it to buy their votes <laughs> and uh, so you know uh, that kind of indicates where i'm coming from but what you have explained so well is you've explained it in terms of uh, incentives and how that changed the system and you've e- explained it really with this narrative of nation building to election winning right which is sort of useful to see that transition and in a sense it is a transition that really happens between nehru and indira gandhi in a sense so tell me a little bit about that and how that how therefore politicians incentives get shaped into that particular thing and that particular you know through that particular phase of time mm-hmm. yeah so and i think the so like i said right these investments in kind of the last time we made systematic investments in the state and the capacity were in the 1950s when there was clearly a nation building mode right post independence you've got a very broad coalition that represents kind of you know and then people talk about the congress you know pre indira congress is a very different beast from post indira congress right so you know pre indira congress this truly is kind of a, a a broad tent that's the party of independence and has kind of the legitimacy right need to pursue because essentially they are practically guaranteed to win elections right i mean uh, the towering figure of nehru the broad kind of quality of the cabinet so it's a time when you're truly able to make these investments correct and then what happens of course is that as the that legitimacy of or the broad tent of the congress starts kind of you know mm, breaking apart right you know whether it's the left and the right or whether it's regions you know then the nature of politics very naturally starts becoming kind of more about identifying your base voters right i mean and this is where it doesn't help that the sheer amount of underlying diversity and heterogeneity in india means that it is easy to construct kind of narrower group based identities and kind of mobilize political activity around that right i mean and so uh, and so then you get in and, and again i think rahul you know i think rahul verma talked about you know the four phases of kind of indian politics democracy so there's nothing new i'm saying in any of this stuff right i think political scientists have analyzed a lot of this with regard to kind of the nature of the democracy what i have not seen as much in the political science literature is kind of the downstream consequences of the nature of the politics for the nature of kind of the economics in the state right so again it happens there is this discussion often about the implications for economic policy what i've not seen enough is kind of the implications for the state itself i think so the closest so pratap's classic on burden of democracy in 2003 i think says has some kind of uh, elements of this pranam bardhan like you know who is a very famous development economist but probably in development economics was the one who used to think about these political issues the most right he wrote about this even in the 80s okay when he talked about how the fragmented nature of indian politics just make made it really really hard to build the mm, political consensus for investing in broad purpose public goods okay so so and one of the things i talk about in chapter 2 and now i'm tempted you know i i yeah you can see why i didn't send you the chapters but even without that i'm talking about it right like you know but uh, but see here is some basic electoral math okay which i think is very very powerful okay so what has happened is that in the combination of first past the post and kind, so 
you have first passed the post. You have many, many, many parties fighting every election and you have turnouts of about 60%. Okay. So what that means is it is often enough to have 20 to 25% of the electorate to actually win an election. Okay. Now, but that has dramatic implications for political incentives. So just imagine the following hypothetical, okay? That you are a politician, you have $100 of, or $1,000 of tax money, you have 100 voters, okay? Now, I can, you can invest this in a public good, right? Let's call it state capacity that benefits everybody, okay? So the return on investment is, say, 20%. So the 1,000 becomes 1,200. So everybody gets 12, okay? So that's kind of model number one. Model number two is you can say that instead of investing 1,000 in a public good, I am going to redistribute this to 25 voters as opposed to 100, and I'm going to give all of them 36. There will be 10 that goes away as administrative cost, other leakage. It might be even worse, okay? But in this model, 25 voters get 36, the other 75 get zero. Okay, now, in a simple median voter theorem, this breaks down because your median voter will prefer the alternative that everybody gets 12, okay? But in a model where you are also mobilizing the vote and only 40% are showing up and you have this fracturing, the concentrated vote support base of those 25 voters is more important to win the election than the diffuse support across the 100, okay? So, and that gives you then very, very strong incentives to kind of focus on your base voters. Right. So then we get into this kind of broad era of vote bank politics, right, which is each party is associated with a particular group. And then the nature of the politics becomes that am I delivering the benefits of the state to that group? OK, now it's not as stark as the example I brought out, but you can then see why the incentives of the political class are not about broad based state capacity. In fact, there's a very nice recent paper by the Dilip Mukherjee and Pranab, I think Pranab is also on this. Um, they've done a lot of work on decentralized governance in Bengal. Mm. And when they actually do this very nice study on kind of the electoral returns to patronage politics versus kind of programmatic politics, right? Where patronage and clientelism is the returns to directing the resources of the state to specific voters. And programmatic politics is when you're doing this in a broader way. And they seem to suggest that electorally that the patronage politics does pay off, okay? And that's partly because the other way to say this is agar aap sabko deliver kar rahe, why am, you know, what's in it for me, right? So people want that differentiated attention. So anyway, it's a... a this is the problem of kind of jumping to other chapters, right? But there are detailed examples that quantify the nature of this challenge that then show that from nation building to election winning, you then enter this era, right? Where the entire nature of politics is about clientelism, vote bank politics, as opposed to how do we build public goods that improve the common welfare, right? So the social welfare in that first option is way higher because 1200 is greater than 900, but that benefit is diffused more, right? So again, classic Mansur also in concentrated cause diffuse benefit, same idea, right? That applies to this kind of political incentives. And so that's kind of, again, partly why we are in this low-level equilibrium. And then there's a bunch of stories. But then the reason for optimism is to say, like I said, that, and you're seeing this in the election data, you're seeing this in the exit polls, you're seeing this in actual results, is that some elements of delivery and performance increasingly do seem to matter, okay? So I think both Arvind Subramaniam and Arvind Parnagariya have done different kinds of analysis on state-level elections. And I think pre-2004, there was not much correlation between state economic growth and the probability of being re-elected. But after that, I think that, that does seem to matter. And there are other measures that, you know, that try to show this. So anyway, so I think the, the point about why we are where we are, in a way, reflects the nature of the political incentives. And which is why, before I get into the technocratic aspects of how do you build a more effective state, I first kind of have to make the case that it is now politically incentive compatible, right, to do this. So then, and one of the things I say, and again, connecting to your episodes, I think this was the one which Shivam Shankar Singh, right, on, you know, that politicians are already using data to win elections, okay, like, I mean, so, but they're not yet using data for governance, right, I mean, so, they know, they have shown that they care about data when it matters to them, okay, so can we make that next logical step of starting to use the data for better governance as well, so, so part of the point here is to say that, listen, there is political demand now for delivering governance, but the challenge is that you don't know how to do it. And so can we create a roadmap on how do you build a more effective state? But that can also deliver results in a visible time frame of, say, five years, because I can't go to a chief minister and saying, Aap ye saal mein result dekhega. Nein, that doesn't work with our electoral cycles. So these ideas have to be ideas that demonstrate kind of, you know, tangible results in a four to five year window. And the good news in topics like education or nutrition or something like that, and I again say this in chapter 10, is that 
the future of these cohorts is yet to be written okay so this is completely in our hands that every cohort that is born this year is a future so the marginal impact of getting these things right in these first 2 to 5 years of life is so enormous that we don't have to sit and moan ke are how do we fix all of this stuff nahi you know there is an enormous amount of good you can do if you kind of focus your attention on the things that matter brilliant i mean and, and uh, so what i'm going to do is that you know this bird is swooping through the wor- uh, worm colony down there in fact it's such a you know i'm so struck by the idea of the worm colony that i'm just going to name it after myself we'll call it verma and uh, <laughs> by the so, way there's a there's a there's a, there's a pj need to tell you in this context which is very kindly, funny kindly kindly <laughs> 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 nahi nahi ha nahi nahi to hamara bahut serious ho jata hai yaar like is baar no. my throat is too bad to sing but this is a very bad pj but it's quite funny so and you will like this right so there's this is old thing about the early bird gets the worm right you know as to why you need to be early wake up early but knowing you you're probably a nocturnal person who likes to wake up late right like you know so but you can justify being kind of sleeping in from the worm's perspective by saying that the early worm gets eaten okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah sabse pehla worm jo nikal gaya wahi to he's the one who gets eaten right so <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. On the other hand, like the sensible worm should do. I I might be waking up late, but I'm not quite lying low. Once I do wake up, uh, but uh, so I'll 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 sort of continue your uh, your sort of beautiful narrative from political incentives. You know, you talk about incentives of politicians uh, so lucidly, and how you know, given their incentives, that one. पाँच साल का टाइम फ्रेम है सो दे कॉन्ट डू डीपर रिफॉर्म्स विच विल टेक टाइम एंड टू मैनिफेस्ट विद कॉजैलिटी मे नॉट बी क्लियर यू नो पैलिएटिव लाइक लोन वेवर्स आर देर फॉर यू नो मच मोर अपीलिंग अपील्स टू द वोट बैंक इमीडिएटली दे वॉन्ट विजिबल बेनिफिट्स रादर दैन सर्ट ऑफ अनसीन बेनिफिट्स एंड यू गिवन एन एक्सेलेंट एग्जाम्पल ऑफ दिस वे यू राइट कोट पुट सिंपली इट इज ईजियर टू बिल्ड न्यू स्कूल एंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूट पिक्चर्स ऑफ ओपनिंग सेरेमनीज दैन इट इज टू एंश्योर अ टीचर्स आर अटेंडिंग regularly or all that children are learning stop quote which just sort of illustrates and this is why state capacity therefore suffers and then you you know move on to your second point about how this creates a systemic overload on the state because for all the short term incentives politicians are committing 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 this committing that and therefore the uh, you know the bureaucracy doesn't have the capacity to deliver on all of this and uh, uh, you use a sort of great phrase for this which comes from Andrew Spritchett and Wilcock premature load bearing so let's you know since you to take a segue to weight lifting for a moment and just kind of explain this to me and uh, you know i found it very uh, revelatory about the indian uh, state and i didn't expect to read about weight lifting in your book but well done <laughs> karthik <laughs> and i'm glad you know so but you can see that the effort that's gone into kind of taking concepts and finding metaphors to simplify and make it accessible right i mean but the weight lifting Wonderful. analogy and i'll also you know give away like one of my favorite paragraphs in the whole book which is in in chapter 3 and so uh, but the mm, But the weightlifting analogy is very simple, right? Which is, see, if you're a weightlifter and bodybuilder and you're trying to build muscle mass, okay, the way you're supposed to do this is by lifting about two to five percent above your current capacity, okay, like and so, and that is what just stretches you. So there will be some tear in muscle tissue because you are going beyond capacity. But then when that muscle rebuilds, it builds stronger, okay. So you kind of increase your strength by kind of progressively increasing the amount of load that you're. taking on right but if you try to lift 100 kilos more than you can you will just collapse and die okay because that bar will fall on your head and it's over right so and again the premature load bearing term is not mine it comes from pritchett um, and dozen wilcock but i think the i'm pretty sure that the weightlifting analogy is mine i didn't see that there okay but the but the but the basic point is that and goes back to your fukuyama point of sco- scope and strength is that by trying to do too much right mean that you further weaken the state so as it is the capacity is low and you further weaken it by putting too much and that's because of and there are multiple reasons i explain that in more detail in chapter 3 on the bureaucracy's burden right mean which is that when you are trying to do more than you have capacity for then a lot of your time goes on rationing access as opposed to delivering okay because the claims are more than my capacity right so i have to then 
gets it and the amount of time I spend adjudicating as to who gets it. And then that creates another problem that once I've adjudicated in a certain way, the guy who didn't get it goes to the courts, right? Need to then say, okay, why am I not getting it? So there are education secretaries who tell me that they spend 30 to 40% of their time in court cases, I right? mean, of various sorts, because they're just kind of in dispute. And so, but here's the point. So what I say in chapter three is that one of the sources of the knots we have tied ourselves in. So one way to think about this is that because our aspirations are ahead of our ability to deliver, okay, and I say government as legislature passes rights and entitlements that are beyond the capacity of government as executive to deliver, and then government as judiciary holds government as executive in contempt of government as legislature, saying that you have <laughs> not fulfilled what you have said you will do in the law. And in doing that, it further weakens the capacity of government as executive because that limited capacity is now going to answer the courts. Okay. Now, this is not to say that the courts don't have a legitimate role in kind of protecting the rights of the poor. Right? Often you will pass rights and not implement them. And where the courts come in is trying to make sure that those rights are in fact implemented. But that approach is again like rearranging the deck chairs on a Titanic, right? Like, I mean, okay, you know, I am coming, therefore you will do this. But at, and you might get individual relief for the particular plaintiff who has brought the case saying that the state has not fulfilled its obligation to me. But because the constraint is not one of intention, but the constraint is one of capacity. So what is happening is even when that process goes through the courts, you might get redress in that individual case, but you're not seeing the fallout of the other parts of the system that are not getting it because your particular case has been taken care of, right? And so this problem of kind of overcommitment kind of is so all pervasive, right? So I'll give you just two days ago, I was talking to a very, very senior scientist, right? I mean, who was talking about that one of the biggest sources of frustration for the scientific community in India is how much kind of, you know, budgets. So you go through a competitive grant process and com coming back and connecting this to connecting this to research, right? So you apply for grants, you go through this thing, the review board actually sanctions you the grant, you got in your grant, but then the money will not come for years, okay? Uh, and so they'll say finance them Pesar release nahi kya okay but how are you in this place where you have a scientific review process that evaluates proposals and saying this has to be funded and then the end there's no money and the answer is again not malice okay the answer is that most state budgets actually have commitments that are well above their revenue so eventually like i mean everybody is just playing musical chairs okay to say like i mean who is going to get this money so which is why it's not enough to get the money allocated you then have to do the additional jugad to kind of make sure that your claim so so the entire nature of our politics, the nature of our governance is essentially a politics of scarcity, a governance of scarcity, and hence kind of who you know, who you're connected, who you can do to kind of unblock the state. And the nature of how we interact with the state is we don't think about it at a level of systems. We think about it at how does my job get done, okay? Like, I mean, and so this is all pervasive. So if you then think about jobs, mm, like one of the biggest crises for medium and small and, and, and micro enterprises today in India. So we do all kinds of things in terms of credit access, this thing. But the biggest crisis is frankly, like how many of them just don't get paid on time, like for services they've delivered. And the biggest defaulter is the government, right? I mean, because the government itself doesn't have the money to meet its own commitments. And then what happens is that the bigger guy is able to kind of lubricate the wheels and get his payment released. The smaller guy can't do that, right? So, and then... Mm, and this again, you know, is something I talk about in that intro chapter, right? Which is the the cost of this overload is not only that you are, you know, further reducing state capacity by kind of making them adjudicate acts, you know, both allocation and adjudication. So every time you spend deciding who to give something to is time you're spending not actually delivering the service. Okay. So that's how it is further cutting into state capacity, okay? But the other way in which it cuts state capacity is much deeper and longer term, which is it creates chronic trust deficits, okay? And that's something, again, I talk about in the intro chapter because when a state is overcommitted, by definition, it cannot serve everybody, right? Which means promises are going to be broken. And over time, the Indian state has broken promises to the rich, to the middle class, to the poor, right? So, and I give you examples there of, say, retrospective taxation or even abolishing the privy purses are all kind of, you know, basically states going and breaking commitments made to the rich. To the middle classes, it's things like the procurement delays, right? I mean that the, because most of these MSMEs are that way. And for the poor, it is you pass rights and entitlements and never actually fund them. Okay. So, but then what that does is think about how does this further weaken state capacity? It weakens, the trust deficit weakens state capacity because 
when it comes to negotiating very very complex reforms like say the farm farm laws and again you had that episode with ajay on that right i mean so the policy per se is fine but where it breaks down is the trust deficit right because see the way we need to reform our agriculture subsidies is not to say we are not going to support farmers because you do want to support farmers but you want to support them through income transfers as opposed to these complex subsidies but the problem with income transfers is that people don't trust that this is going to continue coming because then you are again in the queue aap qatar mein hain like you know aapka aapka number nahi aaya to where a subsidy is sure because i'm never paying it out of my pocket right like i mean so i know i have that benefit here for sure so this is then again how complex the system is right because you've got overcommitment that overcommitment both reduces your capacity to deliver today and hurts your capacity to kind of create these pareto improving win win reforms because of the erosion of trust right I mean over time and i think kaushik basu has this lovely quote from republic of beliefs right and mean which is that in the end most of the power of a state comes not actually from the course of power of the state but really comes from a set of self fulfilling expectations about what will happen if you deviate from an equilibrium path okay so anyway so this is again like a 10000 foot view but hopefully this kind of highlights some of how deep these challenges are right it's not just a question of saying chalo state capacity kar do it is these are deep deep systemic issues Yeah so deviate from the equilibrium path is also a great title for a metal song and i can imagine you know the refrain can be deviate 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 and in the background full of hate full of hate also coming up you know <laughs> it uh, sounds sort of <laughs> terrific a couple of a couple of digressive questions and what is this that you know in terms of work that people do i often say that for the form will determine the content and the content shapes a character or an essay on this standard example is five hour podcast means i can't be shallow i have to listen a lot uh, the act of listening is an act of humility you take the ego out of it you learn a lot more and therefore you become a different kind of person so because of the form of what i am doing i had to act in a particular way change my character similarly if you just do a 5 minute show you don't even have to read the book you just ask some stock questions you keep interrupting all of that and uh, across d- various domains this can really apply and i'm now thinking of how the form of this state with just by you know changing shaping incentives can change uh, what the people in it are like i know plenty of politicians and bureaucrats and so on and i completely agree with you pretty much all of the people i know in both these fields are wonderful people uh, at least obviously my uh, the politicians i know are kind of self selected so that's it's bound to be the case but they are great people the people are not the problem but what really happens is that all the way down the line the form of the state determines the kind of actions that get taken and then that determines the kind of person that you are like a f- friend of mine Suresh Rai um, once spoke about how politics corrodes character right which i totally believe in because of incentives but here i'm thinking wait a minute let's go one step further back it's a state that corrodes politics and then that corrodes character so you have this all powerful crazy state you know and eventually uh, the best way to flourish within the state if you're a part of it is to become a rent seeker it's just uh, logical it doesn't mean that you know that you, you are a bad person per se you're responding to incentives if you're a businessman in the 1980s you know you got to be a crony capitalist to get ahead you know people condemn dhirubhai ambani and all of that but give me a break the system was what it was he had to do what he had to do then right and uh, and i won't mention possible current cronyism or whatever but the point is there is a system we make a mistake in often blaming people and as you pointed out that's pointless there is a system and the form kind of shapes everything downstream from the politics to the bureaucracy to the notion of public service to the notion of what a citizen is or should be you know and leads to the apathy and the hostility that we see among the people towards the state which you always also elaborated upon uh, so what would sort of be um, uh, your take on this that a question of a dysfunctional state goes way beyond just the functioning of the state and the services it provides it changes society no and i think see the the goal of this book i mean in some ways is it is actually very very sympathetic towards all of the individuals involved while kind of taking a step back to illustrate to everybody right the complexities of the system and why we are the way we are right now i think the good news is this the good news is that 
there are so many public spirited people right i encounter at every stage in the government outside the number of youngsters like i mean who kind of want to contribute and you know i think there is just there's an incredible amount of energy right uh, uh, that wants to do good okay uh, and you know one of the reasons i have this chapter 18 about state citizen and civil society right I mean is to then kind of think about what does the understanding that has been laid out in the book imply for different sets of actors in society right I mean who want to kind of play their own positive role in kind of moving us in this direction that we need to as a country now of course this is not to say that like you know <clears throat> that doing this will solve all of our problems i mean the nature of politics in every society is it is about contestation over public resources it's about contestation over policy and that will never change okay i think the key point in the indian context is that because so much of our public discourse is zero sum okay so it is you know whether it's our talking shows on tv it's like all big fight you know that that culture is essentially fighting and even at a more sophisticated level of discourse when we're talking about budgets okay so budget discussion will happen and most of the discussion will be around is sector ko kyun nahi allocate kiya right i mean but the all i'm hoping to do here is to kind of say that so much of this reflects the basic problem and it, it's Econ 101, right? We start as economics 101 to saying that our desires are greater than our resources, and there are trade-offs. Okay, so that same logic applies at the level of a country, right? I Means so, but my point is not that we will ever move away from this world that the desires are exceeding the resources, but at in, given where we are as a country, that we will do. So a simple way of saying this is that our discourse focuses in the top line of budget allocations, whereas if we focus in the bottom line of what actually reaches people, you will find that there are low-hanging fruit. And things that can be done that are just win 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 for everyone okay like i mean and so then the and going back to kind of our ajay and vijay right i mean it's it's a great book and that's why i love that they call it the art and the science of policy right because i mean in some ways the science of policy is kind of illustrating what the principles and trade offs are the art is how do you craft politically viable win win kind of you know arrangements that everybody can be better off with and i think i mentioned that even in the first episode right so when you talked about politics corrodes character so there is an element of politics that i have zero interest in right i mean which is the pursuit of power and that's the part that is corrosive but there's an element of politics which i think anybody working in policy it's almost like a moral obligation that you think about which is the part of politics which i actually enjoy is thinking about how do you craft a win win arrangement right how do you expand the size of the pie right i mean and that also requires a lot of creative thinking but it requires kind of being you know politically aware right even if not politically aligned right so yeah so i want to sort of recap that uh, sort of narrative up to now because i find it so lucidly explanatory and then uh, ask a question about the trust deficit as it were and you point out how incentives changed after independence where your initial incentive is nation building the congress is dominating it you know and everyone's moving in one direction and then gradually the big tent kind of collapses opposition comes up political incentives get in the way and uh, those incentives lead politicians to act for reasons other than just necessarily the public good because they do have to win elections that's their um, uh, imperative they you know so etc etc that leads to a systemic overload they promise too much they can't all deliver that further weakens the state weightlifters are dropping weights on their head all over the place this is a brilliant metaphor and this leads to a trust deficit because then inevitably the state is overpromising and underdelivering and uh, eventually they can deliver on nothing and the people get apathetic and they learn to live without the state as it were and they do their own jugars to get by uh, now my question here is this that when you you know raised uh, the the example of the farm laws what i kind of thought to myself is that the problem here isn't just that there is a deficit of trust in the state the state might well have taken a, a different kind of procedure go, you know set up committees gone out and spoken to all stakeholders spoken to farmers groups done all of that a lot of which ajay in his episode um, with me on the farm laws also talks about but the insurmountable problem here is politics and the insurmountable problem is that our politics has become so incredibly polarized that you will always demonize the other side every single 
single thing they do is wrong and you cannot talk to each other and this hasn't been the case throughout our 75 years it uh, you know in past governments you had people speaking to each other in 2014 when the jetly ministry took over from the chidambaram ministry there was a fair amount of continuity for a while back in the day when the vajpayee government was there they would speak to the opposition regularly there was that mutual respect especially when it came to matters of policy whatever public rhetoric may have been outside that is simply not the case today that the discourse is so incredibly polarized that you cannot be talking to the enemy you can only be shouting at them and dragging them through the streets if you are in power you know on an aside i mean there was this uh, visual um, there was this video recently of uh, you know cops dragging priyanka gandhi dragging her, her, her through the street into a police van and all that and it, it, it's just to, you know and that to me is a symbol of how the opposition is being treated and it is of course also tactically stupid on the part of the bjp because the lady is a nobody why make her a somebody in this manner but uh, it's but th- that's really a symbol of the way you're looking at the opposition that when we are in power we will uh, mess you over but and uh, you know for those in the opposition everything modi does must be opposed even if it's good you know a lot of the what the farm laws were setting out to do was you was in the congress manifesto for god's sake right so but that doesn't matter anymore so on the one hand there is a polarized politics where you cannot possibly talk to the enemy anymore quote unquote enemy anymore and two there seems to be this realization and i hope it's overconfidence that narratives matter more than governance that people out of rational ignorance in the term you know public uh, choice people would recognize out of rational ignorance don't really know any uh, know that much about policy and long term structural problems and they don't really care about those things and they've given up hope of expecting anything from the government anyway so everything therefore is about narratives so that meeting point which you talk about you know where you say that you know in a case like the farm laws had they gone about it the correct way uh, the trust deficit could have been overcome i i I'm, i'm not confident about it for that kind for that sort of reason and just as an analog you mentioned the josie joseph episode you know uh, and you mentioned earlier that the worry some people have that if you have a more powerful state it will be used against its enemies and i am actually sometimes really thankful that the indian state is so weak and incompetent because it, it, at this moment in time the way our politics has become the indian state is definitely it can be used for malicious purposes as josie shows in that excellent episode and is really fine book and that also kind of you know bolsters uh, the, this doubt that i sort of have so so what are your thoughts yeah so i think you know there's a lot in there and <clears throat> let me let me save my rema- uh, you know reactions to the broader point about the space for dialogue right I mean across the political spectrum across you know so for example in you know, one thing i'll say is there is a reason why some of the more contentious decisions like financial allocations are given to non partisan technical commissions like a finance commission now of course in the end there is still a political process that has to accept or kind of you know reject parts of the of the recommendations but there is at least you know in the institutional design of india there was a recognition that there are some kind of truly contentious issues like you know that are best done away from the daily limelight right i mean where you can have these discussions and that's true of international relations it's true everywhere and so we can talk a little bit about that i think this question about where are we right i mean with regard to you know with uh, this Canamal is is a stronger state, a bad idea in the hands of malevolent actors. Okay, I mean, I think is really the core kind of existential question. Okay, and I think we have to have faith in the longer arc of Indian democracy. I am saying that this is, you know, that we have put in deep enough roots of what kind of democratic. Mm, and like ram goha says at the end of his book right it's 50 50 everything in india is 50 50 right like you know okay there are areas where we have done very well and there are areas where there is still room to go but i think the 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 germany greece you know example so is is a useful one right which is yes at the peak of kind of a malevolent regime there was more damage done like you know by a capable german state than by a less capable spanish or italian state right but if you integrate over kind of a 100 year span right i mean would you then rather have a, be a citizen in 
in Germany, right? I mean, or so effectively, what happened there was that the politic. So there was a strong state. There was a political process of reflection of the things that had gone wrong that then led to really important course corrections and guardrails around, like you know, what the state could do. And so this is where I think again, trying to be slightly optimistic. See, my book by focusing on state level actions, my hope is to also strengthen in some ways Indian democracy itself because you see you can't beat something with nothing okay you can't just keep complaining without showing a better alternative okay so the problem today is that any kind of complaints about the bjp from the opposition just rings hollow because they are just as dictatorial in their own states okay like you know so and that doesn't give you much of a moral locus standi to have that conversation okay so but part of the point here is if you're an opposition party that is genuinely trying to raise some issues about saying that you know the intelligence agencies or the police are being weaponized and this is bad okay so it's not enough to just say that you say listen here is kind of a model bill like i mean of a police reform bill that we are bringing in our state okay like i mean and we are walking the talk similarly data right so i think Pramit had this very nice thing at the end where he talked about, you know, his model kind of data bill. Okay, so today we might say that, listen, how come we don't have poverty measures? We don't have this data, but there's nothing. But the truth is, every political leader is afraid of data and accountability, right? I mean, it's not just, you know, so that's across the system, right? So I think the point about, and I say this at the end of the of the section on state level action, right, is that. However difficult our problems are, right? You need to find a constructive pathway forward, right? I mean, that just doesn't wallow in despair. And one of the ways, and again, in the federalism chapter. You know, we'll I, and I end with an Ashwin Mahesh quote, right? I mean, which is we need to increase the number of problem solvers. So, and that's true at the level of local government, but it's also true at the level of states, right? I mean, so and the reason the book is targeted at chief ministers and state level actions, and why I think we'll do an entire episode on on federalism. Hopefully, after two hours, we'll kind of start that at some point. Uh, is that um, is that by kind of increasing the number of actors who can function in a positive way, you just need one or two people to do it, right? I mean, and then positive. Positive examples, then you know, will hopefully will hopefully spread. So yeah, so you need to kind of be cautiously optimistic and think about what are the instead of despairing, you say what are. What are the entry points to move us closer towards the kind of, you know, modern citizen-centered democratic Indian republic that we would like to be? And one of the core contentions in the book, and which is why again in federalism we'll talk about this, is that Indian states are bigger than most countries, right? I mean, and so there is no reason why they cannot take the lead in terms of doing some of these things. And it's not like I have rosy tinted glasses to say that all of these things will happen every place, but the logic of working at the state level is even if the book has a menu of 50 ideas right uh, and i think i said this in the earlier podcast as well is that trying to make these changes at an all india level is really really hard both because of kind of the number of larger number of veto players as well as the sheer complexity but if you can kind of show that some ideas work right I mean, so different states will have different political priorities right so people will take up things here and there and i'll give you like you know something i say in the in the in the politics chapter right so we tend to think about all politicians again as venal and corrupt and whatever and there's a very senior is officer who actually gave me this nice perspective he said har neta you know neta the cares about vote note and dil okay like you know so yes they care about votes they care about raising money but each of them also has a heart they're in public service to try to do something good okay and so and because different politicians will have their dil in some places okay so imagine there is somebody who's seen like child mortality or maternal mortality in his or her household therefore cares about doing something and there have been politicians who personally care about things imagine there is somebody who got beaten up in a lock up as a student activist like i mean and therefore cares more about police reforms right so you you kind of have to find these windows so the the opportunity will be the luck will be when there is somebody in a particular place who cares about a certain issue the preparation is that when there is a well thought out set of reform roadmaps that that person can do and by working at the state level you're just kind of dramatically increasing the number of bites we have at the apple of kind of making the reforms needed to move the country in a positive direction No no I mean I I totally agree with all of that even though it may not seem like it from the question that came before you know I had this discussion with Akar Patel on pessimism versus optimism and he was an optimist of course he is an optimist despite everything that goes on with him and I'm a bit of a pessimist but the way I see it is that even if I'm a pessimist and even if I think the world is going to hell my dharma is to behave as if I'm an optimist so you know that's kind of uh, what I do I think somebody so one, once said this right pessimism of the intellect optimism of the spirit right like you know I mean or that's uh, a beautiful phrase that, that 
that describes me well thank you thank you that's uh, that's a worm's eye view of amit verma i guess uh, which i hadn't thought of before the one a point where i will kind of push back before kind of moving on is uh, when you you know made the comparison between germany and greece who would i rather be now the thing is would i rather be germany in the 20th century through the 20th century or greece through the 20th century and i love prosperity and germany is much more prosperous but i would rather be greece and the reason for that is that where you stand depends on how you say it if i'm a jew in 1940 germany that's not where i want to be you cannot ignore that you cannot get to the later prosperity by you know first suffering through the holocaust and all that similarly you know if you're a muslim in india today do you want a stronger state or a weaker state do you just want the state to kind of leave you alone and we'll get by as we are but that's a tangential question i mean i totally no, I, I, I agree I, I, with I agree. your larger I, point exactly and no i mean and listen you know this is not in any way to trivialize like you know and this is not to say that you know german prosperity trumped everything i think the larger point i was making was that there was also this political moment of reflection about like you know and learning see you can't undo the past what you can do is kind of you know take the right lessons and build the institutional kind of structure so i think you know the other nice thing about doing this on the 75th uh, you know day of independence literally is as we take stock about both the successes and the failures i do think it's a time for re imagining right i mean you know what the constituent assembly did there was this kind of it was a, it was a work of magic right i mean in terms of what that represented the sheer ambition of what was there and i think uh, and, and again you know i think ram goha says this very nicely right where he says that you know it takes visionaries to craft uh, to build a country and then you know over time you the roots have gone deep enough that mediocrities can run it okay like you know so yeah. uh, right like you know but that's true just as much of the us and he says like you know going from jefferson to george w bush like you know would feel pretty similar right so it's not just about you know it's there in all societies but i do think as we take stock about where we are as a country there is kind of a genuine need for a reimagination of kind of possibilities and you know public conversations about what we want to be as a country but not just in this kind of knee jerk criticizing everything that the government is doing or supporting everything that they're doing right i mean it is kind of just being very very grounded and empirical and just saying this is where we've done well this is where we're not doing well and so how do we kind of get to the next level of what we need to do as a country and like i think i think dr kelkar said this nicely right they see their book as kind of essentially a contribution into this yagna of building a better india right i mean and so you know we all make a little contributions and then there is a larger ecosystem that has to act yeah so i love the way you know we are using words like yagna and dharma in our conversation this is like turning out to have very indic feel to it now uh, you know uh, i want to talk about federalism uh, which we can talk about for 7 or 8 hours but i don't know how much time you have but before we get there and we'll do that after the break but before we uh, get to the break i uh, you know want to ask a final question about sort of state capacity but first i'll briefly sum up the rest of your narrative that number 1 we've seen how political incentives uh, in incentive Incentives? Did I say incentives uh, deteriorate? We see the systemic overload. We see uh, you know weightlifters dying all over the place and in different government departments. We see trust deficits happening, so nobody trusts politician anymore. You've sp- also spoken about the ine- ineffective bureaucracy, and I love the way you your chapter titles are alliterative: bureaucrats' burden, politicians' predicament. But you talk about the structural weaknesses within our bureaucracy, all the paperwork, all of that. What does that lead? Uh, what does this breakdown of the state leads to uh, it leads to what you call an elite exit because elites are you know uh, doing their private jugar and uh, uh, you know they have in your words quote mostly seceded from being recipients of public services stop quote and because they're not receiving public services they don't give a damn if they are crap and they're not raising their voice and so on and so forth you give examples of services are better when elites are recipients and all of that you talk about the institu- institutional stasis yeah as a as a word you प्रोफेसरबडी gone so uh, uh the, the the final question before the break that i want to 
sort of end um, uh, end with before we talk about federalism uh, and in a, that's uh, like a natural segue because that is one of the solutions is uh, so how do we reform the indian state like what gives you hope that it can be reformed given that everyone's uh, interests will be to protect their own interests there'll be the status quo bias there'll be this big beast that you're kind of fighting against so what gives you hope that it can be reformed and then what are the broad areas in which you would say okay this is how we must reform it Yeah and you know I think I'll give you a very short answer and then on the how maybe we can come to the very end right I mean because the reason is uh the other thing so let me give you a quick reason why I'm optimistic okay so and that is related to the work we've been doing and this is also something I first publicly alluded to in our education podcast right I mean which is I've been setting up and building this new non-profit called Sejus right which is the Center for Effective Governance of Indian States uh this is something you know we started in 2019 and in fact I had written a concept note for this as early as 2018 early 2018 and I had talked to multiple state you know and the idea at that time I had even called it an institute for public performance management right I mean because that we had a lot of discussion there's a lot of policy think tanks that says ye karna hai but there was really nobody working at the space of building a more effective state right I mean and so that was kind of my thinking behind you know a concept note for that kind of center or institute and then you know my mm, well wishers in government i mean i'd presented to multiple chief secretaries finance secretaries and they all said listen this is great but why don't you first write a book write a book that lays out an intellectual road map for what we kind of need to do and then we can think about finding ways you know there are existing centers of good governance in telangana you know different states have you know their own kind of structures maybe we could do something around those institutes right so and that's how the idea of the book was born but it was always in my mind is that i didn't just want to be an armchair ivory tower academic and saying yes sab karna chahiye right i mean that you know you really have to kind of put your money where your mouth is and walk the talk in terms of trying to make these things happen and so um, in around late 2018 i think uh, you know i've known ashish dhawan for a long time and you should have him on the show at some point he's but you know he's kind of just this wonderful kind of philanthropist who's kind of shifted from being a venture capitalist in the world of companies to being kind of an early stage venture capitalist in the space of institutions right i mean that india needs and so you know i discussed this he said listen this is a great idea i'll fund it let's just get started right i mean so you know we started very very slow the idea was because we ourselves i had some clarity on what we want to get done but very little kind of understanding of how to get it done right i mean and so but the long story short like i said i think in 20 in the education episode I didn't even want to talk much about it because I was like, listen, I mean, abhi to idea hai. We haven't done anything, so I mean, at this stage, it's still very nascent, okay. But we are already in four states, right? I mean, and expanding rapidly. And I think why I feel optimistic is that the level of demand I'm seeing, right? I mean, for the core offering of CJS, right, which is an element of conceptual clarity on what are the reforms that we need, plus kind of implementation support to make those things happen, and that is the key, right? I mean, so why am I founding CJS? Is the over the years i have helped with plan documents i have lectured in the is academy talked to many senior is officers i've even been on a chief minister's advisory council the problem is that all of the advice and inputs doesn't translate into much because the constraint is state capacity right like i mean to ab gyan to sab de sakte hain right karna is what is the hard part so the logic then of sieges is to say that you the government and so and this is why i think the case the simple value proposition of sieges is very simple right i mean that whether it's the politicians or whether it's the bureaucrats you're focused on driving the car okay like i mean we are your kind of system maintenance and strengthening people and just like the the race car driver gets the glory right but every formula 1 driver depends on a really effective engineering team mechanical team like i mean that's designing maintaining and running the car okay so as he just like you know we are basically kind of working with state governments to start helping improve again the core conceptual focus is these three things is outcomes personnel and budgets right that mm, and the and we'll talk about this in federalism as well that the effective organizations are those that provide autonomy to frontline staff on process on how to deliver but accountability on outcomes okay whereas in the government we do exactly the opposite which is we micromanage on process with zero accountability for outcomes right so but to do this rearchitecture the foundation is again better data right so we are starting with very and i'll give you more examples at the end right very very unglamorous but 
plumbing work of improving kind of frontline state uh, functioning and i can talk about this now the good news is that we have been very 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 understated because we really want the governments to say is this of any value or not right i mean so the only reason i'm even talking about it is we do need to recruit you know as we grow okay so uh, and that's something that you know may be of interest to particularly your younger listeners but the good news why am i optimistic is just the amount of demand i'm seeing right i mean and of course because we're a non-profit and we don't take a paisa from the government right i mean so there's an additional level of trust i mean that comes from that and also the years of my you know spending time in the is academy kind of showing a long term commitment to these issues so it's i'm not like some fly by consultant who's now you know trying to make money of the next you know of the next fad right i mean there is yeah there is this is a 25 year vision and agenda of kind of you know the book is hopefully trying to say here the things we need to get done and cgs is kind of a little attempt to help accelerate make that happen so the reason i'm optimistic is the demand we are seeing so just in the past you know and we've been very lucky that uh, a wonderful ias officer actually quit and joined as president of cgs so that gives us and you know both credibility within the government that we are not just ivory tower academics but people who really know how the government works and because of kind of word of mouth suddenly we're getting demand from four extra states that frankly this time the constraint is more kind of people and capacity and not overextending but i really feel optimistic and see i think again the individuals there are pe- you know so there are people in senior people in government who when i talked about this vision and i'll say you know sir am i being delusional okay in thinking that any of these things will happen and they'll say no no this is actually one of the most inspiring things we've heard in a very long time because hum sabko malum hai ki ye karna hai but none of us is able to do it because you know we are see tomorrow if you're talking about personal reforms okay and education secretary will say ha ye karna hai but the reforms that are needed are beyond the remit of just an education secretary right because if doing personal reforms requires you know coordination with finance coordination with planning coordination with kind of with law with the general administration department and and also the chief minister's office because these are politically mm, sensitive issues so even if you have an individual officer who really cares about this there isn't kind of either the time or the locus and i because this guy is going to get transferred in 18 months or 2 years so it's completely irrational to attempt a system reform kind of thing whereas these things are going to take 5 years 10 years right I means so so the hope is that there is enough kind of buy in but the hope is that we're also investing in the kind of institution that can help make this transition happen but yeah you know like we may fail but you have to be optimistic right No, and that is indeed so uh, inspiring. Even for me, uh, you know, I I once wrote this piece on Vishwanath Anand where I was comparing the really shoddy pedagogy he got as a youngster, where you know the pedagogy in India or you know the chess ecosystem was nowhere near what the Soviets had. Right? They were taught fundas in like the second standard, which Anand would have it to have to figure out as an adult while actually playing. And the metaphor I used was that for him winning the world championship was that it was like he took a Maruti 800 car to a Formula One race and actually won with it. and now i'm thinking of you and what you're trying to do is while a maruti 800 car is somehow spluttering ahead you are trying to convert it by changing little bits of it into an f1 car and the metaphor is inexact because you can't actually do that to a maruti 800 but somehow i have at this moment in time perhaps i'm getting carried away an irrational faith that this could actually work in the long run see in the long run i'm an optimist but in the long run we are all dead you know so uh, before we go in for a quick commercial break and emerge to talk about federalism since you you know quite question at save for the end but i might as well ask it now since you mentioned that you're looking for bright young people who want to work with you and so on and so forth where should they write to you is there a public website yeah, or email exactly. id of so yeah so yeah we can share you know i think this is the the cgs website always has like a job section that you know is constantly updated it'll probably grow yeah so that's that's the place i think so people should not write to me about cgs because i don't get involved operationally at all right i mean so there's a full time team that does it you know i am kind of a co-founder and scientific director so my role is to kind of set an intellectual road map and kind of get the buy in at the government side but then vijay mm, who's a pretty legendary officer from from tamil nadu in terms of integrity is you know is the president and he runs the show right I means so yeah both vijay's name today are legendary therefore I, i'll link that from the show notes by the way and uh, let's take a quick commercial break and on the other side we will talk about uh, federalism and going more and more local Hi, my name is Nishant Jain and besides creating episode art for Amit, I also make the Sneaky Art podcast, a show where I have deep insightful conversations with other artists who just like me draw and paint their world from observation. 
This show is for you if you are trying to be an artist. It is also for you if you just want to make more room for art in your life. This show is for you if you simply want to become a more mindful observer of your fast-changing world. Conversations include a cross-country cyclist making a painting every day of an incredible 4,000-mile journey, an artist in Malaysia who found inspiration in a reality show about tattoo artists in LA, and a sketcher in Mumbai who chronicled the lives of the city's artisans through the first wave of COVID. It is a more beautiful world once you begin to see the sneaky art of everyday life. Add sneaky art to your podcast feed. Use the link in the episode description. Welcome back to the scene in the unseen. I'm here again with Karthik Mulidharan who has taken a break, who has eaten some food his first meal of the day and who is still optimistic and who was just telling me before we started recording that the treadmill in his office is a metaphor for his life. Kindly explain. No, I think you know we were just talking about exercise and how I do walk a lot and one of the reasons I've heard so many of your podcasts is I walk a lot but yeah yeah so the treadmill is a metaphor for my life because I walk a lot but stay in the same place with regard to weight loss and that's because <laughs> <laughs> I also enjoy my food. <laughs> Yeah, as you two would say, running to stand still, exactly. uh, which is kind of, you know, in different ways, maybe, you know, parts of the Indian state are a little bit like that. Let's let's sort of talk about federalism now. now in, in a sense, the Indian state was designed uh, to be a federal state, a union of states, um, as Rahul Gandhi put it in parliament recently and as our constitution begins. So we were designed to be federal, yet we were designed to be incredibly centralized at the same time. So I'd like you to sort of disentangle uh, this by first speaking about uh, the aspect in which we were designed to be federal like how how are we federal what does federalism mean and how you know you talk about the five tiers of the indian state and all of that so again as you know uh, you so helpfully uh, defined the term state capacity uh, define federalism you know w- w- what does it mean and how does that meaning apply to us right now yeah so and i think you know even before we get into that as you know consistent with my you know, conceptual, you know, I like to take a step back to see, you know, what is the big picture of the concept? So let's start with a very, very basic question, okay? So imagine a thought experiment that you are to be reborn and you can be a random person born in any country in any in any part of the world. You do not get to pick where in the country's income distribution you will be. So this is kind of a veil of ignorance exercise. The only parameter you're allowed to pick is would you rather be born in a big country defined as population, say, over 50 over over 50 million, a medium country, say population, you know, 20 to 50 million or a small country in a population under 20 million. Okay. So how do you think about what would be this optimal size of a country? Okay. Where you would like to be born? Oh, you're asking me. Uh, so, no, uh, I mean, the, the answer is, uh, it depends. And the reason that is the case is like, one, as I have often expressed, I think, uh, you know, population is a great thing. People talk about, you know, population as being one reason India is so poor and blah, blah, blah. No, I think that's uh, the reason we are poor is a failure of governance. I think more people mean larger economic networks, networks of scale, people are brains, not stomachs. And so, the, but by the, the way, like, you know, in the spirit hmm. of our healthy disagreement in the past, like, you know, let me push back on that a little bit, right? Which is, I, I fundamentally agree with the argument that people are brains and not stomachs but for the brains to develop the stomachs have to be fed okay like yeah, yeah, I, haven't <laughs> I haven't finished my answer i haven't finished my answer so yeah. just to just to go through uh, baby, that's why i said it depends right so your the initial answer from the notion that more people are good people are brains not stomachs you know it's easy to say that india bangladesh so overpopulated but equally you, you look at uh, bahrain and monaco and uh, you look at just the density of people i mean the whole movement uh, of uh, human beings through human history is from a place of less population density to a place of more population density that is towards cities that's what urbanization is all about because again economic networks networks of scale however the flip side of that is that you also need uh, uh, good governance to actually, uh, you, you know, sort of enable um, all these forces to express themselves. And so, if you are stuck in a large company with bad governance, then it's a problem. So that's the imponderable. And that is why my answer has to depends. be, it so, depends because the veil of ignorance, there's too much ignorance. You know, <laughs> so if you I mean, tell me what the state is like, I'll give you my answer. Correct. No, see, but in a, in a way, I was even abstracting from the nature of the state. And I guess, you know, I shouldn't put you on the spot like that. And, you know, just take a step back and just think about independent of the nature 
nature of the state and the government, right? Let's just think about the mechanics of size, okay? And, you know, what are the... So, the way to conceptually think about this question about the optimal size of nations is to say, what are the benefits of size, okay? And what are the costs of size, right? So, and, and as with everything, right, there are both costs and benefits, right? Now, the thing is there are actually many, many, many benefits of size, okay? So, historically, the biggest benefit of size, being in a big country, is economies of scale in defense, okay? Because the most important existential threat was just being run over and invaded. And so being large, just the geometry of defense is that if your population is uniformly distributed, then the number of people increases with the square of the radius, but the circumference to be defended is increasing linearly with the radius, right? So population per unit of border to be defended is actually higher the bigger you are, okay? So and that is why historically, like, you know, countries tried to expand partly to protect the core, right? Because you would have a periphery and then there would be the core that would be a productive core. So that was one of the biggest historical advantages of size. Okay. Now, there is a related advantage of size, which is that along with the scale of investing in military comes other spillovers to civilian life. Okay. So you, you build roads partly to mobilize troops from one part to the other. And that also has economic spillovers. And that logic applies even today, right? So the best kind of you know, so the internet came from DARPA's investments in defense communications, right? Boeing came from investments in military aviation, okay? So a lot of the technological advances of society have also happened in the context of military innovation. And that is also benefited by scale. It's fundamentally a scale game, right? That because... The more um, people you have, the more tax revenue you have, and that allows you to cover the fixed costs of these kind of big expenses. Now, there's a third advantage of size, right, which is the size of your domestic market. Okay, so in in worlds where you have trade barriers across countries, the size of the market also helps in terms of. Mm, enabling high fixed cost industries, okay? So, and just the larger markets are good in, in, in many ways. There's a fourth advantage, which is better spatial insurance, okay? So something goes wrong in one part of the country, you have an earthquake, you have a flood, you have something, and now you have two mechanisms of kind of providing insurance against these natural disasters, right? The first is you have tax revenue from other parts of the country that can be used to kind of compensate and rebuild the places that are hurt. And the even more important channel is migration, okay, that people can just move out of the afflicted area and kind of make their lives in other parts of the country, right? So, and then there's a fifth point, which is fifth advantage of size, which is it becomes easier to kind of manage spillovers across jurisdictions, okay? So, I think, say, rivers are a great example that if rivers flow through multiple countries, then figuring out the public goods aspects of that is harder. Now, it's not easy even within a country as we see in the interstate river disputes, but in principle, you kind of have structures that allow you to make negotiate these areas of policy where there are spillovers, okay? So there's many, many, many advantages of being big, okay? So, but then the question is, why are we not like infinitely sized? And that's because there are also enormous costs of being big, okay? So the two big costs of being big, see, the biggest cost of size is that you have to accommodate greater diversity in people's preferences, right? So in the and as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, if you have, again, on a scale of zero to 100, right? If, if you increase your people, then your policy has to be somewhere in the middle, right? I mean, so the bigger you are, the more you have people whose policy preferences are really far away, right? I mean, from the policies that are being chosen. And at some point, like, you know, people want to secede because they would rather have kind of the autonomy to craft their own policies as they see makes sense for them, as opposed to being tied to this big core, okay? So the first big problem is, how do you accommodate um, diversity in policy preferences with like a single set of policies? And the second challenge of size is just how much more unwieldy governance becomes because of the layers between the people and the, and, and the rulers, right? And so if, if you have to go through six levels versus two levels, the government is just much less responsive, right? I mean, when you become too big, okay? So, so those are the two fundamental costs of size, right? And so the, over, over time in history, the optimal size of nations, so, you know, countries have expanded, right? I mean, at times of strong emperors, strong thing, and then they've receded as you overextend and as kind of typically populations in the fringe of the country, like, I mean, would rather be on their own because you've typically had a core. And if you see, say, Russia, Ukraine today, it's exactly like, I mean, a manifestation of that, right? I mean, so, you know, historically, Tsarist Russia would expand, like, I mean, and kind of bring more areas under kind of core Russian control. There was a certain element of coercion, a certain element of, you know, migration, but you know, there is also costs which the peripheral republics were bearing by kind of, you know, having to put up with Russian policies. And when 91 happens, people, you know, prefer to break up. Okay, so then that's kind of this basic tension that's playing out. So the question then is that, so 
the the beauty of federalism right i mean is that the when you want to then think about what is the optimal size of a country right federalism when done well is a very very powerful kind of solution because what it does is if you abstract from the politics and just focus on the efficiency aspects of government for a moment right that federalism done right is basically saying let's put the functions of government that benefit from economies of scale at the level of a national government that has a much larger scale and let's put the functions that need to better to accommodate diversity of preferences at say a state level and let's put functions that require responsiveness right i mean an immediate acting on information at the local level right i mean and so so the the core idea of federalism is that let's get the benefit of best of both worlds right get the benefit of size by kind of having size where it really matters right so size matters for defense size matters for international relations size matters you know for all kinds of actions that require economies of scale but let's kind of move the governance much lower in areas where size is a d- 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 disadvantage okay so that is kind of the conceptual core of federalism right mm. now i think so in the indian case the federalism i mean so you know and the indian case is a particularly good example right of how these federal principles have i think in my view and other experts really contributed to the preservation of the union right because you know one of the big concerns at the time of independence was you know whether it was the british or the americans everybody was like listen you know <clears throat> the punjabi in east punjab has more in common with the punjabi in west punjab than with the tamilian and they couldn't stay together right like campaign so having seen partition you know the sense was that this is not a country that is going to be together it's just too unwieldy and too diverse okay like you know so but i think and and again there was an old debate at the time where you know gandhi was always in favor of more linguistic states but nehru and ambedkar were concerned about the balkanization and the risk of further linguistic regional balkanization but i think the 56 reorganization of states by language was a really important decision that has helped preserve the indian union and that's because it has kind of allowed the area where people have kind of diversity mm, and preferences particularly culture language right I mean that it's allowed that to be preserved at the state level right like I mean while delegating to the union government right the functions where there are true economies of scale okay so i think the so federalism when done well can really help by getting you the best of all of these worlds right now the problem of course is it also comes with a whole bunch of additional challenges right so it comes mm, with basic challenges of who's in charge okay like you know who 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 has the final say on a particular set of decisions okay it has additional complications in terms of coordination and kind of passing the buck and getting credit so everybody at different levels wants credit when things go right they want to pass the buck when things go wrong and there is also this generic kind of push towards over centralization right i mean which is a constant risk in federal systems but i think you know just taking a step back about how to think about federalism i think the key insight in what i'm telling you is that we often think about kind of governments as hierarchies right i mean we say oh okay, there's a the central government is the highest and then there's the state government and then there's the local government but thinking about governments as hierarchies is fundamentally i think incorrect right rather you should be thinking about these governments in terms of functions and not hierarchies there are some functions that naturally are best done at the central government level some best done at the state and some best done at the local and frankly from the perspective of the citizen you know the decisions and effectiveness of the local government matter much much more right i mean are my lights are my streets is the drains are the drains being cleaned is the garbage being collected are the street lights working are the teachers showing up and these are all kind of local government functions because they depend on acting on local information and kind of reducing the time lag between kind of an issue being identified and it being solved right so and you know and we can talk a little bit more about this about now see the constitution tries to kind of provide some clarity on what function should sit at what level by segregating things at the sectoral level okay saying that some sectors are in the state list some are in the central list or some are in the concurrent list but i think and we can talk more about you know the covid example and other things that in some ways we are better off by thinking in terms of function as opposed to sector right so functions that require economies of scale are best done at the national level functions that require coordination and that need to kind of accommodate migration and people moving across are better done at the national level functions that need to respond to local variation are better done like you know at a lower level so anyway so that's i think like you know a high level conceptual you know uh, taxonomy of federalism so to speak and then you know we can talk more about you know tensions as well as the indian experience 
Yeah, no, that's fascinating. And what I also sort of liked about your chapter was a historical perspective you bring to this. Like when you talk about Europe and China in the 15th century and, you know, looking b- 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 yeah, at the start of the 15th century, you'd imagine, I- imagine that China will do much better and, you know, they will, all the te- technological progress will happen there and the innovation will happen there and so on and so on and so forth. But it's actually Europe because China is too centralized. Information takes too long to kind of pass. Like those giant dinosaurs which became extinct. I don't know why I thought of that. And by the way, a Veli- Ve- Velociraptor, I think it's called, uh, you know, S- Spielberg created a WhatsApp narrative about it. Actually, it's the size of a turkey. So just a, 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 a small aside, you know, you could have a pet Velociraptor <laughs> if you uh, lived in those days, if it, if it allowed you. <laughs> I think in that particular case, consent would be important. But again, the example of Europe and China in the 15th century and why Europe did so well, because it's basically is perforce decentralized. It's different states, but people are moving back and forth. Innovation is moving back and forth. Ideas are moving back and forth. They're competing for labor. They're competing for capital. All of that is happening. It's almost like a perfect environment. Now, you know, when you think of both the benefits of many, many people, the economies of scale, and also the importance of local uh, governance. So, you know, uh, you you don't have uh, sort of sclerosis setting in. It makes complete sense that, okay, you know, national defense, you know, uh, foreign affairs, that's best left to the center. And who's going to clean my nulla outside? That's best, uh, you know, uh, left at a local level. And indeed, India was, you know, designed, as you point out, at a federal structure across five tiers you know you had national government state governments district block and local body levels right and this is in conception this sounds absolutely brilliant but the way our state was really designed by our founders had a bias towards centralization and not enough power not enough money went all the way down the line and 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 we you know suffer with that today so tell me about the reasons for this bias of centralization because it, you know in hindsight it's of course easy to pass judgment but you know sitting there uh, in Delhi as a country is collapsing around you I can totally understand that thing that let's keep it together you know the center must hold as it were you know so you centralize power and all of that but the consequences of that you you know uh, you have 50 70 uh, 100 years down the line for all you know so tell me a bit about how the state actually evolved Ki, hai, these are the good intentions federal karenge state you know and, and again states organized by language is also great where did it go wrong yeah, so I think, so let's first kind of get some facts, right, to understand just how over-centralized India is, right? I mean, so, see, one measure of just how over-centralized India is, is if you look at the number of times a state government has been dismissed, okay, a democratically elected state government, right, I mean, has just been summarily dismissed by the central government, or a weaker variant of that, which is the chief minister is just replaced, okay, like, I mean, because, and that happens even today though 356 has gone down okay so i think i have a stat in the book that says that i think between 1960 and and 2000 or there's a there's a window there that you know there's we document over 80 cases of either article 356 or chief ministers being replaced and so this was really 83 times. 83 times, right? Like, you know, uh-huh. 83 Adha, I can't remember the exact dates. I think it was 1960 to, uh, <clears throat> to 2010. Uh, 50, 50, 50 to 90. 50 to 90. Oh, just 90. Okay, not even after. I thought it went to 2010. But anyway, like, you know, I think regardless, there's a very, very, very large number of cases where local democratic kind of decision making as represented in the elected government has completely been countermanded by the center. Okay, now, Article 356 was meant to be used in the most egregious cases of complete breakdown of law and order, like, you know, and and a lot of those powers, in fact, I can't remember which one of you guys said this, right? But a lot of, because the the initial constitution, the laws in many ways reflected that of a colonial state, not just a colonial state, but also a state designed for wartime, okay? Because a lot of these discussions are happening around the preparation for World War II, that those things stayed on to kind of give the government of India kind of extreme powers to be used in emergencies, but it got routinized, right? It got routinized to the point where states almost become became subservient. So that was one part of over-centralization the, at the political level, right? Then at the financial level, at the policy level, one way to then think about how much control the center keeps is that, you know, it's both at the level of, say, centrally sponsored schemes, okay? So even though issues like health and education are supposed to be in the state list, right? By kind of having a lot of financial power with the central government, 
government that gets done through schemes, you're also effectively forcing states to kind of toe the line with regard to these central guidelines, right? So we can talk a lot more about that as well and get into details of how over-centralized things are and what the costs of those things are. See, but I think it's important not just to blame the center, right? The bigger culprit in some ways are the state governments, right? Because they have not actually decentralized any authority to local governments, okay? So, the and Raja Chalaya had this kind of wonderful quote, he says, everybody wants decentralization up to their level, okay? Like, you know, so so nobody wants to give up power. And that this is true both politically and bureaucratically, right? You know, nobody wants to climb the, spend the long climbing the greasy pole of power to get to the top and then give it away, right? Like, you know, so there's all these tendencies towards over-centralization. But I think if you take a step back into why we are the way we are at the time of the Constitution, how we've evolved, there's really three reasons, right? There are political reasons, there's economic reasons, and frankly, the most important may well be social reasons, which I think Madhav Khosla talks about in his book, right? I mean, and the see, the political reason was obvious, which is the single biggest concern of the framers was that the country would fall apart, okay? So you needed this idea of a strong center, and, you know, it was a union of states partly reflecting how British India was organized, but partly reflecting the princely states and, you know, the fact that these were reasonably distinct kind of entities. But the political unity of India was paramount in the minds of the founders. And so that's partly why you give the union government so much power. There's also the economic aspect of the thinking that most of the development had to be state-led and the resources that were needed for these investments were so large that it was felt that only the government of India could actually mobilize those resources. So there's an economic reason. And I think the most important one was actually the social reason, right? Which is that the, the Indian state was not just trying to create a functioning order of, you know, just law and order in a functioning state, but it was also trying to do social reform in a big way, okay? And I think the biggest concern Concern of decentralization of power was the concern of local elite capture, right? And uh, and this was not just a, a theoretical concern. We'll see this even now, right? I mean, in empirical work on social welfare programs and other areas, is that, you know, given just the deeply ingrained inequalities in Indian society, the reformers who kind of, you know, were architects of the constitution just did not trust, right? So Ambedkar's famous quote about the village kind of being a den of prejudice, etc. So very practically, what does this mean? Practically, it means that think about something like like education, okay? Now, in, say, the US or in most other high-income countries, education is purely a local government function, okay? It's done at the local level and the logic is that you accommodate preferences. There are certain standard curriculum, but local bodies have a lot of power, okay? But in an Indian case where the history of caste in many ways was about denying education, right? I mean, to the underprivileged or denying education to women, right? There was just this very real concern that local control would mean that you would simply not educate the underprivileged. Folks. Now, it's a different story that it didn't happen for other reasons, but the concern was that you cannot trust local elites to kind of do the investments that will disturb the social order, but that which are really important for social progress. Okay, so I think that was probably the biggest reason for the over-centralization. I mean, think about this, right? So if you're a government teacher who is recruited by the government and sent there to do a job, right? And again, Panchayat is this wonderful example, right? Where you see these tensions playing out even today. So you see that episode of kind Kind of, you know, yes. So throughout the thing, you see that this is a reserve for women, but it's the Sarpanch Pati who's doing the job. But you, you see that the agent of the state is kind of meant to make sure that the laws of the state are being followed against kind of the local pressures. And as usual, the end result will be somewhere in the middle, right? So you don't fully, the modernizing state is meeting the traditional society. Tradition doesn't give up immediately and modernity also loses, but they meet somewhere in the middle, right? So you do get progress. And so I think these are the historical reasons for why we are so over-centralized. And so again, it made sense at that time. But I think part of the reason we need to reimagine our possibilities today is that those kind of founding moments were times of literacy rates of under 20% at a time when you had, you know, no cell phones, no way of getting information, no way of monitoring, no way of really knowing what's going on. And so you over-centralized partly because you didn't trust. But, you know, we are at a place where the optimal amount of decentralization is almost certainly much higher than, you know, what we've had so far. Yeah, and I'll, I'll read out that Ambedkar quote because I love it so much where uh, he said, quote, what is a village but a sink of localism, a den of ignorance, narrow-mindedness and communalism? Just a beautiful sentence, flows so well. And, you know, and that kind of gets me to 
thinking and of course uh, you know what ambedkar is implicitly also nodding to is that notion of people as a good thing of you know no such thing as overpopulation that i pointed out that cities change incentives that right? you enter those larger economic networks your incentives change and you can no longer afford to be ignorant you can no longer afford to be so narrow minded or prejudiced prejudiced or whatever and they're not magic bullets but it changes a little bit for the better now i you know it's easy to look back in hindsight and say that oh that was wrong but at that moment sitting in his position it just seemed the completely plausible thing to do the country is falling apart you got to do something political imperative centralized power you know there is so much to be done in terms of building new industries building infrastructure centralized power that's the economic reason and the social reason is that look the country is a den of such you know casteism bigotry all of this shit happening all over the place and we elites in delhi are not like that we'll figure it out we'll change it from the top down centralized is power right and, and and the thing is and and i know it's possible to be too harsh and be judgmental about this third uh, instinct the way it worked out because you know you couldn't change society from the top down this was of course a classic you know gandhi versus the other guys argument where gandhi singh was we got to change it from the bottom up though gandhi of course also romanticized villages partly because he didn't spend too much time in them but uh, gandhi singh was ki bottom up karenge bhaiya waise hi hoga nahi to nahi hoga and these guys were like no no top down and and, and top down has failed in in every sense all these problems are still with us caste is still with us we are still a misogynist um, society and so on and so forth see, and but, of course but, we don't so, know but, the counterfactual but exactly but, right so that's what i was going to say yes and no right i think because see the careful research that looks at say the impact of women's reservation in panchayat elections right like you know actually shows that despite all of these limitations right i mean it has right. had not again worked is too strong a word right it has moved things in the right direction right see in the end progress is only directional right I means so you can always look at this glass half empty and say kuch nahi hua it has failed so i think again with all of these things the binary of worked of not worked i don't think is that useful right i think it's useful to kind of then just break apart the different components and go to first principles and saying so what were we trying to achieve here okay and then to what extent has that succeeded or failed and then look at the empirical evidence where possible and this is why you know i think as we get into the and i'll spend a little bit more time talking about the research right and the evidence which is again you know hopefully the comparative advantage i bring to the show right the things i say are actually based on or bringing together a bunch of academic papers you know but this is a huge area of research right of looking at the impact of decentralization at the impact of different kinds of reforms you know whether it's legislative reforms and representation where you do find positive effects right so that is the modernizing state that is top down like you know left to themselves villages are not going to elect women as 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 pradhans right so that is a top down imposition but you know i think it was urvashi i think in the most recent episode like you know i mean who was saying that these things are moving okay like i mean that these reservations are mm, others have moved things in the right direction um so you know i think that's one thing but another case for top down frankly and this is where the enrega paper comes in is that there is now actually pretty strong evidence that let's think about the design and delivery of welfare programs okay so there's an element of this that's about targeting about identifying who is the poor and there's an element about this that is delivery okay and is maybe you can argue both ways you can argue that local communities have more information as to who is in fact the most deprived and therefore needs the support right so one logic would be to say you should give the local communities more control over a welfare budget that they can allocate to who actually is the most needy but the flip side is to say that welfare for the poor usually affects the power structures like you know of the current um, rich and and rega is a perfect example that was massively resisted by landlords okay and we so there is both the risk of elite capture that these resources will be captured by them and the risk that you know they will simply not implement the program and so here the evidence now from multiple studies does suggest right that the top down approach has worked better okay in terms of so this is very nice paper in indonesia that uh, uh, ben olken abhijit banerjee and others have done and i think that will soon be out in the american economic review but you know they basically look at a reform that went from distributing rice by taking whole bags of rice to the local communities and saying you distribute it to one that kind of identifies the poor and sends the money directly to them and they basically estimate that this reform dramatically improved the progressivity of the welfare by actually finding more of the needy right so that's again a case where in the delivery of welfare programs actually top down mm, 
technology enabled interventions may in fact work better than the decentralized version but there are other areas like say school governance and service delivery where i think a decentralized model particularly with regard to accountability on things like attendance right i mean may work better but again you can see the tension right the tension mm, there are political tensions in federalism but there's also administrative tensions in federalism right because what the view towards a more centralized state for say teachers and doctors is to say that a local village will never be able to attract a highly qualified teacher or doctor the only way they will ever get a qualified staff member is if they are recruited through a civil service exam and then you are posted to that village because otherwise the village is never going to get a qualified staff member but that comes at the cost of <clears throat> the fact that two problems one is that this highly qualified and highly paid person feels no social connection to the village and therefore lives far away so a big part of the absence problem is that people are just not living in the communities right like i mean they're traveling from in and out and second is that they're not embedded in the community and so therefore there's very little kind of accountability so again you see the tension right i mean do you want the more qualified person but who's not accountable and embedded or are you better off with a slightly less qualified person but who's from the community and held accountable there right so i think so in all of these cases theoretically you can argue it both ways which is kind of why you then need the empirical evidence to say what is happening and this is again a very interesting case in education where see for example there's this nice rct that abhijit and esther and others did in up and that paper is called pitfalls of participatory development where they tried to activate village education committees okay which are supposed to do this oversight of the teachers and local and you know they have some local control and what they found was most people who were on vcs didn't even know they were on the vcs and you know and even those who knew they were on basically were completely ineffective because they had very little authority okay on the on on the teachers conversely there was a study on school management in kenya that was also randomized and what they find is a bit more nuanced which is that strengthening the school management committee has no effect on the performance of the regular civil service teacher but it does have a significant effect on the performance of the locally hired contract teacher and that's because the community controls the renewal of the contract but the community has no say over the regular teacher so i think the point again is just to highlight that conceptually you can argue these both ways but you know evidence matters and details really really matter yeah and you've got plenty of nuance in your chapter and you know when you write about the key tensions you've already mentioned a few of them like there is a tension about who has a final say then there are conflicts over fundamental values where at the local level you may have a different set of values and at a central level you could have a different set of values a classic example being the US civil war which you give or ambedkar himself when he's talking about the village correctly as a you know a den of ignorance uh, is sort of talking about a similar conflict which is there you speak about the administ administrative and political tensions risk of elite capture at the local level you've spoken about that you know the trade off between education and the local uh, embeddedness as you point out that uh, you know locally there may not be enough trained teachers so if at a central level you're sending to your teachers to government schools uh, even if they don't show up there but we we discuss that in an, uh, in another episode and another uh, tension that you point out is the political tensions when different parties are in power at different levels and all of that now uh, i get all of this and i also like as an approach especially when we are getting inquiry done into this we are getting empirical evidence rcts are being done all these insights are coming up uh, i understand that in theory we can just really modify it and figure out where you need a top down intervention and where it is best left locally but here's the thing in theory we we both agree that we need to be federal federalism is good you need local governance you need to design the areas and say okay the center does this local area uh, local governments do this but at the same time as you say the three concerns that our founders had when they were effectively designing the state you know 75 years ago you know are, are completely valid that the, the the center may not have held what the hell do you do you know and economically at that time the thinking would just have been you know uh, uh, top down and all of that and uh, and ambedkar's tensions were of course valid that listen this whole country will descend into you know its worst values if we if we just you know uh, leave it to local forces so here's my thought experiment for you that let's say that with the knowledge that you have now if you are sitting in ambedkar's place with context as it was then 
how would you design it differently because it is not enough to say that let's design it in at, at x equilibrium and then gradually we will tinker 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 as we get data it's not enough to say that because once you've set the equilibrium at x you've set the incentives kind of in stone because nobody who has power is going to give it up to speak to your you know the earlier quote of yours about how everybody wants to devolve power but only up to, <laughs> to them level. they don't want to you know so a state so a state government will say no no we need more power <laughs> local government governance but they won't give it to the districts and the districts won't give it to the blocks and so on and so forth and therefore it just in terms of the political economy nobody is going to give the power away so it is easier said than done that we will tinker things and we will smoothen the system as we go along no once you've set it you've kind of set it in stone so what are you sort of going for uh, in in this uh, horrible thought experiment i've inflicted upon you <laughs> yeah it's too much pressure right like you know i think the no so let me just say a couple of other things right i mean since you're talking about the founding moments and i wanted to connect back to this episode you did with madhavan like you know and i think the other nice thing i've seen in the arc of your own episodes over the years is you know how some of your if i may say so more black and white characterizations right I mean have become more nuanced right so your early version would just be they call like you know the us constitution was so small why do we have this huge thing and it's a periodical that gets in so much but i, I think, still feel that <laughs> but but i think what madhavan rightly pointed out was that the us constitution is an incredibly conservative constitution that is written in many ways codifying the power of a very narrow landed educated elite right i mean that wrote that constitution so and there was no con- concept really of social justice or any of issues of slavery or any of these things right i mean and so and so there are two things one that constitution is small so for two reasons really see one is going back to first principles of federalism right i mean that the us is what we call in political science a uh, coming together federalism right I mean where the states were distinct units and any power that is not given explicitly to the central government sits with the states okay so which is why that is what is called coming together you come together and give up few powers and the modern european union is a bit like that right i mean that you're coming together and saying i'm giving you powers on currency i'm giving you powers on defense and because there is economies of scale but anything i'm not given you sits with me okay so there is one part of that which reflects the fact that the us constitution is short simply because of that but the much bigger issue is that it is not trying to do any social reform and when you see the tension then 100 years later or 80 years later when they're dealing with slavery right i mean is that it does take a federal government to come in with military force to actually kind of abolish slavery and that is still not enough right it takes you know many many years after that you know you need the, the voting rights act in the 1960s to even make sure that voting rights of minorities were respected right so and that gives you a sense of just how deeply entrenched these local power structures structures are and how it takes kind of you know not just ideational change at the level of constitutions and laws but the actual physical backing of force of that state right i mean that comes and enforces the rights of the most marginalized okay so i think this challenge that we are trying to both kind of govern with stability because think about it right any attempt at social justice is fundamentally disruptive to a status quo okay like you know so you're trying to and that is i think the magic of india right the magic of india is that mm, and i think this was also in your episode with urvashi right i mean which is how despite all of the conflicts and fault lines we have the, the society is still actually remarkably stable okay in terms of not kind of you know exploding in conflagrations and it's a miracle right and so the challenge of kind of the indian state is that governance and constitutions are fundamentally conservative right because you want to preserve law and order you want to preserve certain things but social reform is fundamentally disruptive right i mean and so historically revol- re- social reform has happened with revolutions right whether it's the russian revolution or the peasant revolutions in china so what is again magical about the indian experience is like how we have managed to kind of push the arc of the state in progressive ways right i mean that improve social justice but within an arc of kind of over all democratic constitutional systems and stability right so you get mm, you know so anyway so i think the so therefore coming back to how you would rearchitect or rewrite certain aspects of the constitution today based on what we know from the last 70 see it's not just what we know right it is the fact that 
Today, education rates, literacy rates are 75% compared to 15%, right? You know, smartphones and cell phones. So why do you not trust the local areas? So the two reasons you don't decentralize is one, you think people are not capable. And second, like, you know, you don't have visibility. Okay. Now you have both, right? So essentially what I argue in terms of the kind of reform agenda that I think states should be doing, that deepen federalism while at the same, deepen federalism and local control, while at the same time recognizing the importance of checks and balances right because the local communities left to themselves may very often kind of undo some of these goals of justice and progressive kind of you know both programs and policies is so let's take a very concrete example of teachers okay so the logic of federalism would suggest that education should be locally managed the problem is that will the village guy appoint his crony as the teacher like you know and therefore you get a poor teacher and who's not accountable whatever right so how do you therefore build a modified architecture that builds both the strength of your current systems of quality control with the additional accountability, okay, that comes from local control, okay. So one of the things I talk about, so I have this whole section of nuanced decentralization, right. So it can't just be, okay, chalo, I'm blindly going to send off everything. But the flip side, the argument of the centralizer who says local level may bot corruption hoga, local level may yes sub capture ho jayega, also needs to be treated with a grain of salt because there is a self-serving power preserving element of that argument. Okay. So so what I, a framework that I broadly talk about in the chapter when I talk about nuanced decentralization is to imagine just in the case of teachers the following, okay, that you can only be appointed as a teacher if you have been empaneled through a selection process whereby you have to pass certain exams and show that you have certain qualifications, okay, but being empaneled doesn't guarantee you a job, okay, so today you get into the government system and you're basically guaranteed a job, okay, so the job is still held at the pleasure of the local community and so, you know, if you don't show up, if you're not effectively catering to the local community, they can say, nay, like we don't want you, okay. So they can just say, I don't want you, I want somebody else. But they are constrained in finding people who are also empaneled. Okay, so in a world where you have empaneled, say, more teachers than there are jobs, okay, you have got both the quality control aspect of it and the local control aspect of it, right? So that's kind of an example of how you might want to architect certain things that has both the benefits of a slightly higher level of kind of administration and oversight, but also the strengths of local accountability and local control. And then there are more radical versions of this, you know, which I talk about, which is a slightly more radical version is you could take the entire budget for schools and say, because see, right now, the government school salaries are so much higher, okay, than the private schools, right? So, and part of the problem in the, why does the private school kind of do well? It's because they're paying one fourth the salaries and hiring two times or three times as many teachers. And so you have lesser multi-grade teaching, you have smaller groups, you have all of that, right? So there is nothing that prevents a, a public school from having those same efficiencies if you were to say that I'm going to give the local body the entire budget of the school, right? And the local body can choose to spend that money how they see fit. Now, of course, you still have to worry about corruption. You still have to worry about a bunch of things. And so you will need certain things that says you can still only hire an empaneled teacher, but you have some flexibility in the wage setting. So here is the budget for the salary. You Maybe the salary is made to 50% and the remaining 50% is allocated on a performance-based basis or allocated to say, I want to attract a more qualified teacher. So there are ways of kind of taking the current budget and dramatically improving the efficiency and accountability by increasing the stake of local communities, but at the same time, building some checks and balances, right? And means to make sure that there is a trust but verify approach to, you know, to how we do this. And, so that's, I'm, I'm, and that's not an answer to how I would read out the constitution, but that's kind of a very specific example, right? I mean, of saying how these principles can be tweaked. <laughs> Fair enough. No, you know, I have changed my mind a lot, uh, oh, um, you know, over the course of all the great conversations I've had with uh, people who've given me so much insight. But this particular issue about the US Constitution is not one of them. <laughs> I maintain that we would have been incredibly fortunate to have the US Constitution because it enshrined and protected individual rights. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's important. It protected free speech. You know, uh, Umar Khaled and Sadiq Kappan would not be in prison today if we had that Constitution. Mohammed Zubair would not have been arrested if we had that Constitution. So it is something I feel strongly about protecting individual rights. As far as slavery is concerned, that's a social evil. If the elites of that time were to enshrine their values into the constitution, abolishing slavery wouldn't have been there anyway. And over time, as society changed, thankfully it went away. I would argue that our efforts at social justice didn't really work in the top-down way. You know, we still have many of those problems that we had then. In fact, the, the whole quest for social ju justice in some ways became a bit of a political farce. And I don't necessarily 
necessarily mean that you leave it to the villages to reform themselves as Gandhi ji might have hoped. I don't think that would have worked either. So I don't have an answer for this, but I do see where sort of the limitations are. So uh, on this particular issue, I won't take a stand well, because exactly. I don't have and any fact, answers. But, but I, I see the problems of, uh, you know, the, where the elites failed, I do see that. No, but I think this connects us back all the way to state capacity, right? See, because in a, in a way, the story of India, right, is that because we are crafting our ideals of what we want to do, right, at a time when, because, see, and this is, I think, partly in Alex and Shruti's episode on, you know, on, on kind of the imitation, right, premature imitation, right? And see, the ideas of what kind of a modern democratic society should stand for, even in 1947 and 50, are informed by what people are seeing in the West, right? So, the story of India is always one of aspirations ahead of our capacity, right? I mean, so the problem is not, again, what's in the aspirations, right? It is that we haven't had the capacity to then actually follow up against that. So, so one view is to say that, listen, you need to put the aspirations there, even if you're not able to deliver, because that is a bit of a North Pole and a guide star, not star to where do we want to go? Okay, like, you know, okay, at least the laws aspire to this so that we can get inspired to get there. Okay, so that is one framing. The, the converse framing of that is that when your aspirations are so far ahead of your capacity to deliver, it actually breeds cynicism, like, you know, that we just say all of these things and never do it. And then that creates kind of the trust deficits and everything that we talk about. And so I think that is, it is the core challenge. And why, you know, when I talk about state capacity, I see these investments investments in state capacity as the central, the core, when I think about India at 75, right, I think about, you know, we are a miracle in many, many ways, right, there are just so many things to be proud of, right, but if we want to focus our mind on what is it that we really need to get our act together in the next 25 years, it is essentially building a state that is capable of meeting the aspirations, right, I mean, in the constitution, the law, and coming back to Fukuyama's scope, uh, scope and, and strength, I agree, some of this will also require reducing the scope of the state, right, I mean, there's a basic mathematical truism that if I'm, you know, and in fact, I find a very useful analogy to be with my own time management, right? I mean, so in a way, I'm like the overcommitted state in terms of my time commitment, right? I mean, because I have committed to more things than I have time for. So I am always kind of juggling. I'm always kind of responding to what is most urgent, who's putting the most pressure on me and things that are important but not urgent are getting neglected. So to bring my life into kind of balance, it requires a combination of two things. One, is becoming more efficient and investing in capacity but the other is also cutting down the things I say yes to okay so mechanically you need both right I mean and so that applies even to the state I mean we are definitely overextended doing a bunch of things that we have no business doing so some of that has to come down but I think where I want to push back not to you but some kind of some of the naive kind of discussions that happen out there to say Dekho, that where the markets have taken over the markets have done well so let's kind of unleash the markets in these areas and that will also do well and I think there in the core functions of the state right I mean, mean that that is not going to work. So you are going to have to kind of invest in core state capacity and apply that in these six areas that I've talked about, right? I mean, so, and the reason the federalism chapter is kind of a theme rather than a sector is that the ideas in the federalism chapter then apply across the sectors, correct? Which is how do you then kind of optimally re-architect our governance across multiple layers so that you really kind of give local communities more of a stake and more of a control. So, and maybe there's a chicken and egg problem, right? The chicken and egg problem of decentralization is that people say we will not decentralize because there is no capacity to actually do the work locally. Conversely, the capacity is not built because you've never given them the money and the authority to kind of make it worth developing the capacity, okay? So, and in a way, if you look at even the arc of Indian independence, the British in the early 20th century were like, they can't govern themselves, right? So, this is why 1935 Government of India Act, kind of having the provincial governments, showing that you can do some stuff, then kind of, you know, builds your muscles along the way to being able to govern yourself. So similarly, at the local government level, we're in this chicken and egg today where we say we won't decentralize because there's no capacity. And conversely, people say, why bother when there's no capacity? And that's where I think, you know, particularly in urban governance, right? I mean, where I agree with Ashwin and others is that because you now have enough educated, highly competent people, and in many cases, more competent who are in the government, right? If you can find ways for greater civic engagement in urban governance, right? I mean, then you're kind of both proving that the community can handle its problem, 
problems and by doing that you're also building a little bit more of a political force right i mean to actually ask for more devolution i mean at the local level right so and and i think it's not an accident of course you know the jury is out on what amadmi party will do in 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 punjab right but it's not an accident that the chief minister who focuses the most on service delivery issues is the most empowered mayor of india right like i mean is because he is basically governing delhi and therefore like i mean talks about service delivery issues and you know the more the more you start kind of seeing organic political formations that focus exclusively on local service delivery and governance right i mean then you will kind of build a little bit of a bottom up aspect to that and you know power is never taken right power is all uh, power is never given away right power is taken okay and so just like so there are people in who are decentralization advocates who think as who feel as strongly about this as democratization itself let's say like you know democracy itself elites never give up power it happens when people kind of demand the power that you know you you give away uh, the vote and there are people who argue the same thing for decentralization and going back to the question nobody will willingly give up power but it has to come up bottom up and saying you know we will step up and do what it takes to govern ourselves right i mean and having done that that creates the space over time for more and more decentralization and you know and sometimes the institutions will also help i think this time mm, the finance commission has explicitly kind of linked certain transfers to kind of the next level uh, now again you could argue that that's not democratic but you know it's it's one of the ways in which things that we know are good but that are politically not incentive compatible get done is through these non partisan commissions that make recommendations that then get adopted wonderful i'll i'll push back a little bit at your pushing back of allegedly non me uh, you know in in uh, in your book you have this little bit about how you know some market proponents say that uh, you know look at what markets have done in telecom and airlines uh, that is not and, you by the way i'm not i'm not pushing back on you that's not yeah. you no because you know that that is actually the classic example i use whenever i talk about the power of the market that you know uh, i remember what phones were you know you had a 10 year waiting period for phones in the 1980s airlines were so expensive i remember when you opened it up um, how things changed because of market incentives and so i use exactly those two sectors and uh, and you kind of mention exactly those two sectors but even if you're pushing back against someone who is allegedly non me it is still to be noted that you're pushing back against the straw man because i don't think anyone argues that the basic roles of the government should be supplanted by the market instead the argument is and the kind of argument i would make in essential services like education for example is that i am not saying that you abolish government schools and only a private schools right not at all all i'm saying is that you and we've discussed this at length in our episode is that while you do what you do allow private schools the chance to exist instead of putting so many impediments in their way such as you can't have a for profit school so you know a lot of the budget private schools today for to, to which um, you know slum dwellers send their children instead of to a free government school they they by voting with their feet a lot of those schools are illegal outside their law outside the law can shut down any moment so on and so forth so all i'm saying is that allow society to solve its own problems and the few things that a state should do well again going back to fukuyama must think about scope and strength we need a strong state that does a few things well not a weak state that does many things badly what i would say is that in the things that a strong state should do well you know by all means a state should do that no one is making the you know argument that uh, the market should do everything but at least allow people to solve their own problems that's uh, yeah and i and, and i agree completely and you know that's why i have this whole chapter on state and market right in fact so you know this is the the temptation of going into other chapters but i am going to you know read out one paragraph from chapter 10 right <laughs> okay, on, my god <laughs> on, on, on kind of you know on basically this Yeah, so I say this right. In ideological terms, my approach in the coming chapters is best characterized as being to the center left in terms of goals and center right in terms of means. Right. So my choice of sectors is clearly influenced by the development and capabilities framework associated with those who prioritize equity and justice. Right. So whether it's education, health, all these things. Uh, further, my focus on improving the capacity of public systems to deliver better will also resonate with the center left. Yet the ideas and themes I focus on also reflect my views based on years of research and practice that delivering these goals at scale, especially especially with our limited resource base will require us to sharply improve accountability efficiency and cost effectiveness within the government pay careful attention to incentives and design systems that better align the incentives of all stakeholders to deliver improved outcomes not simply assume that well intentioned laws and higher budgets will translate into better outcomes 
and treat markets in the private sector as an ally in achieving social and development goals. And these are views that are more commonly associated with the economic right. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, where I come in on this. And so hopefully there, I think we would agree very, very broadly. No, no, I, 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 you know, you don't have to agree to <laughs> agree with me to be brilliant. You're brilliant anyway, and I learned so much from you. But I would again push back at a little characterization here when you talk about these goals as center-left goals. I think you should in good faith accept that they're everybody's goals. Correct. And the only argument is about means, means, right? That we want everyone to be educated. We want everyone to be healthy. How do we get there? And what the economic right would argue is that, uh, you know, good intentions and the coercive power of the state won't get you there. We, we, we have all of history as testimony to that. And we have to unleash the power of markets and society to help itself. And at the same time, if you believe that, uh, you know, you, uh, good intentions alone and, uh, you know, the power of the state will solve it, go ahead. Good luck. But don't stop us from solving our own problems. That's kind of what I would say, you know, well, like we the American Constitution you know, so much now. <laughs> and, we <agree. laughs> yeah. and we fully, fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, let's 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 uh, get on to uh, sort of let's continue talking about federalism. You know, some of the stats that blew my mind, and this is something I should have known. This is something, in a sense, I knew because I think when Iceland was doing well in the last football World Cup, I said, "Are Varsova has more people than them?" You know. So this is something I should have known. But I just want to read these statistics out because it uh, re you realize the scale of the problem and how st stupid this kind of our kind of centralization is. Where at one point you right. The 15 largest Indian states by population would all rank in the top 42 countries in the world by population or 20% of the most populous countries in the world. And you've got a chart also, right? So it's not just UP. The 15 largest Indian states would be among the top 40 countries in the world. Simply put, governing an Indian state is best sort of as the equivalent of running a medium to large country. Stop quote. And then you go on to say, quote, Indian districts and sub-districts are also large. India has over 700 districts, average population under two million per district, around 7,000 sub-districts slash blocks with an average population of 200,000 each, and so on and so forth. And then at the, you end by saying for perspective, the average district in India has more people than 85 countries or 36% of the countries in the world. So the average district in India is bigger than 85 countries in the world. Like, my God, that's, that's sort of uh, mind-blowing. Now, one can't quantify this, but what has been sort of like or first before before I ask you questions about what has been the sort of the cost of being centralized all this time. If I am to ask you to sort of lay out how deep is the dysfunction between power and accountability in this kind of a system, like I had an episode with Shruti Rajgopal on urban governance and she pointed out that, listen, the guy you are voting for has no power to change your life and the guy who has power to change your life, your votes don't matter to him in a context of... Of Maharashtra as it were but I think it would be uh, kind of true a lot so give me a better sense of this structure overall how, how, how powerful is a center how powerful are the states how powerful are districts and so on and so forth like both of us agree that for example you know uh, reserving those panchayat head seats for women did have an impact over a period of time right uh, even if people can argue net positive net negative or I tend to think net positive but they did have an impact right uh, at the very local level but but at the same time, it's true that there's almost no power at the very local level. That, you know, the center will stop anything going to the state. The state will stop anything going further down. You point out that, uh, you know, the, the percentage of uh, money, for example, that the states get is, I, I think, two thirds of all revenues are spent by the, all money is spent by the center, right? Uh, so, no, so, give, give uh, no sorry. Expenditure is more in the states than the center. But see, essentially, first principle, that's why, you know, some of this is overlaps with chapter seven on revenue as well, right? So, first principles of public finance say that, a lot, it makes sense to collect revenue at a higher level, okay, because particularly because there's economies of scale and tax administration, you don't want to raise to the bottom in certain aspects like corporate taxes, um, customs and stuff are obviously kind of done. Mm. So, and in a way, so essentially revenue by first principles, it does make more sense that the government of India collects more, but expenditure by first principles, it makes more sense that more of it happens at the state level because that's, they are closer to the delivery. And the gap between that is usually, that's what is fulfilled by the finance commission, right? Because the finance commission takes kind of the divisible pool of revenues and then through a formula that has components of horizontal and vertical kind of, you know, the uh, delegation basically allocates money to states. And so, 
the the gap comes is fulfilled in two ways. One is money that comes to the finance commission that is broadly untied, and second is money that comes through the centrally sponsored schemes, which is also money coming from the center, but that is more tied, right, into specific things. So anyway, so overall, most of the expenditure, close to sixty percent of spending, happens at the state level, but about sixty percent of the revenue is collected at the national level. Right, and g- give me a g- give me sort of a breakdown of the uh, system in terms of what is a power breakdown and what should it be, and also what have sort of been some of the consequences of this. And obviously, those will be broader brush because you can't really quantify anything. Yeah, but, um, and I think, see, to be honest, the biggest source of discrepancy, frankly, see, if you look at the design by first principles, the center and the state are the levels where you're supposed to design policies and programs, and the district and lower level are where you're supposed to implement them okay so uh, and that's broadly how powers are allocated okay so when we say that there isn't much power at the local level i think in practice it really translates into two things okay one is that there is very very little or frankly zero a discretionary budget okay that is there at the local level so if you are a local principal or even a district education officer okay your discretionary budget in terms of funding programs or interventions that may make sense are basically zero okay so that is one margin where local levels have very little power the second margin in and this is more true kind of you know at the village and at the facility level is you have basically no power over the government employees right it means so because when we say that the bulk of the budget so when i talk about the decentralization in china that why does china have so china has about 50% of total public expenditure happens at the local government level in india that's only 3% okay so that gives you a sense of how big this skew is okay but the biggest driver of that is that almost all service delivery employees okay whether it's teachers or doctors or you know street cleaners or anybody is employed at the local government okay and so that's where that delta comes in so when we say so it is not that the indian villages do not get the resources but because the bulk of the resources is tied to the salary cost of the employee right i mean on whom you have zero kind of accountability that's where the fundamental mismatch happens correct so i think the tweaks we would want to make are relative really simple okay which is to say mm. if local governments have a lot more authority on kind of the staffing okay and and that's where that nuanced decentralization i talked about right mean matters which is saying you have an empaneled list of people who kind of satisfy a certain set of technical criteria for having this government job but that doesn't guarantee you the actual employment that is still done at the local government level so that would be one meaningful way of empowering them now a more radical way of empowering them would be to transfer the entire budget okay to the mm, local government and saying this is the budget per child and you know you have the freedom to spend and there you you still want accountability in terms of you know so what you want and this goes back to a principle i talk about a lot throughout the book right of autonomy and process and accountability for outcomes okay which is to say that you have the budget but we will kind of have independent measurement of certain outcomes and then you know you can think about fiscal rules that say here is a certain amount that's equal for every child so i talk about this in the expenditure chapter right where i talk about a 70 20 10 principle of allocation of public funds which is 70% based on an equality principle where every child or every citizen gets the same amount about 20% based on an equity principle where you say here are the places that are the kind of most underprivileged need gap kind of financing and the 10% based on an effectiveness principle that you know the places that are actually delivering outcomes so you put a little bit of skin in the game like you know for people to be oriented towards outcome so i think these would be mm, and this is why again the foundation of so many of the reform ideas i have is better data right and that's why the chapter 4 see these are ideas about performance based funding which i have shared in the past even with the finance commission right i mean and in fact dr yv reddy i remember talking to him about this back in the day he said you know i think all these ideas make a lot of sense but i don't have the data to implement them okay so you need the data which is again why that's a foundational investment in being able to do reforms along a whole bunch of these lines but yes so i think mota moti when we say that the state has most of the power it reflects the fact that the gov- employees are state government employees okay and it reflects the fact that that's where the bulk of the cost is going and because the local communities have very little oversight and accountability on the employees that's kind of where the core lack of decentralization hits you and the second place where it hits you is the complete lack of discretionary budgets okay so if you have some ideas and want to do something you just don't have the resources to do it 
Yeah, I like the 70-20-10 formulation and just in terms of local knowledge and local priorities, I don't know if you, you seem to have heard every episode of mine. Did you hear the one with Abhinandan Sekhi? Uh, yes, the one about yeah. the movie theatre. They wanted the movie theatre. Huh? Yeah, see, so, uh, see, I passed your pop quiz. You <laughs> passed my test. You, you passed. Pass. Yeah, I, I, you know, I will not remember as many things from my episodes as you do. But just for the benefit of listeners who haven't heard that uh, great episode, the, the funda is that, uh, you know, Abhinandan and his team were at this northeast village and they asked the villagers, you know, where would you like to kind of uh, your money spend the most and they said we want a movie theater now this is completely counterintuitive there are people in a village they could ask for a dispensary they could ask for a road they could ask for whatever why do they want a movie theater and the answer was that because there was no entertainment in the village all the kids would go go to uh, you know near uh, whatever the nearby town was to watch movies and the roads were bad and unsafe and all of that and they would have accidents and the death rate was high so it was you had to risk your life to uh, watch a film and if it was a Bollywood film, you probably deserve to risk your life for it. But um, uh, and that was a thing. And and this is local knowledge. This is not something a central planner could ever have worked out. And similarly, in every uh, sort of local area, you might have different priorities, which only local people would know. And, uh, you know, my instinct here would be to uh, figure out what is the most local base of unit you can get to and give them as much money as possible and let them make the decisions and then let these units, whether they are blocks or districts or whatever, compete with each other. Much as we would say states should compete with each other, like in the US to a certain extent they do in terms of these are the taxation laws and um, uh, you know these are all the different kind of laws that we have available. This is the ecosystem we are building. You compete with each other and then people vote with their feet, which they can because they're, you know, they're moving, moving across states, not across countries. And I think that's a great way, that's a healthy competition and I would have thought that that's one of the fundamental principles of uh, federalism, that you allow people to compete at that kind of policy uh, level. Now, uh, you, you so, know, sorry, how I mean, so, I, so I think, you know, so you're absolutely right. There's a slight additional nuance to that, right? I mean, so what you're kind of, cha- so there is an element of competition, right? I mean, which happens, say, at the state level and kind of attracting people, investments and all of that stuff. But there is an also a... Mm, a very powerful element here of accommodating divergence in people's preferences. Okay, so the original idea of, you know, what's called Tibu sorting. So, uh, uh, Charles... Uh, T-I-E-B-O-U-T. So some people actually pronounce it Tai Bout, but my first teacher, like, you know, pronounce him, uh, so Caroline Hawksby calls him Tibu. Um, but the core idea of Tibu sorting is that that what is government okay if you take a step back what is government is government is meant to be a vehicle for expressing our collective desires on kind of taxation and a bundle of public goods correct so and different people will have different preferences right some would say take a, i'm pay, happy to pay a 40 percent tax if the government is going to give me a whole bunch of these things others might say no i only want 10 percent tax you just provide law and order and the rest will take care of okay now the logic of the Tibu sorting is that by allowing local jurisdictions to set their own bundles of taxation and, and public goods, you are also, it's not just competition, but you're di- di- accommodating diversity and preferences, right? Like, you know, by giving people a chance to not saying this is better than that on average, this is better for me. I want this and I want that, right? No, but I think, frankly, in India, we're very, very, very far from that. And see, the, 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 the problem is to make that model work, you need a model of revenue collection that is differentiated by space, okay? And because most of our revenue collection is not differentiated by space, right? Because whether it's income tax or whether it's GST, these are all kind of doesn't matter where you are, right? Now, but that kind of gets me to one, I think, very, very important area of reform, which I think is key to strengthen local governments, and that is strengthening property taxes, okay? So this will show up again in chapter seven, right? When I talk about revenue, Because the the reason property taxes are so important is it's important for multiple reasons, right? See, I think one of so one of the key problems in taxation in India is that the fiscal compact between the taxpayer and the government is broken. Okay, which is the fiscal compact is I pay taxes and I expect services in return. But where we are today is I pay I pay taxes, the services are so bad I go to the private sector. So therefore I'm double paying both the taxes and paying out of my pocket, and therefore tax evasion is almost kind of morally justified, right? I mean, that people kind of justify in their mind, okay, why am I paying taxes, okay? So, there is a lot of evidence on what's 
called tax morale, okay, which is what kind of increases voluntary tax compliance. And a big part of tax morale is people kind of two things. One is seeing a visible link between your taxation and the, the services you're receiving. And second is having a say in how those taxes are spent, okay. And so therefore, if you want to raise taxes in India, like I get very nervous. In fact, there is, I say this very clearly. There's a reason my ref revenue chapter comes after expenditure because, you know, a government that spends money badly loses moral authority to collect taxes. Okay, so you, that's why I first want to improve efficiency of expenditure before you raise more taxes. But that being said, you know, there is no question we need better urban public infrastructure. We need a whole bunch. We need the revenue for these things. Okay, but the value of more property taxes, it has many, many benefits, right? So you, the first is that actually, if done well, you can create a self-sustaining virtuous cycle, right? Whereby if the tax revenue is providing local public goods, right, I mean of a certain quality, then that can actually improve the local housing prices to capitalize the quality of the public goods, which then increases that and increases the tax revenue, right? So you get into a virtuous cycle of public good provision. Because again, what is the core economics of public finance? The core economics is that if I take taxpayer money, I should spend it on things that have a higher ROI, right? I mean, than the money I'm spending. Mm. And if it has a higher ROI, say in the case of public goods, that higher return on investment is capitalized in the property prices. So there's a lot of research in the US, for example, showing how if you invest in better schools, right, I mean through issuing school bonds, then that kind of is reflected in the property prices that then kind of more than pays for the bond. Okay, so that's why it's a positive ROI investment. Now coming therefore to how do you, so that's one reason for why I think property taxes make more sense because you create a bit of a virtuous cycle between kind of local service delivery and kind of the underlying value of the asset. The second reason is politically, it is kind of, there's a tighter link between the tax and the services because it's not going into very, very far away government of India or even the state government. It's going to your local government. And therefore, you see how it comes back to you in terms of services. And the third is that it also kind of helps with the federalism point, which is that the key challenge today for local government is local government has zero or very little revenue raising capacity, right? So they're dependent on the goodwill and the transfers that come from higher levels of government. But the, and that's why at least in urban areas, right? I mean, if you're able to strengthen kind of property taxation, that gives you a virtuous cycle of also strengthening federalism because see, one of the reasons state governments have not bothered so much about property taxes is they see this as hamko kya fayda, right? I actually talked to an advisor to chief minister said, ha ha, this is good, but it doesn't help the state government finances. I'm like, boss, you know, that's very, very short-sighted because A, you are responsible for welfare of your people and if there are investments a state government can make that increase the capacity of local governments to raise property taxes efficiently, that's good for welfare. But it's also good for the state because you create this positive cycle of increased economic activity that translates into higher GST and other revenue for the state. So, you know, overall, it makes sense for states to invest purely from a fiscal perspective in the revenue raising capacity of local governments. So just to give you a sense of perspective, India's total Total property tax to GDP is under point is around 0.1 percent. Okay, 0.1 to 0.15. I think in France, it's about 3%, okay? So it's about 25x or 30x. So that gives you a sense of how far behind we are, where the feasible frontier is. And that's a kind of investment. Again, these are very concrete, implementable reforms, okay? And these are some of the things we're working on as CGIS, is that these are immediate things that will both increase fiscal capacity and increase kind of effective federalism because the local government now has the revenue on which to act. So as an aside, it's a very nice research paper. Again, so I keep getting excited about, I see I make connections both to papers and podcasts, right? So there's a very nice uh, study in China, okay, that even though China is kind of centralized party rule and stuff like that, China did have a period of experimenting with village level elections, okay? And the logic was that... Mm, to have at least local representatives along with the party secretary having a say in kind of what local projects were done. And one of the most interesting results in the paper was that the local elections led to an increase in people's willingness to pay taxes, okay? And that because you are more willing to pay tax if you have a say in how that tax is spent, okay? So anyway, so all I'm saying is that part of the chicken and egg of our decentralization discourse in India is because of this chicken and egg of how do I decentralize when there's no capacity and it all depends on kind of a higher level largesse, okay, as opposed to building systems that make it sustainable for there to be more effective local governance. The property tax agenda becomes, I think, a very, very important part of that state capacity that also strengthens federalism. 
Yeah, the China experiment is fascinating. I'm going to go on a mini tax rant here because I think taxes are one of the things that we have normalized. Look, here's the thing. The thing is that let's say that I pay 30% of my income every year through taxes. So actually, I I happen to pay more because 18% GST plus, which I can't offset against anything plus more than 30% income tax. So almost half my income goes in taxes. It's a common rant. But just take a common citizen and let's say a common citizen is paying 30% uh, one third of their income in taxes every year, direct plus indirect because after all everybody pays taxes not just income taxpayers let's say your total is 33% right Sorry, that, or, by the way, let me just w- one third. Minute, very quickly hmm. see India's overall tax to GDP ratio is only 18% and that's because only 5% pay income tax right so the bulk of people are paying the indirect taxes and so, exactly. yeah, so the so, GST l- will end up being about 12 yeah anyway so yeah See, you're spoiling the rhythm of my rant. Sorry. You know, if you were singing Antakshari, I would not cut in the middle of a song sorry, and sorry. let me tell you where this Mukhra came from. So, so, okay, yeah. So here's the deal. If you're paying 33% of your income as tax, that basically means that for four months of the year, let's say January to April, uh, you're a slave of the government. You're working for the government without actually wanting to. So taxation is effectively part-time slavery, uh, which is a correct characterization. That is what it is. Without wanting to, you're working for the government all your income goes there for those four months. Now, this is fine, right? This is fine because we need a state to survive, we need a state to protect our rights, etc., etc. We all agree upon this. I think ideologies really differ only on how much of this is justified, but we all agree that a state is justified. Now, what happens in India often is that uh, most people, they look around and they don't see bang for the buck, like you pointed out. And this is not, by the way, an excuse for evading taxes. I pay my taxes scrupulously. Um, uh, you know, uh, and uh, in fact, it's a matter of principle for me to do so because as long as I'm a citizen here I, I want to, you know, I, I otherwise I can't raise my voice if I don't also pay the taxes that gives me the right to do so. However, the point is that it, it has reached a stage in the modern time where you, earlier one would look around and see all this money being basically wasted. Today one looks around and see that this money is being used for bulldozers and giant statues and all of these things which I think are very toxic. So it is actually, uh, you know, a question I'll throw to my listeners that in this day and age when you see what the state is is doing with your money is it moral to even pay taxes and, and to this my answer would not be to evade my taxes my, uh, evade your taxes rather why would you evade my taxes unless you're me but uh, I, I think those who have the means would probably then leave it would be logical you know why you don't want to fund so many things that you actively disapprove of because some of it is not incompetent some of it is just malice d- directed towards your fellow citizens so that's just one uh, random rant I'll throw out but I would say that uh, you know like those people in China, I would be far happier to pay my taxes if I could actually see that they were being used properly, if they were more local, if I could see that the nalla is okay, that local services are hai, that the police is actually active, it is safe to walk around at night, that women are not getting Eve teased, and so on and so forth. I would feel much more for it, except that part of the reason of the apathy of the Indian citizen is that they don't see this connection at all. And, and luckily for the state, we've normalized taxes. Otherwise, if people realize they are part-time slaves, I think there would be mass rebellion, but we've normalized this shit. But that uh, is my little rant. Uh, That aside, uh, you know, everything you said is uh, illuminating. Um, uh, I almost feel like I've read chapter 7 on revenue, (laughs) even though uh, you haven't sent it to me yet. (laughs) But uh, I'm I'm just scratching the surface of ideas in each of these chapters. You're just getting, yeah, anyway. So I'm hopefully providing some alibi for why this book is taking time. But, you know, thank you so much for having me on the show once a year because it's also kind of, I think it was a sneaky artist, right, who said, it's where or Nishan, see, I remember people now by their hand, handles. Rather. But I did the same with Bhalo Manish and Anirban last time, you know, but, this, but, this is, but I think he said, right, I mean, that as a writer, the hardest thing is like, you know, how long it takes you to get feedback and therefore the value of serializing things and stuff like that. So, you know, these episodes and stuff are very, very useful for me as a source of intermediate validation that, chalo, there's something sensible going on here. But, you know, hopefully we, <clears throat> we're close to the finish line and this guy should be out soon. <laughs> No, no, I I would be happy for you to stay forever, but maybe you're thinking like that. But yeah, so uh, after sort of, you know, having uh, given me all these insights on federalism, we've we've spoken about, you know, why it is desirable. We've spoken about what are the tensions that come in the way. We've spoken about the Indian context, how that affected the design, the structure of our state in the sense that we are so centralized, what we need to do to change. Now let's sort of get to the brass tacks of it. You have a section where you talk about implementable reform ideas. 
And I find that title itself extremely interesting because it's not reform ideas, it's implementable reform ideas. So tell me a bit about these ideas firstly, but also perhaps before that, how optimistic are you about them being implementable? Because, you know, before this conversation, I, I, I would have been fairly pessimistic and I would have said, look at the incentives, why would those in power give up power, so on and so forth. But at the same time, what you've pointed out is that a lot of people within the system want the system to change, not because of their own individual considerations, but because they just want uh, to, uh, you know, they see the benefit that there would be for the people at large in the country at large from it changing and I totally buy that because I know so many such people who are within the government who understand that things need to change who would be grateful for a blueprint and therefore will be grateful to uh, read your book it will now you know circulate in brown paper packets in government departments I sincerely hope so because who will be caught reading it openly <laughs> uh, so <laughs> t- t- tell me about tell me about tell me about why you're <clears throat> confident of uh, how confident are you of these changes actually being implemented and also t- tell me more about each of these changes because there's, there's so much to dive into over there. Yeah, and again, you know, I think the, there's a very, very broad list here but, you know, so one thing I talk about so is just so I break this into things that can happen at the government of India level like, you know, and things that can happen at the state level, right? Uh, so at the All India level, I would say, you know, there are two or three things. See, one is I think there is a case potentially over time without being very specific of considering the case for smaller states okay um, and I think the data suggests that the the MP Chhattisgarh the Bihar Jharkhand the UP Uttarakhand, and recently even AP Telangana have all kind of you know benefited just by kind of making the uh, benefited governance and development outcomes by and this is not un, unambiguous They're, like Jharkhand I think regressed a little bit because it had your classic uh, resource curse kind of problem okay um, but over time I think the data suggests that that's been positive. I think an even stronger piece of research and evidence comes from, so there's this ongoing study we have where, you know, we're looking at this very important governance reform that happened in under N.T. Ramarao in Andhra Pradesh in the mid 80s, where one of his big governance reforms was kind of, and AP and Telangana are still very, very unique on this, was kind of going from blocks to mandals. Okay, so effectively, a block in in India today, the average district is about 2 million people. And then you have blocks of about 200 to 250,000. Right, but what they did was they went down to mandals and thereby quadrupled the number of sub districts. Okay, so that went down. So the average population in a mandal is about sixty to seventy-five thousand, as opposed to two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand. So what that does is it basically brings government closer to the people. Okay, so there's an element both of administrative decentralization and an element of political decentralization because your jilla parish, your your, your block parishad now becomes your mandal parishad, which is therefore closer to the people. Right. So and there we've got kind of we've been working on this for some time put together a whole bunch of data and development indicators and you can look at kind of the distance to the border and distance to capital so you can have two places that are otherwise identical where the distance to the block capital has now changed and what we're able to document over time is that there is a significant acceleration in the development indicators in places that became closer and therefore it kind of there is empirical evidence now broadly pointing towards the value of bringing government closer to the people okay so and you can do that too ways. One is you can take the powers of an existing level of government and bring that level itself closer, which is what happened in blocks to mandals. Or you can say, let's take an existing disempowered level of local government and give it more power. Okay, So so I think in both of these cases, whether it's kind of smaller states or smaller districts, right? I mean, there is a case for thinking about it seriously because the population has been growing and the capacity is not kept up. Okay, So that's one simple thing. I think the second thing is in terms of again, at the government of India level, is kind of really, you know, m- modifying and rethinking centrally sponsored schemes, right? I mean, and it's not just a question, it's not just a question of getting rid of them and spending the budgets. There are very good reasons for centrally sponsored schemes, right? Including kind of sometimes from an equity perspective, the money that comes from the centrally sponsored scheme becomes the most important way for a state to finance even its basic kind of operations, okay? So like Maharashtra GDP per capita is five times higher than Bihar, okay? So left to its own resources, Bihar simply wouldn't be able to fund an education system, okay? So that way, the centrally sponsored scheme plays a very important role. The problem is not in terms of the resource allocation. The problem is how rigid the guidelines are okay, with regard to how the money has to be spent. And so that has, again, like three or four problems, right? So one is the one 
size fit all nature of it, right? So Kerala might need high schools and colleges. Bihar might still need some elementary schools, but your national program kind of... Now, over time, as SSA became Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan, there is a bit more flexibility, but still, like, you know, Mota Moti, like, I mean, there are tight kind of guidelines which restrict the flexibility across states. The second problem is that because the centrally sponsored schemes have a co-financing model where the states have to put in, say, 50%, in some cases it's 50-50, is not only are you constraining the use of Government of India money, you're also constraining the state's own budget by saying that the matching funds have to be spent along these lines. Okay, so... Mm, that's another source of kind of infringing on state level autonomy. I think there is a third dimension of this, which is just an incredible amount of micromanaging going back to process level kind of, you know, micromanaging. And a senior advisor, Niti Ayog, once told me that, you know, in the health department under National Health Mission, that every year there's what is called a PIP, I think Project Implementation Plan or something, under which there are 1,500 permitted line items. So every year, every state has to submit this PIP that has to be reviewed and approved. So if you just think about the paperwork of 1,500, Hundred line items times 25, 28 states. So in the end, it just employs an army of consultants on one side to make the reports, an army of consultants on the other side to read them, but nothing substantively actually happens as a result of that, right? So it's just incredibly inefficient because you don't trust and because you micromanage and saying, ye karna, ye karna, ye karna, ye aapko report karna, right? So that's a third cost. And a fourth cost is frankly over time. And I mentioned this, I think, in the education episode. It has led to a substantial weakening of policy making muscles and capacity at the state level. Okay, which is essentially if if because and remember what I said, I said states are bigger than most countries, right? So you really should have the policy making capacity to think about your local problems and craft your local solutions. The problem today is if you're a principal secretary or commissioner who wants to do something innovative in the state, you are much more likely to do it if it is consistent with central government guidelines because then you can use that money. Whereas if you have to do something outside the guidelines, then you have to argue with your finance department, right? You need to get the money and that is a much more complex process, okay? So what has happened therefore is that while the centrally sponsored schemes have created the budgetary space for the social sector, they have also had come at severe costs. So, so one of the very, very concrete reform ideas which I have is again going back to this idea of, you know, autonomy and process and accountability for outcomes, okay? So whereby it's not just, see, in a way, the government of India faces exactly the same problem, say, that a World Bank faces when it's doing development aid, okay? Which is, you want to give money to the places that need it, okay? But the places that need it are also the poorest, most poorly governed, okay? And so, in a way, you put in all of these conditions because of the poor governance in the places that need it the most, but that also ends up biting the better off state that are well governed and frankly don't need your interventions okay so you know one intermediate level might just be performance based autonomy okay forget performance based financing to dur ki baat hai right i mean but just performance based autonomy that says i mean frankly today a government of tamil nadu or kerala will say what do we have to learn from government of india on education we're doing better on all of these indicators right like i mean so for the states that are doing better at least right i mean you might say here is money with fewer conditions and just report right you still have to report but mm, there is a lot that can be done. Now, of course, eventually, I think having an element of performance-based funding, again, going back to 70, 2010, right? That says, you know, here's government money. We're going to allocate this a certain amount equally by by child, a certain amount, an additional amount for underperforming or backward states that just allows them to build those gaps and 10% on performance, right? So that there is skin in the game for everybody to kind of innovate on delivering, right? So those would be kind of some of the reform ideas at the central level. So, you know, things. And then there is a third core reform idea at the central level, which draws on this business standard article I wrote in 2011, which really is, and, and the good news is more of this is happening, okay, more of this is happening. But it's to really unleash the states in terms of policy experimentation, okay. So when we think about you know, very contentious issues like land reform or labor reform or other things like that, you know, trying to do this at the government of India level is just too difficult, right, because there are multiple veto players, it's too risky. But you just say, listen, let states innovate and experiment. But remember, many of these issues are in the concurrent list, okay. So the government of India rules 
will still override the state government rules. So for the state government rules to take primacy within the state still requires presidential assent. So there is a provision for that. But government of India can encourage a lot more state level policy innovation in the concurrent list by kind of indicating that if you kind of provide a very clear rationale for this, right, and then we will be more willing to kind of support this for presidential assent. Okay, so those would be kind of concrete things that can happen at the government of India level. Then there's a lot more things that need to happen at the state level, right? And so, so one of the things there is this business, the nuanced decentralization I talked about, because that's completely within the remit of a state government, right? Because you control the people, you control the budgets. And so it's about how much am I empowering local governments? Similarly, investing in property tax capacity is something that a state government can do, right? I mean, that strengthens local government. And then, see, in some ways, the most radical reform would be kind of more empowered mayors, you know, which, which many people have talked about. Now, the interest thing here is one view okay is that chief ministers don't want to do this because it creates alternate power centers right I mean which is a threat to them so so just like in New York in the state of New York the mayor of New York is often more powerful than the governor of New York State who's sitting in Albany but New York City is the cash cow and that and that's where all the action is right so similarly an empowered mayor of Mumbai would become a real threat to the chief minister of Maharashtra in like Indonesia you know Jokowi became president of the country from mayor of Jakarta right like you know so that was kind of like a really important post and position but here is a way why I think empowered mayors can be political Politically incentive compatible, right? Which is one of the kind of design dysfunctions of our democracy right now is that we elect MLAs and MPs to be legislators, but their voters fundamentally see them as providing constituency services. Okay, so the voters are not evaluating them on did you pass good laws? The voters are evaluating them on did you make my life better? Okay, so part of the dysfunction of the system, why does an MLA or MP want the power to transfer people? Because even though we call that political interference, the flip side of that is it is that power to transfer that gives this guy any authority on the otherwise kind of, you know, indifferent official who may not listen. Okay. So in many ways, like I mean, the MLA or MPs are kind of dealt a very, very difficult hand where they are expected to deliver constituency services without being given the means to do that because all they have is this MPLAD which is a minuscule amount of money compared to the actual budgets of the departments, right? So what an empowered mayor does and why I hope there will be political demand for this, right? I mean, is that even if a chief minister is hesitant, like a bunch of MLAs themselves would prefer to be empowered mayors, like I mean, of their areas where there is kind of alignment of accountability and what the voters are holding, you know, so so in a way, voters are holding them accountable for constituency services, but they don't have the means to deliver that. So if you harmonize those things, it would also kind of, you know, strengthen our democracy by better aligning accountability with authority to deliver on that. So again, this is the kind of thing. The good news is that there is nothing that prevents a chief minister from undertaking these reforms within their state. Okay. So and why I think the level at which we need to have these reform conversations is now government of India can kind of, you know, they can do a few things like finance commission has put some incentives for states that increase their property taxes and stuff like that. And I think finance ministry has also done some of that, right? But fundamentally, this is a state level political action. Okay, so, you know, all it takes is one chief minister. Mm. And it's actually quite interesting in my conversations in Tamil Nadu, right? For example, informally, they will say that Kerala has done much better than us in decentralization. And this is something that we should consider. So I think, again, the desire and willingness to take up new ideas is there. I think the challenge is, how do you de-risk this? Okay, how do you de-risk this? Because nobody, even at a state level, tomorrow, see, NTR, they, like going from districts to Mandal, blocks to Mandal, this is a big change, right? That happens across the state. So even politicians who are well-meaning are often just risk of trying to do something massive that is irreversible. So one of the things which, you know, I, I briefly discuss, I mean, again, that's why each of these chapters can become an entire book, right? I mean, is to then see, are there kind of constitutional and legal mechanisms that allow some experiments to be done in a sub-region of the state as opposed to kind of doing it for the whole state. So then you might feel, okay, okay here's a couple of districts where I'm going to, or a couple of cities or tier two cities where we're going to experiment, you know, with more empowered mayors. So I think in each of these things, the issue, the question, and, and, and I'll come back to see, to see just at the end, is that I, this is a broader meta point I want to make, right? I mean, which is that 
part of the reason a lot of these changes don't happen is we are just not having the conversations across the different stakeholders in the system. Okay, so, you know, and leave the politicians out for a moment, right? Even just academia, industry and bureaucracy. Okay, so when I look at the, go to these policy conferences, there are so many low hanging fruit of policy area where better academic research and analysis can immediately improve outcomes. Okay, the problem is that <clears throat> The academics have no patience for the bureaucrats and the bureaucrats have no respect saying the academics are sitting in the theoretical world. Like, I mean, they are not working on problems we care about. And then industry thinks academics are too esoteric and bureaucrats are too slow. So, but again, everybody has a stake, right? I mean, in moving this stuff together. Now, we do have certain fora of these conversations, you know, CII will, you know, get together, industry, government, whatever. But I think part of how we move forward is by marrying kind of a certain amount of conceptual clarity with a very real understanding of what are the risks of the reform and thinking about ways of de-risking the reforms, okay? And accompany that with a certain amount of implementation support, which is partly why we're building sieges. And then also accompany that with evaluation and research to say like, you know, are the reforms working? So in a way, like, if you look at the uh, the different parts of the production function of knowledge to action, right? There is kind of, act, there is deep research that says, okay, what is the impact of a specific policy? Then there's policy recommendations that say, based on all of this research, here are reforms we should do. Then there is kind of, you know, implementation support that says, if you want to do this, how do you actually make it happen? And then you need to close the loop back with research and evaluation to saying, Ye humne kya hai? did this actually move us in the right direction? And if not, how do we course correct quickly, right? So so, so yeah, so that's my long-winded way of kind of saying how I see us making progress on these things. And the good news again is that bilaterally, right, at the political level, at the bureaucratic level, I the amount of support I see, I mean, there's property taxes, right? I mean, you say, oh yes, ye karna hai humko. But the problem for your typical bureaucrat they are just firefighting. I don't think any of us understands how much pressure, right? Like, you know, a, say a principal secretary of finance is under, right? I mean, these are people controlling budgets of about 200,000 crores and the sheer amount of pressure they are under, right? is just, you know, you're just constantly firefighting, right? Constantly firefighting. So when you go in with kind of both a conceptual clarity and an implementation roadmap and some support, I'm seeing that people are actually very, very, very willing to listen. So yeah, so we have to be optimistic and keep trying. You've you've made me incredibly sympathetic towards the principal secretary of finance who's constantly firefighting about what to do with two thousand crores. Man, what a problem! Why you should never have that no, problem. No, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. <laughs> like you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, and, and no, I'm very excited with these ideas. As you can see, I'm swaying back and forth in my chair. But that could also be because the moment you said everybody has a stake, I, I felt hungry. So, you know, and just thinking aloud, you know, one way of politicians becoming risk averse about politicians feeling that we can move ahead with this, we know it's the right thing to do, but now we can actually do it, is if there is a public constituency for these ideas. Like, in a sense, we need public intellectuals like yourself to be the Gandhis of good ideas, right? And which is why I hope your book does really well. And at some point, you know, maybe YouTube is series karo, ye karo, wo karo. We should brainstorm sometime because, you know, I think for real change to happen, you need to hit the demand end of the political marketplace. Uh, the supply end can sometimes be a bit shaky. So sort of last question on federalism in these reforms until our next episode. <laughs> last question in this episode is, uh, you know, uh, uh, how, uh, you, you know, in percentage terms, because I think rather than say how optimistic are you, you'll say, ha, I'm optimistic. So many people are good people. They want change. But if I ask you to put a number on it and say that what is uh, in percentages, what is the chance that by 2030, you know, enough of these changes would have been implemented for you to feel that there has been, you know, a meaningful progress. You know, what would be that percentage chance? And frankly, honestly, even if it's 1%, I would still say it is worth trying because the impact of that would be so massive that it's, you know, positive EV just to try for that. So uh, I'm not going to judge by percentage. I'm just, um, you know, trying to get a sense of how likely you feel it is by asking you for a number. No, see, I think, I mean, so I don't think I have a number in the, for the following reason, right? Which is, <clears throat> and I I can come back and you know talk about sieges as well a little bit more. See, the way I'm approaching this is what <clears throat> maximizes the probability, right? Mean that a lot of these things will happen, right? So the book is laying out an entire menu of reform ideas, right? So some of them will catch fire somewhere, others will not. Some will fall completely flat and nobody will pick up anything, right? But then 
what we're seeing as CJS is that there is already so much appreciation of the work that we're doing, right? I mean, uh, and, you know, again, I, I, would, I prefer the government to kind of talk about it rather than me talk about it, but I'll just say that there is... There are enough indicators of real revealed preference, right? I mean, in terms of the cross conversations happening across states and people calling us and stuff like that. So I feel actually very optimistic that out of this broad agenda, we will do maybe somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of these ideas in at least one state, okay? And over 10 years, right? Because, like they say, people, you underestimate what you can, you overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate what you can do in 10 years, right? I mean, so which is partly why, you know, I see this as a 10, 20 year investment, right? I mean, in the kind of reforms, but I'm actually. I'm very optimistic and it's not just, you know, and okay, I mean, now to be realistic in terms of the nature of even government officials or bureaucracies, right? I mean, is that, see, there are 20, and this I'm just generalizing, right? But in most orgs, there are about 20% who are really outstanding, okay? Who kind of are thinkers, who are well-intentioned, motivated, really, really kind of want to get stuff done. There's about 60%, I would say, like, you know, who are good, but over time have had the enthusiasm beaten out of them, right? I mean, and so they have essentially kind of doing, you know, not doing bad things, but not going out of the way to kind of, you know, take on... Mm, Things. They're kind of minding the store. And then there's always the 10 to 20 percent, you know, who are actually kind of the malevolent actors or at least who have kind of figured out how to milk the current system, who are therefore very nervous, like, you know, of certain changes. But, you know, the good news, what I'm seeing in many states, and maybe this is, again, reflecting the fact that the main place I interact with is finance, is that most states actually put really good people in finance because finance is not something you can afford to mess with because, you know, <clears throat> you see Sri Lanka, you see other things like states go bankrupt. OK, so in fact, in many of the states that we work in, the finance has a certain amount of both sanctity and competence, right? I mean, so yeah, so maybe that's why we are seeing a positive reaction because every finance secretary is kind of, so a different way of saying this is that almost all of our public discourse happens on kind of quantity of expenditure to sectors. We just have much less discussion on the quality of expenditure, right? I mean, and the core thing we're doing is about improving that quality. And that's something that any finance secretary instinctively understands. And so if you are able to support that, you know, <clears throat> people have been very, very uh, uh, positive about it. Now, of course, all the ideas eventually have to go through political filters and stuff like that. But, you know, the the... And even as an economic advisor, I think Arun Jaitley once said this about Arun Subramaniam. He said, you know, his job is to present ideas. We don't have to accept all of them, right? I mean, but we will listen. And that's the most you can ask for, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that's kind of what this podcast does. <laughs> Our job is to press, talk about ideas. Other people can only listen. Uh, so and may, let, and let, may choose listen. to, and may choose to, you know, do something or not. But yeah, and and they choose to listen, and they're still here, four plus hours into the thing. And why are they here? They're here because we haven't discussed your paper yet. You said it's the most important <laughs> paper you've done. We haven't discussed it yet. We cannot, we cannot disappoint them at this moment in time. So uh, briefly, briefly, you know, I I, I, yeah. I I know you're tired. I know you're tired. I don't want to, I, I don't want to mess with you too much. India needs you. Take care of your health. Don't get COVID again. So tell us about uh, your NREGA paper and, uh, you know, yeah, no, I think, you know, why it's so exciting. Yeah, so I mean, we can have much, lo if at some point we do an episode just on welfare and social protection, we can have a longer discussion. But see, I think the core, so what is the paper doing? Okay, the paper is presenting large scale randomized experiment evidence of what happens to the overall economy when you improve the implementation of NREGA, okay? So now NREGA itself as a program when it was rolled out was not randomized, okay? So the best evaluations to date have relied on what's called a difference in difference where you look at districts that got it with districts that did not. But the problem is those districts were not randomly selected, right? So there's other pre-existing differences. And the other problem is that there wasn't a big round of the NSS at that time. So you actually haven't had good enough data on many of the outcomes we care about. So the literature in NREGA itself has had, you know, what my co-author Sandeep Suktankar calls, Suktank, what we call Suktankar's third law of NREGS, right? Which is for every study that finds X, there are studies that find minus X or zero. Okay, so, and that's part of the challenge with research because the results are sensitive to the method, sensitive to the data, sensitive to the state. And that's been a, a, a big challenge. So the opportunity in this paper was, and frankly, this was a bit of an accidental paper. We're not expected to write it. The reason it's an accidental paper was 
the randomized control trial we did was actually designed to study an intervention to reduce corruption and improve implementation. Okay, so that paper, which was published in the American Economic Review in 2016, was called Building State Capacity, and that was studying in unified Andhra Pradesh in eight districts, randomized across a population of about 20 million people. It was studying the effectiveness of biometric smart cards on improving NREGA uh, implementation. Okay, so the outcome there was really just NREGA implementation, which is how much, you know, did you get your money? So we measure leakage very carefully because we measure the administrative data on how much money was dispersed to a given job card and we do matched household surveys to measure did you actually get it? Okay, so part of the problem with the public discourse on say Aadhaar or biometrics and leakage is that the government says we have reduced leakage because we have reduced the spending. Okay, the activists will say yes, but you have increased exclusion because the money, you know, people are not getting. So unless you have matched data between the government dispersals and what people are getting, you are only seeing half the side of the puzzle, right? So, so the methodological, I mean, the strength of that paper is A, we have randomized, so across eight districts at the mandal level. So in fact, statistically, this is why it's lovely to work in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, because you can randomize at the mandal level and get a large sample because you have four times as many mandals districts. So, but that was a side benefit, right? That's not why we were there. We were there because I'd worked in the state before. But and AP was one of the leaders in NREGA. Okay, so but long story short, that paper, which is was done in 2016, essentially finds that the smart cards had a dramatic positive effect in improving both kind of, in reducing corruption, improving timeliness of payments, and improving the predictability of payments, okay? So in every way, and that's why that paper is called Building State Capacity, because it brings the program closer to what the framers of the law intended it to do, okay? So that's what that paper does. Now, the, how this paper emerged was really as an accident and going back to what I'm saying, you know, as researchers, the joy is in discovering new facts and then making sense of it, right? So this is really an example of that journey, right? We had not expected to find these results or write this paper. So one of the results we were looking at in 2015 or 2014 was looking at the impact on total incomes of the poor in the treated areas, okay? And what you saw was that there was this huge increase in income, okay? And the increase in income was 10 times higher than the increase in NREGA income. Because remember, we've reduced corruption in NREGA. You've reduced the work done and pays. So there is obviously an increase in NREGA income, okay? But what's interesting is that the total income increase goes up about 12 to 13 percent, and only 10 percent of that is coming from NREGA. The remaining 90 percent seems to be coming from other sources, okay? And so that became this huge puzzle and it was such a big puzzle that we realized that we could not do justice to that in the previous paper. Okay, so that previous, so this is then, I mean, this is something Paul Sandeep and I have been working on now for about 14 years. Okay, we started 2009. Okay, so to give you a sense of what the academic life looks like, two papers, okay, two major papers we worked on for 14 years. Okay, so, you know, we... Mm, we thought and designed the experiments. We worked with the government to get the buy-in. We raised the funding for it. We did the randomization. There were two years from 2010 to 2012 where the actual experiment happened. You had end-line data collection in 2012. Then it took us kind of, you know, a year to clean and analyze the data, start writing the first draft, start presenting in conferences, getting feedback, iterating, submitted for publication in 2014. Then you get the revise and resubmit from the journals, finally appears in print in 2016. Okay, so that is that first paper. The genesis of the second paper starts in about 2015 when we start seeing that these income effects are so big and we're like how on earth do you make sense of this okay and then what was really kind of interesting was that we see that the private sector income has gone up very sharply in both agriculture and non-agriculture. We see that the market wage has gone up. And then the most kind of stunning result is that not only has the wage gone up, but private sector employment has also gone up, okay, which is kind of violating Econ 101, which is normally when wages go up, employment goes down, okay? So how could wages and employment both go up, okay? So, <clears throat> so long story short, I think we have ourselves puzzled and struggled, right? I mean, and in fact, in the early years, so this paper we had first written and presented at uh, one of the top conferences in 2016, and we thought we had enough in those results because it was randomized, right? Because the experiment was randomized, so we thought we had enough on those results to merit a top journal publication, right? So we submitted then, you know, to the QGE. Now, these are intricacies of the academic publication process, which is, you know, the quarterly journal of economics. And we get, we got a very kind of, you know, sympathetic rejection saying that everybody thought that the question was important, everything was important. 
important. But basically, people felt the results were too big. Okay, that they just couldn't make sense of it, and they wanted us to probe harder on the mechanisms. Okay, of what is happening, what is the mechanism by which both wages and employment could go up, and because the result is so counterintuitive. And this goes back to the peer review process because the result is so counterintuitive. I think it's natural for reviewers to pressure test more, okay, and saying, "Is there some mistake, right, in your data collection and your sampling and stuff like that?" So, long story short. We got rejected at both the QJE and the AER, the American Economic Review, which are two of the top publications. And then we went back to the drawing board because we really had a sense that this result was truly important, right? And this is where the value of the randomized control trial comes in. Because suppose the result was just correlational, I would always say, okay, maybe the result is spurious because of some omitted variable, okay? But because this was randomized, there is no questioning the facts. It's like Sherlock Holmes says, right? If the facts change, then you change your mind. And that's again the power. of the rct in this case was because the facts were incontrovertible right so we then had to go back and question our assumptions of how do you make sense of the fact okay and if you go back to econ theory you'll see that basically how can wages and employment both go up they can go up for multiple reasons they can go up if the enrega assets made people more productive okay they could go up if basically if there was employer market power okay with monopsony so this is the Kind of a very nuanced kind of result, but essentially, a monopolist is kind of going to suppress quantity and jack up price. A monopsonist, who's a single buyer, if you have market power, you will keep the wage low and keep employment also low. So historically, if you look at the origins of trade unions and why unions in the 19th century UK were a good thing for both equity and efficiency, is that if you have a monopsonist buyer, then putting market power on the side of the employees actually improves both wages and employment up to a point. Okay, it's only when you go over that that it becomes kind of you know then it's an insider rent seeking business. Okay, so the the theoretical mechanisms were could there be monopsony and then the there is an aggregate demand effect. Okay, which is that if the poor have more income, like I mean, and if they're demanding local goods and services, then that could create a demand one multiplier in the local economy. Okay, so but then we had to go back to the drawing board to figure out how would we test all of these possible hypotheses and mechanisms. Correct. So. Mm, The first kind, and again, we got very lucky in some ways that the experiment happened 2010 to 2012, and this was a period when the social economic cost census happened in late 2011, and the economic census happened in 2013. See, one of the this is now very technical, but one of the challenges for us was that our data in our survey we were sampling from the universe of Enrega job card holders. Okay, so that is 50 percent of the population, but we didn't have survey data from the employers. Okay, from the landlords. So even If wages here are going up, maybe there is enough offset there that the net effects could be negative. Okay, so how do you truly say that the effects are positive? So. For that, we need to get census data that goes beyond our survey. So we got lucky that the SECC is a census, the economic census is a census, and this happened late 2011, 2013. So long story short, this is a bit like a I keep saying that, but it is a bit of a detective story, right? Because I'm giving you a sense of both the results and the journey of how we got there, right? So now, what happens with the SECC data, which is really nice, is that we have. Data on every individual in the village, correct? But it also gives you the land holdings, and so that allows you to construct a measure of landholder concentration in every village, which is then a measure of monopsony and a measure of employer market power. Okay, and what we're able to test and show is that the employment effect of improving Enrega. Is more positive in areas where there is more employer market power, which is completely consistent with the monopsony story. Okay, and so then that gives you the smoking gun evidence on the mechanism. And then what's very interesting is because our survey data is not like the NSS. We didn't have very detailed data on consumption, okay, but we had good data on savings, and you see that people are spending most of this extra money, right? And so we also find evidence of this demand multiplier because what you see in the economic census is there is an increase in the number of non-agricultural firms and an increase in the employment in these firms, and most of these are very, very, very small local firms, okay? So, and again, this goes back to so the reason I, you know, I'll come back to why I think the paper is kind of why I personally find it the most important paper is because it also 
connects to many, many old classic issues in development, right? That that when people are very, very poor, you can get these kind of demand externalities whereby you can kind of crowd in a positive cycle of kind of firm creation as well. And, you know, so anyway, long, and then there's a bunch of other work in terms of mechanisms and credit and all of this. So that's why it's, you know, but a, a paper like this and the journal restricts us to 40 to 45 pages and then we've got about 60 pages of appendices, right? I mean, with each appendix going through different robustness, building a formal model of brutal labor markets, quantifying the extent of employee market power. And so, yeah, so I think, you know, the journey of the paper is after we did all of this, I think in 2019, with uh, 2019, yes, we sub- this is, again, giving you a sense of how long these things take. You know, submit to Econometrica, right, which is uh, another of the most prestigious journals. So three referees, but then I think the editor got caught with COVID and health issues and stuff. So it took 11 months to come back. Then it took us 11 months to kind of sub- uh, do the revision, including most of last summer, because we took three m- entire months months just redoing so much of the analysis. Then there is this very cool piece of analysis we did, which will then bring me back to how this is connected to federalism. Okay, so because that was the context in which I sent you the paper, you know, is that one of the cool things we were able to do in the revision is that we were able to do a full distributional analysis in the following way, right? Because remember, I told you we only have data on NREGA job card holders, which is only 50% of the population, okay? But what we were able to do is even in that NREGA sample, it turns out that the returns to land actually fall, okay? Because if wages have gone up and productivity has not gone up, then somebody has to lose, okay? And prices have not gone up. So it turns out that land profits do fall, okay? Like, I mean, in areas with better implemented NREGA, and what we can do is we can take that result and overlay that on the SECC land distribution because SECC gives you the entire distribution and that provides this very nice distributional analysis that shows that the aggregate effects are positive, but the bottom 92% of the population does much better, okay? But the top 7.5% of top landholders do lose because their loss of profits is greater, okay? Like, I mean, than the gain in income. And that connects us back to the political economy of local elites and distribution, right? That even though this was a program that on aggregate improved both equity and efficiency, it did come at the cost of local power structures and which is why there was so much vociferous opposition from land Lords, okay, like him to this, which is documented both by you know Drez and 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 Ritika Kera and others, but in fact, there's this other beautiful American Economic Review paper by Ashok Kotwal and co-authors. In fact, he just passed away recently, and he was a giant in you know in economics. And this was a paper called Clientelism in Indian Villages, where they study local elections in Maharashtra very, very carefully. And one of the points they make is that the entire reason local elites want to control local governments is that they want to thwart the implementation of programs like NREGA. Okay, so, and you can see how this connects all the way back to our federalism loop, right? I mean, that a progressive state that wants to improve outcomes for the most marginalized has to deal with the resistance that will come from local elites. And what made NREGA, what improved NREGA implementation, see, even today in Bihar and other places, the feudal structure has been too strong for NREGA to be effectively implemented, right? So it took a political decision in Andhra to prioritize NREGA implementation. The chief minister put one of their top officers as rural development secretary for five years to kind of continuously push on different aspects of NREGA implementation. So there's another whole book uh, recently by uh, Rajesh Viraragavan called Patching Development. And he talks both about the top down and how the implementation itself took kind of very strong political and bureaucratic will. And a lot of this required top down technological interventions and bottom up mechanisms of social audits, whereby you did bring the community in, but you empowered them by kind of creating a directorate of social audit within the department and then gave people the power to go and audit whether these projects were actually taking place, right? So even something as... You know, what sounds like, oh, this is just implementation. It's an enormous undertaking, right, to take a program like this that is upending local power structures and how do you implement that? And this is then circles back with why the research is so important and why do I consider this the most important paper? It's because because it proved my initial hypothesis wrong, right? I mean, so my initial hunch in the 2000s was that this is kind of, you know, that it cannot be good for the economy to boost wages without boosting productivity, right? And the fact that we found this was positive It was positive in the experimental results. So that forces us to go back and question our priors. Think about what is the data that will allow us to test these things. And then it's a detective story, right? Like, I mean, and then... 
One initial hypothesis we had was maybe it's the Enrega assets, okay, that are building productivity. But then you go look at the data and do some calibrations and it turns out it is not the assets, okay? So anyway, so this is now getting into the weeds of the paper and people can read 100 pages if they want, or at least 45 pages of it. And then, you know, we just got our second round revise and resubmit and, you know, we spent 11 months and given how grumpy referees tend to be, like, you know, one of the gratifying things was the referee report starting with, I have been very impressed by the amount of work the authors have done like in this paper but this then gives you an example of why books get delayed because that is still my core job right of kind of actually writing these research papers <laughs> no it it just sounds like such an amazing paper because it's not just about economics it's also about society it's also about politics like this is a heck of a detective story i mean if it's a web series who would you like to play you <laughs> I haven't thought about that at all. <laughs> Think about it. Now I'm going to put you on the spot. What is this? Think about it. Who would you like uh, to play you? No, no you. I, I'm. I'm just not good at this. But yeah, eventually, like you know, maybe, yeah, maybe you are the creative guy. You can think about somebody who would be excited about this. But I don't. I don't watch enough TV or or movies to immediately have a name. I, see, again, part of the academic temperament is to say I don't know when I don't know. Like you know, so you can't force me to answer something I don't know. Okay, I'll. I'll. Uh, you can tell me in song in the ne next Antakshari we do for the next episode, and I, I'm just uh, like 14 years on two papers. My God, and uh, you but know that's this, not this the only thing that's happening, right? I mean, it is. I mm. mean, there are a whole bunch of other things that happen, but I think part of the research process is that there is this constant process of discovery, rediscovery, and I think the one thing in economics that's different from other fields is many other fields publish very short papers with new facts. Here's an experiment. The thing in economics is because. There is this need to not just get the result, but at least for the top journals to really probe into mechanisms and saying, because you don't get published in a top journal if this was just about Enrega in India, right? It is what is it illustrating about the mechanisms of rural labor markets? What is it illustrating about the mechanisms of some of these demand externalities, etc.? So, you know, it just takes a lot more probing, probing, probing and coming back to being uh, you know, this is an example where I think the peer review process has been fantastic because it has improved the paper so much because we have been pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, but we've had to also work our backsides off to do it. Amazing. Let me ask you a question. Let's see how good an economist you are. Can you answer this? <laughs> and the question is, although the IPL and NREGA are completely different things, what is the one thing they have in common? I <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tell my friends ki, somebody asked me the other day who is this Karthik Mudlidhar and I said Dekna, one day he will win the Nobel Prize for Economics maybe for this paper only that will be nice not for something you said on my podcast obviously and you failed this question but the answer is this that see uh, the BCCI like all sporting bodies is basically a monopsony if you're a cricketer you can't sell your services to anybody else but the BCCI so now what do you do to break the system and in this case the BCCI did it themselves it wasn't imposed from elsewhere. They started the IPL, you know, and what did the IPL do? It raised wages and employment. Huh. So there you go. That's what you have in common. You know, <laughs> Dr. Jean Drez will suddenly turn on his TV and start watching the IPL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, okay, okay. IPL is basically, yeah, that's creating a whole new market. But yes, I know. I, but, it, but it highlights again, you know, if I can, you know, take a minute and go into the social protection chapter, right? Like, I mean, why I think, you know, we need to think about our welfare spending, A, in a much more nuanced way, and B, in a fundamentally empirical way, right? I mean, which is we think about, okay, sare welfare programs, like, you know, is either freebies or, you know, again, the right things, they are freebies, the left things, we don't do enough, okay? Um, and again, the basic point is that if you look at something like farm electricity subsidies, right, those are probably the single worst financial policy we have in the country, right? Because it is bad, you know, when I look at quality of welfare expenditure, you think about targeting, you think about delivery, you think about distortions, right? So it's miserable on targeting because top 5% of farmers get 50% of the benefits. The bottom 50% of landless owners basically get nothing. So though you call it farmer welfare, it's really like I mean, a slice of elite farmers. Second is in terms of going back to your episode with Ajay and Akshay on electricity reform, right? I mean that the dysfunction of our discoms is partly hidden behind free electricity, right? Because that allows them to cover their TND losses and saying, to free hai, recovery nahi ho hai. so your discom crisis is kind of partly coming from there. And then you have your ecological crisis of 
of the downstream, the water crisis that's happening because of the suboptimal kind of cultivation, right? So kind of, and then going back to trust. So in a way, this was not about farm laws per se, because farm laws wasn't really taking on this issue of subsidy reform, which is way more complicated, right? But I think why a program like PM Kisan is important is that once you can build the trust with farmers, that the state in fact can deliver money to you, right? I mean, and does this a few times, then it gives you at least some political space of crafting a reform idea, which again, I have in the expenditure chapter of kind of saying, can I take the fiscally same amount of subsidy and kind of give it to you as a DBT, like, you know, but then with metering and billing of the electricity. So it's not about saving money, but it's at least about reducing the distortions, right? So that's the kind of reform that we need as a country. It requires both kind of conceptual architecture, it requires communication, it requires trust, but, you know, hopefully we'll build enough of a public consensus around something like that that needs to happen. Conversely, something like Enrega has been something that improves both equity and efficiency, right? So you have welfare spending that's bad for equity and efficiency, welfare spending that's good for both. And there are others that are good for equity, bad for efficiency, vice versa, that reasonable people can d- disagree. But at least as a country, if we can agree on moving from this bottom left quadrant where things are bad for equity and efficiency to things that are good on equity and efficiency, that's again one of the ways in which you move the arc towards delivering more value for money. Fabulous. And, you, and I completely agree with you about free electricity for farmers being a bad thing. And one of the illustrations of that, and it's a classic scene in the unseen, is that, you know, in Punjab, the farmers were incentivized to grow rice because of an MSP for rice, right, which they otherwise would not have because of uh, market dynamics. But it's a, it's an arid land. Rice needs a lot of water. What do they do? They use bore wells mm-hmm. to get the water out of the ground. And how do they run these bore wells? Because electricity is free. So, you know, you have MSPs and free electricity distorting the whole marketplace you have a lot of rice what happens with uh, when they produce a lot of rice they've got rice stubble at the end of the season to get rid of how do they get rid of it the easiest way for them is to burn it what happens when they burn it the fumes go to delhi and exacerbates the delhi fog so the worst of the delhi fog happens when farmers in punjab are burning rice and uh, you know again seen in the unseen all of these sort of connections floating around but you know leave and and (laughs) something like that is an almost impossible problem of the political economy to solve because a Punjab politician can't piss the farmers off so what do you do it's just so incredibly complicated but a a couple of sort of final questions and one is you know and both are actually in the personal realm but one is the good news for all my listeners that uh, Mr. Karthik Muridharan is shifting to India (laughs) You know, putting skin in the game, as it were. So, tell me a little bit about, you know, this... Already people are jumping. I can hear listeners in advance. So, <laughs> now, so tell me a little bit about, you know, what prompted you to come back to India? What will you be doing here? No, and I think, again, I feel like your show is, you know... I mean, there is a certain amount of commitments I'm making and then hopefully following through on them, like, you know, once... I think, like, you know, I said this in 2020, right? I mean, that I, you know, that I feel that I'm at this inflection point where so far my life has been nine months US, three months India. And it's not like I'm moving back fully, but I'm just flipping that around to nine months India, three months US. Okay, so um, so basically I have over a year of accumulated sabbatical. I have grants that buy out some of my teaching. And so, and I think, you know, at a function, so basically it'll mean that we're moving to Chennai. I'll, we're, we're getting there September 1st. And the, big, and, and the big marker of moving is that the kids will be in school in India, right? I mean, in Chennai. So that's really the big marker. It's not like I'm just coming on sabbatical, like, you know, they'll be there. And I will, you know, be back for 10 weeks a year and do my teaching in the US. So, you know, so that way I'm still using professor that's kind of my main job but the big thing I'll be doing in India in addition to kind of you know uh, not just hopefully finishing the book and getting it out but doing a lot more dissemination work of getting the ideas out in a much more you know accessible way right I mean spending time in Indian universities giving talks doing stuff like that um, but also it's really building out sieges right because sieges is now you know like that's the skin in the game. That's the walk the talk kind of piece of this whole enterprise, right? I mean, which is it's one thing to have a bunch of ideas, but you really, and and I don't have money. What I have is time, right? I mean, so the way I put skin in the game is committing my time to things that I think are truly important. And, um, you know, this, uh, so I can say a little bit more about CGIS now, right? Which is the Center for Effective Governance of Indian States. Um, you know, we're a nonprofit that works with state governments, usually in partnership in the finance departments, right? I mean, to just try and slowly, right? Very, very gently um, start implementing some of these principles in areas of kind of low hanging fruit. And the key USPs, you know, because there's both intellectual and conceptual clarity and therefore a certain credibility with the government and being a nonprofit allows us to, you know, I think unlike a consultant, See, I mean, consulting firms are constantly dependent on government contracts. So you have two problems there, right? Beyond the confidence and confidence intervals quip I made, like, you know, I mean, it's that. So one is 
because you are a paid vendor, right? I mean, you only execute what you're told in a very tactical way, right? But you don't kind of actually take on a broader thing of what should be done. And the second problem is again, yeah, because the the consultants in some case, in some ways, are not interested in state capacity, right? They want state dependency because that's what creates the contracts, right? That's kind of what you're interested in. And because you know we're coming in as a nonprofit with a deep commitment to improving state capacity. So, for example, in Telangana, which is where we started work, and mainly because a lot of this just requires trust, right? I mean, and so um, the current principal secretary of finance, you know, was commissioned in school education in 2004 when I first started working in the state, right? So they know that there's a long-term commitment when I'm there, right? Um, and so, but one of the things we've done there is that the government has seconded a bunch of its own staff to this unit so that they are getting trained in the data analysis in the ways we're doing things. And so, um, yeah, so that's kind of building up in a big way. We added, we've added one state a year, right? It was the Telangana, then Delhi, then Tamil Nadu, Assam, uh, and there's demand now from three or four other states. So I think the biggest thing I'm going to be doing is really, you know, this Vijay and team are building the org, but I will function more in the realm of ideas of saying, you know, here is what we need to do. How do we build kind of the broader understanding of what needs to happen? So that's the hope, you know. So and then at a personal level. Like I said, normally I come to India every three months. In the pandemic, I've come only twice in two and a half years. So I just want to go back to the field. I just want to reconnect. I want to be in the field, going back to schools, going back to clinics, going back to panchayat secretaries and just, you know, just really, really reconnecting. And that's what I'm hoping to do. Fantastic. More power to you. And and, and one suggestion regarding uh, sort of uh, the, the writing you do moving forward is that why don't you start a newsletter, you know, where you write every week. And I'm serious. It, it, and it doesn't have to be about ideas or research or study. Just start something personal where you talk about how your week was, something interesting you read, something interesting you did. And, and I'm, since I'm saying this uh, sort of on a forum where others can hear this uh, advice that I'm giving to you, I'd actually give this advice to everyone. I think uh, f for most people, it's a good idea because it's a good way to always be thinking about stuff getting their mind working moving the writing muscle you don't of course need those things because you uh, do uh, think about stuff enough and write enough but you know just as a way of writing it's sort of a way of thinking aloud like one of the fascinating things that i find about twitter is that if you curate your feed properly you get access to some of the brightest minds in the world thinking aloud for your benefit what a privilege that is and if someone like you writes a newsletter as well uh, you know uh, other people get that in side they get to know the person they become more receptive to the ideas therefore you're going on a journey you're taking them with you you know maybe they would have been with you on your 14 year journey of writing these papers so uh, a serious suggestion i'd give which you can uh, think about and meanwhile you know the uh, you know the mandatory sort of last question would you like to uh, recommend you know books films music uh, uh, which you haven't recommended before because I've completely forgotten if I asked you this in previous episodes and you recommended stuff. But whatever is top of the mind these days, what are you enjoying? Uh, you know, what gives you joy? Yeah, and, you know, and again, I, I, I think what I said last time was that I'm listening to podcasts much more than reading books. And so, I, you know, the, there's... There's a whole new list of your favorite episodes, you know, I think, which I just really enjoyed so much. I think, and particularly, I think you've been doing a great job of, you know, of, of, of just having more women on the show. And I've just loved, you know, whether it's, whether it's Shrayana, whether it's uh, Nehlanjana, whether it's uh, Nerupama Rao, who I know, Urvashi, you know, so all of these have been great episodes. I've loved, I think, the Sneaky Artist one, the one with Mrinal Pandey was great. I've just loved so many of these episodes, right? Because I just walk, so walk and listen. And it's been fun because, like I said, I connect the dots. Um, I'm sometimes learning new things. There's just so much from new perspectives. For example, you know, I think the the more artistic people, right, who you talk to, who I think clearly at one level are very suspicious of, you know, markets and efficiency and commoditization and scale. You know, I think the episode with An Anupurna was great, right? Like, you know, about just the making those Japanese, yeah. right? Because it's all, it is not about scale. It is not about cost effectiveness. It is not about, it is about kind of, you know, that intrinsic beauty and the, the slowness is part of what it's about, right? I mean, so I think it's just... I, coming from kind of a productivity paradigm, right? I mean, the way I do, I think kind of just hearing those has just been, you know, I mean, it's not like I don't have that part of me with my love of music and all of that stuff, but it's just very nice to uh, to just hear those pieces, right? Uh, so yeah, I think in terms of books, you know, more recently, I think in the context of federalism, in fact, I mean, the one thing, again, which 
I thought you would ask, which I did want to cover a little bit, right? I mean, is as we think about India 75, you know, you you ask the hope and despair type question, you know, the things about, so there are some things I am, you know, there's one thing I'm very concerned about, which I do want to talk about. Uh, but in thinking about federalism, I actually, there's this little volume by Madhav Khosla that he puts together, like, you know, letters to chief ministers, uh, where it was just mind blowing to me that Jawaharlal Nehru used to write letters every 15 days to every chief minister. Okay. And he did this for pretty much 14, 15 years. Um, and like Madhav says, you know, I think the value of those letters is that when you read Nehru's books, they're all pre-independent. So they're really more of a political activist as opposed to kind of taking, so like they say, right, you campaign in poetry and govern in prose, right? I mean, so kind of taking the grand lofty ideas of the I, you know, of the idealist into the practical realities of running the government and seeing that discourse with the chief ministers. I mean, I just think it was, yeah, it's just wonderful in terms of what it shows about thoughtfulness, about inclusiveness, going back to what you were saying about, you know, writing every week. I mean, I never thought about that, but, you know, here, I, I say I don't have the time, but here was a prime minister making time to do that kind of writing, I mean, every 15 days. And it suggests that how important it was, partly as an act of self-reflection, partly as an act of communication. And I think the reason I want to call attention to that is going back to something else you said about kind of how our public space for dialogues and difficult conversations seems to have kind of shrunk, right? I mean, where people are talking past each other, you know, there's posturing, there's extremities, and how do you kind of find the middle? Um, so I found that quite nice. I, there's this other recent book, which I don't know if it's out yet, but I got a pre-copy from my friend Rahul Sagar, um, who's got, you know, two books. One is on Indian foreign policy and intellectual thought in the 19th century. The other one is called The Progressive Maharaja, which I think, is, I, so it, it's an incredible piece of historical de, uh, detective work. And it's it's uh, based on, you know, Sir Madhava Rao, who was the Diwan of Travancore and then the Diwan of Baroda. And it's a set of lessons in governance and statecraft, right? I mean, that he had put together for the young prince. And so what is great about it is it's kind of, you know, it's both deeply Indian, but also Western. And it reflects kind of, you know, what I hope an India will be, which is both kind of confident in what we are, but open to the best from around the world, right? I mean, and so I think that book, is yeah I mean and also it, it it kind of resonated with what I'm trying to do right now which is really I guess write a modern book on statecraft in some ways but more internally facing as opposed to aspects of externally facing so yeah I mean these are a couple of recent books which I've liked a lot well, wow, thanks a lot. And and uh, so I'll ask the hope this fair question since you prepared for it or no, have it, you already no, given the was, answer? No, it was not even prepared. You know, I mean, I think basically the, I think see the, oh, as we take stock about India 75, right? I mean, I think the, the thing, you know, the thing I do want to reflect on, and you've said a couple of times, it was not even about preparing, it was more connecting thoughts based on things you've said about, you know, what keeps the country together, right? I mean, what keeps the country together? And are there things that we are taking for granted? Are there fault lines that we need to be careful about, that we need to kind of do purposeful, deliberative thinking about these fault lines without assuming them away, okay? So, because they're, these are very complex issues that are coming down the turnpike, okay? So, I think the, the larger question about what keeps India together, I think, you know, Ram does justice to that. And there are themes of that in many of your episodes, right? Including including Chin on migration, right? I mean, just that sheer amount of internal migration connection, you know, keeps everything together, which is wonderful. I think there's something else which I don't know if it's been in an episode, but which I think is worth, uh, and this is interesting, right? Because Ram, the book is masterful, that last chapter on kind of why India survives is masterful. But, you know, it actually does have a bit of a blind spot, which I think speaks to some of the broader fault lines we face as a country right now, which is it completely ignores the, you know, so he does talk about religion, but says religion is not what unifies the country because we are not a religious state, which is true. But there is also a level where there is a cultural component of travel and pilgrimage, say, right? Like, you know, I mean that people just travel around the country. In one of the book references, in fact, which many of your readers may not have seen, is this wonderful book by Diana Eck, who's a professor of religion, Indian religion at Harvard, right? Like, you know, called India Sacred Geography. And um, she's got this lovely phrase there about saying that this is not a country unified by the power of kings and princes, but by the footsteps of its pilgrims, right? I mean, uh, and, you know, so, and growing up in Ahmedabad, I know how, for example, my South Indian relatives would come and go to Dwarka and go to Somnath. And that was an important part of coming to Gujarat, you know, whether it's going to Kashi, whether it's going to Rameshwaram. So I think, you know, that's there. And so, but the reason I'm saying all of 
this is that we have, going back to federalism and going back to the optimal size of countries and going back to what keeps India together, I think the there are many, many, many layers, right? So there is a modern, there are traditional reasons for why we are together, including, say, things like pilgrimage, there are reasons like migration, reasons like the modern institutions, whether it's the civil service. So all of these things have kind of played their own role in stitching together, right? The miracle that is India, okay? Uh, but we can't take it for granted. We can't take it for granted. And, you know, for example, there used to be this thing called National Integration Council, okay? And part of their job was precisely to constantly think about, you know, identifying and preempting fault lines, right? I mean, through kind of proactive action. So I think, as I think about India, what worries me the most is kind of the parliamentary delimitation, okay? Like, I mean, that may be coming up, right? And so that's the can we've kicked down for 50 years, right? With 71, there was a constitutional amendment and we've frozen representation at that 71 population. But if we were to redo this now, okay, based on population, uh, then effectively you are completely reshaping the political map of the country, right? In terms of the, the population ratios, if you were to keep Kerala as a constant, right? I mean, would have more than doubled in UP and Bihar, right? relative to and not just the south but parts of the west as well right so as we think about the grand federal compromise that's india and you can see why this is such a core tension right because there are democratic reasons to say that we need to not veer too far away from one person one vote okay so which would say that any delimitation is the right thing to do but that also goes deeply contra, right? Like I mean to kind of this federal um, spirit. And you can see, and because the South would then, you know, not just South, but the South and the West, right? I mean, is worse off both economically and politically, right? Like, and so how do we navigate this is going to require an enormous amount of political and, you know, an, an imagination to say, here are these principles that are in tension with each other. And how do we architect something that allows everybody to be better off, right? Right? I mean, and, but that requires, you know, genuine dialogue. It requires creating the space for dialogue. And I don't think it's something that, you know, this particular government is incapable of, right? I, I think Arun Jaitley is, you know, he shepherded GST through, partly through kind of a consultative temperament that listened to everybody, right? Like, I mean, and brought things together. And I do think that this is something that we should prepare for, right? I mean, and have either, you know, some body of experts, constitutional body, political representation to kind of, you know, so that it doesn't hit us out of nowhere. And then because once again, positions get entrenched, it'll be very, very difficult, right? Because, you know, if you have people saying, no, one person, one vote, we have to do this. Or others say, no, we had actually talked about population control, education, as a national goal and there are states that have met this and states that have not and if you were to follow delimitation you would completely change the federal contract so that I think is very very it's one of the most difficult problems I see coming down the turnpike and you know you can't just push it away right and so it's going to require both political and institutional imagination right so there are ways to kind of navigate this you know one you might say is listen we froze things in in 2001 and things have turned out fine like you know so mm, we can keep that and, you know, things have served us fine. The other is to say we are deviating more and more from the principle of one person, one vote. And so you need some modifications. And so then you could have, you could think about saying that maybe, right, you know, you think about the two houses of parliament, right? I mean, going back to the original purpose of Rajya Sabha as something represents it. So you're saying there are, maybe the Lok Sabha becomes population proportional and then, but the Rajya Sabha goes to kind of a fixed number per state or, you know, some hybrid so that there is a certain amount of vote voice that is kind of there for the less populous states. Or you could have formulae that look like saying we will freeze political representation the way it is, but on the fiscal side, allow the finance commission to start accounting for newer populations. Right? So anyway, so I'm just putting this out there as saying that, you know, I'm, India at 75 is an incredible achievement that, you know, we're all proud of, that we're all a part of. But I think I do worry, and this goes back to some of your older, you know, earlier questions about that are we shrinking the public space for the difficult conversations about, you know, where we are able to listen and really come up with win-win solutions or solutions that are effectively compromises that represent kind of the validity of different people's positions and how do you come up with something like that, right? And so, yeah, so not to be pessimistic, but I'm just saying that we, we cannot take these things for granted. And it does require constant purposeful engagement by the citizens and leaders of the country to kind of make sure that we continue to stay on track and get to full potential. 
I I couldn't agree with you more that we can't take it for granted and I think sometimes the mistake that we make is when we think of India as lines on a map that these are the lines on a map and you know this is what we are and and to me it's a little bit more than that and it's possibly too ne- nebulous to articulate precisely what my idea of India pompous words might be but uh, more and more I think we can't take it for granted because it is under threat you know when I see some of the fault lines in our society exploding today like the anti-muslim politics of today for example it makes me really worried about where it could go and you know if the worst case scenarios were to come about however low probability they might be what is the way out of that i worry about that as well i mean you know and even this whole sense of okay we've reached 75 years as this geographic entity in more or less these lines on a map minor modifications here and there uh, and china has nibbled away a bit of it recently but uh, this is kind of what we've got but i think it's it's only been 75 years that's not very long things don't last too long you know i think what uh, one of the biases we have is we think the present moment is permanent that everything will be as it is today and that is not really the case i mean one way in which it, which it could change which is a positive way is that you know technology has this push towards globalization where we can all be global citizens and it doesn't really you know nation states become more and more irrelevant they don't die or they don't vanish or something they just become more irre- irrelevant because individuals become empowered to join whatever collective they feel like in whatever way even if they pay taxes in a particular geography but another you know when i think about a delimitation for example i wonder if that can be you know if not handled properly can that be something that you know provides a trigger for the lines on the map changing and not looking the same and i don't even know if that would be a good thing or a bad thing like one musing that i think i brought it up in my episode with nilanjana which you mentioned you've heard is that what if at independence we weren't one large country like we are but a whole bunch of small countries you know uh, federalism by four as it were would it be better and would it be would it be worse and i can make arguments for either really so who knows where things are going i mean i once you know when i was a poker player wrote a column called unlikely is inevitable about the law of truly large numbers the, which basically states uh, that no matter how unlikely uh, uh, something is given a large enough sample size is bound to happen and i think given the sample size of time itself you know given the sample size of space we are one tiny planet in you know such a large <laughs> universe you know uh, millions of years have passed and we we've just you know gotten through 75 of those you know you cannot take anything for granted and you have to fight for what you believe in yeah, and no, which is which you, is in fact no, what but, you do but no but i want to be more optimistic right and again going back to one of your episodes i think it was uh, annapurna right i think in the end there was this thing about uh, knowledge and love and she talked about you know loving every part of this country right i mean having traveled you know having traveled around right i mean and so i do think that even though these are lines on a map that there is something truly special about the modern indian state and then coming back to refrain that you've had in many episodes right which is was this a liberal constitution a liberal society again so i think rahul verma had the best answer to that right i mean which is that whatever it is it is the only version that could have worked where essentially the core idea of the indian constitution is a constitution that accommodates diversity right i mean and that's why india is important both intrinsically for itself and for the world right i mean it is that in a world that you know is constantly driven by different kinds of conflict so you know even the current government like you know wants india to be quote unquote Vishwaguru. But that Vishwaguruness comes not from proclaim it, but comes from your actions, right? I mean, and the actions of kind of building a modern polity, right, that can accommodate this kind of diversity in an inclusive, pluralistic way, while kind of building the foundations of economic growth and prosperity, and also kind of, you know, building an agenda of empowerment of the most marginalized, which again, we've never succeeded as close to our aspirations, but those aspirations are there, right? So I think, you know, and I end my book partly with kind of saying strengthening India leading the world, right? Like, I mean, which is in the end, the idea of India needs to be something that is sustainable stains by its attractiveness as opposed to by its force right so and coming back to another episode where pramit i think talked about when he was a student in assam that he would face these kind of you know there would be these separatist kind of sympathies right among the youth among students whatever and how has he grew older he's like listen i would still much 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 rather be in india than china which is the counterfactual right like i mean and so essentially the power of the idea of india is just the this unique experiment in human history 
that has accommodated this kind of diversity, right? I mean, and created that space for flourishing every kind of diversity. So, and that's why I think it's important that we we survive and we flourish and we do all these things, not just for us, but also for the world. But I think as we go back and read some of these early documents of the founders of these these letters, you know, and I think Rahul, uh, was, again, is an old friend, right? I mean, part of his rediscovery, for example, of Indian public life was that of all these periodicals and the incredibly active intellectual life of pre-independence India, where people were writing and writing in periodicals and rebutting and going back and forth, you know, that we, and that's why I think, again, not to flatter you, right? Like, you know, but what makes, I think, the podcast then an important space is that we simply do not have the space in our public discourse, right, for these long, deep conversations that are, you know, measured respectful engagement. Now, of course, they are all bilateral, but eventually, like, you know, maybe there are fora and things that we can create that can do these things. So thank you for doing your bit. And we shall stay optimistic uh, about, you know, where this great country goes in the next 25 years. Yeah, and I, I should point out to the Rahul Sagar book you're referring to, I think it's called To Raise a Fallen People. Uh, the publisher just sent it to me, so I must read it and invite him on the show as well. And, you know, I, I mean, I love this country as much as uh, as you do. That's why I. Uh, that's why we must fight for it. But I, I, I don't want to be Vishwa Guru. I want to be Vishwa Bandhu. I think, you know, male ego is the end of everything. <laughs> so, Karthik, uh, Karthik boss, thank you so much for this. You, you know, and I'm so flattered and almost um, like uh, awed by, uh, you know, the, you're using my episodes as footnotes in your conversation with me it's quite mind blowing I'm, I'm you know I'm going to dream about this so uh, thanks for coming on the show and hopefully we can actually meet in person soon which we haven't yet and uh, you know have an even longer conversation <laughs> thanks Amit thank you if you enjoyed listening to this episode, check out the show notes, enter rabbit holes at will. You can follow Karthik on Twitter at Karthik underscore econ. You can follow me at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you. <laughs>